From the Book Jacket Vector Prime, the New York Times best-selling first novel in the New Jedi Order series, boldly ventured into uncharted Star Wars territory, bringing an element of dark tragedy and suspense into the adventures of Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, Leia Organa Solo, and the other legendary figures of that galaxy far, far away. With the passing of Chewbacca, the Republic mourned the loss of one of its greatest heroes. Now veteran Star Wars author Kathy Tyers continues the epic struggle between good and evil as the New Republic, led by the battered but still unbroken Jedi, braces for the next onslaught of its merciless alien foe. Poisoned by centuries of technological excess, the planet Duro is an unlivable hell, long abandoned by its own inhabitants, who dwell above their polluted world in orbital habitats. But there is no place else to channel the flood of refugees fleeing the murderous Yuzhan Vong. So a deal is struck. In exchange for a new home, the refugees will work to restore the planet to health, under the watchful eye of Leia Organa Solo. As tempers begin to flare between the Duros and the New Republic, and between groups of refugees, Han Solo, his son Jason, and the Rin called Droma arrive to keep the peace. They are unaware that Leia is on Duro, and that Luke, Mara, and Anakin are on their way, searching for a missing Jedi apprentice. And none realize that the Yuzhan Vong have chosen this embattled planet as the next target in their brutal coreward thrust. The unrest only strengthens Jason Solo's growing belief that a true Jedi should not fight, but should lead others to peace through a deeper understanding of the Force. Now, as the fragile stability on Duro threatens to collapse into violence, Jason Solo must face his greatest dilemma. At what point does the use of power become aggression? Whatever he decides, his next step could tip the galaxy's destiny toward the light or toward darkness, with the life of someone he loves hanging in the balance. Prologue Lieutenant Jaina Solo rolled her X-Wing fighter up on its port S-foil and shoved her throttle forward. A seed-shaped Yuzhan Vong coral skipper had been harrying her wingmate. As it went evasive, a minuscule black hole appeared just off its tail and gulped down every splinter of laser energy Jaina poured into it. She matched her X-Wing speed to the skips and pursued. There'd been dozens of battles since Colonel Gavin Darklighter invited her to join Rogue Squadron. Her pride hadn't faded, but the thrill sure had. Too many midnight scrambles, too much death, too little sleep. But I'm in Rogue Squadron, she reflected, feathering her throttle. Not because of who my parents are, and not because the Force is strong in my family but based on her own piloting skills. Besides, Rogue Squadron ought to include at least one Jedi Knight. The skip she was chasing swooped toward the Bothan assault cruiser Champion. Champ was flying cover for another refugee convoy. Kalarba's industrialized moon, Hosk, already wobbled in its orbit. The situation was hauntingly similar to Cernpedal's last hours almost ten months ago. There would be even greater losses here, to the Kalarbans. But to Jaina, like her dad, Cernpedal had been a tragedy that might never be matched. Vaping these skips wouldn't bring back Chewbacca, but it helped deaden Jaina's bitter memories. Keeping one finger on her stutter trigger, she showered the coral skipper with crimson laser splinters, Multiple bursts of low-power energy tired and distracted the skip's energy-sucking Dovin basils. As the colonel once put it, Tickle its teeth, then ram a fist down its throat. Her sensor showed the vortex draw back slightly, a little closer to the enemy ship that projected it. On her primary screen, a Chiss claw craft swooped in from behind. 
covering you, Rogue Eleven. Now. Gina tightened her index finger on the main firing control, loosing a solid burst from all four of her lasers. The skip's tiny projected gravity well bent her laser blast, but she'd shot high to compensate. The anomaly sent two of her shots wild. It focused the other two exactly where she wanted them, painting the crystal-paneled cockpit with flaming sheets of light. We've got the tactics to beat them in an even fight now. But it's never even. They keep killing us and keep coming. Their ships even heal themselves. The Yuzhan Vong had converted whole worlds into coral skipper nurseries, and blasted one of the New Republic's biggest military shipyards at Fondor. Surviving major yards, Kuat, Mon Calamari, Bill Bringy, had gone to full alert, with carrier groups deployed to defend them. Crystal shards and hot gravel blasted off the coral skipper, propelling it into a slow spiral out of the fire zone. The Yuzhan Vong pilot didn't eject. They all died with their ships. By choice, it seemed. And still they kept coming, while New Republic pilots were pulled home to defend their own systems. You're clear, Ten, Jina exclaimed. Thanks, Styx. Any time. Jaina pulled to starboard and spotted a catastrophe in the making. Rogues, more skips coming in at 349 Mark 18. They're headed for Champ's drive nacelles. Copy that. Major Alan Varth, commander of Jaina's flight, put an edge on her voice. Time to make coral dust. Eleven, twelve, on me. Jaina double-clicked her comm to acknowledge the order, then pushed her throttle forward. She inverted her X-wing, following Rogue Nine over Champion's ventral surface, so close and so low she could almost count Rectenny and Rivets. Brevet Admiral Glialeg Crew, a Twi'lek, commanded Champion. Since Fondor, Jaina heard about a newly made captain or admiral at almost every engagement. Other worlds recently lost. Gindine, Bimiel, and Tina. Here at Kalarba, Jaina's intelligence briefer had speculated that the aliens were trying to cut the Corellian run, a vital hyperspace route to the rim. Druckenwell and Rhodia had just gone to full alert. Another convoy of Kalarban ships, including dozens fleeing the run of Hosk Station, had just jumped. Despite all efforts to find and destroy a huge dove in basil the Yuzhan Vong had obviously dropped on Kalarba, Hosk was losing altitude with each orbit. Its Hyrote zebra fighters were long gone, all ten of its turbo lasers disabled. Enemy vessels that showed on her screen as many-legged creatures pursued the metal-sheathed moon, gobbling up shuttles that lagged behind the convoy. Hosk's polar cluster of towers was already skewed more than thirty degrees from its normal orientation. Soon Kalarba would be another dead world, useless even to the Yuzhan Vong. Gina rounded Champion's starboard fighter docking bays into a blazing free-for-all. Three coral skippers jumped her, flinging brilliant plasma bolts. Her pulse pounded as she went evasive, juking in all directions without thinking— keeping her right middle finger tight on the secondary trigger. Sparky, she ordered her astromech droid. I need one hundred percent shields at thirteen meters. Letters flashed on her heads-up display as the R-5 unit, her companion ever since joining Rogue Squadron, complied just in time. Static buzzed in her headset. A dovin basil grabbed for her shields. Another new skip vectored low and to port, Jaina feathered her etheric rudder and shoved the stick over, chasing while stars spun. Just that much closer, Vong. Just that much closer. Her torp brackets went red with a lock-on. Triumphant, she squeezed off a proton torpedo. As it rode blue flame toward the alien fighter, she held course, squeezing off more scarlet splinters, distracting the Dovin Basil. Eleven! a voice cried in her ear. Break starboard! Hut slime! 
Gina goosed her throttle and broke, pitching against her flight harness. The X-Wing shuddered. I'm hit, she cried. Adrenaline made her clench the controls. She eyed her primary board. Still got shields, though. She feathered stick and rudder, bringing the X-Wing about. And maneuvering. But now she was mad. Coral skippers, designated Scarlet on her heads-up display, swarmed Champion and its defenders. But one, swooping back toward Champion, had to be the skip that just put scorch marks on her S-foils. She rammed her throttle forward. Now she saw the big enemy ship astern of Champion. Just smaller than a Star Destroyer, its configuration reminded her of some weird marine creature. Its thickest arm pointed forward, probably command and control. Two thinner arms stuck out dorsally, two ventrally. From the ventral arms, blinding plasma was already pouring out at Champion. Two flights of New Republic E-Wings swooped in to hit the new arrival. Staying hot on her skip's tail, Jaina squeezed her stutter trigger. Rogues! The colonel's cry caught her off guard. Somebody just sucked Champ's shields! Get clear! What had they done? Brought in another big one just out of Jaina's line of sight? She wrenched her stick and punched for full speed. She was passing Champion's port in a cell when light broke through from deep inside. Slowly, with an eerie, fatal beauty, a seam opened on Champ's glossy side. Stax! a voice shouted in her ear. Eleven! Get clear! Full power, Sparky! Jaina called. Go! The blast flung her against her instrument panel. Rudder pedals seemed to crush up through her legs. Her cockpit's sides buckled, then vanished. A siren shrieked in her ears, blaring in rhythm with a synthesized voice. Ejection! Ejection! She flailed down into the force, grasping desperately. Almost... A white explosion of pain washed awareness away. Chapter One Jason Solo stood with his father outside the mudblock refugee hut they were sharing on Duro. Jason's brown coveralls had accumulated a layer of grit and dust, and his wavy, dark brown hair fell over his ears, not quite long enough to pull back in a tail. Under a translucent gray dome, tension wrapped around him like a Jaren glass snake, invisible, but so palpable through the force that he could almost feel its coils constrict. Something was about to happen. He could feel it coming when he listened through the force. Something vital, but... What? A Rin female, velvet-furred with a spiked mane, her tail and forearm bristles graying with age, stood talking to Jason's dad, Han Solo. Those are our caravan ships, she bellowed, waving her hands. Ours! She snorted, and the breath honked through four holes in her chitinous beak. Han swung around, narrowly missing Jason with his left arm. And right at this moment, we can't afford to take them off-world to run systems checks. You've been in a restricted area, Metza. Splashes of red-orange fur highlighted Metza's soft taupe coat. Her blue tail tip trembled a gesture Jason had learned to interpret as impatience. Of course we've been in the ship lot, she snapped. There's never been a security fence Rin couldn't get inside, and those are our caravan ships. Ours! She tapped her threadbare vest, which covered an ample chest. And don't tell me to trust you, Captain. We do. It's Selcor we don't trust. Selcor and the people up there. She waved her arm skyward. Han's mouth twitched, and seventeen-year-old Jason could almost feel him trying not to laugh. Jason's dad could sympathize with refugees making unofficial reconnaissances, especially on board their own ships. But Han was in charge, now. Instead of showing his amusement, he was supposed to enforce Selcor regulations, 
publicly at least, for the sake of a few juvenile offenders. He and Metza would undoubtedly settle the real issues later, in private. So Han plunged back into the argument. Jason watched the show, trying to pick up one more piece of the puzzle he felt in every cell of his being. Trained as a Jedi and unusually perceptive, he could tell that the Force was about to move. To shift. This time, he didn't dare miss the clues. His right cheekbone twinged. He touched it self-consciously, then swept his hair back from his face. It needed cutting. But no one here cared what he looked like. His legs were still growing, his shoulders broadening. He felt like an awkward hybrid of trained Jedi and barely grown boy. He leaned against his hut's outer wall and stared out over his new home. The dome had been engineered by Selkor, the New Republic Senate Select Committee for Refugees, to hold a thousand settlers. Naturally, twelve hundred had been squeezed in. Besides these outcast Rin, there were several hundred desperate humans, delicate vores, Vuvrians with their enormous round heads, and one young hut. And the relentless Yuzhan Vong kept sweeping across the galaxy, destroying whole worlds, enslaving or sacrificing planetary populations. Lush Ithor, lawless Ord Mantel, and Abroa's sky, with its fabulous libraries, all had fallen to the merciless invaders. Hut space and the mid-rim worlds along the Corellian Run were under attack. If the Yuzhan Vong could be stopped, the New Republic hadn't figured out how. Han Solo stood with his left hand on his hip, arguing with Metza, who led the larger of two Rin clan remnants, but keeping one eye on the transgressors, a group of youths about Jason's age with fading juvenile stripes on their cheeks. The Rin clans occupied one of Settlement 32's three wedge-shaped arrays of blue-roofed huts. The Synthplast Dome arched overhead, as gray as the polluted mists that swirled outside. Jason had been blessed, or cursed, with a sensitivity that he once hid behind labored jokes, and he did find it easy to see both sides of almost any argument— Part of his job here was to help his dad negotiate. Han tended to cut to solutions, instead of listening to both parties' points of view. Han had chased the Rin over half the New Republic, trying to gather his new friend Droma's invasion-scattered clanmates. As world after world closed its doors to refugees, the Rin had been beggared, duped, and betrayed. They'd taken terrible losses. They needed a sponsor. So a reluctant Han Solo registered with the burgeoning Select Committee for Refugees. Just long enough to settle them someplace. That was how he explained it to Jason, anyway. Jason had fled here from Coruscant. Two months ago, the New Republic had called him and his brother Anakin to Centerpoint Station, the massive hyperspace repulsor and gravity lens in the Corellian system. There'd been hope that Anakin who had activated Centerpoint once before, could enable it again. Military advisors had hoped to lure the Yuzhan Vong into attacking Corellia, and they meant to use Centerpoint as an interdiction field, to trap the enemy inside Corellian space, and then wipe them out. Even Uncle Luke hoped the station might be used only in its shielding capacity, not as a weapon the New Republic might never recover from the catastrophe that followed. Jason could see stress in his dad's lined face and his labored stride, and in the gray growing into his hair. Even after all these years of hobnobbing with bureaucrats and tolerating his wife's protocol droid, patience clearly wasn't his strong suit. Standing on the beaten dust lane outside the Solo's hut, Metz's opposing clan leader twisted his own tail between strong hands. The fur on Romany's forearms and the tip of his tail stood out like bleached bristles. So your clan, Han said, pointing at Romany, 
thinks your clan, pointing now at Metza, is likely to hijack our transport ships and strand everybody else here on Duro? Is that it? Someone at the back of Romani's group shouted, I wouldn't put it past them, Solo! Another Rin stepped forward. We were better off in the corporate sector, dancing for credits and telling fortunes. At least there we had our own ships. We could hide our children from poisoned air. And even more poisonous, words. Han stuck his hands into his dusty coverall pockets and caught Jason's glance. Jason could almost look him in the eye, nowadays. Any suggestions? Han muttered. They're just venting their frustrations now, Jason observed. He glanced up. The gray synth plast dome over their heads had been imported in accordion folds and unfurled over three arched metal struts. The refugees were reinforcing it with webs of native rock fiber, roughly half the colony working double shifts to strengthen the dome and their prefab huts. The other half labored outside, at a pit mine reservoir and water purification site assigned by Selcor. Abruptly, Han flung up an arm and shouted, Hey! Jason spun around in time to see one young male Rin somersault out of Romani's group and crouch for fisticuffs. Two from Metz's group body-blocked him with surprising grace. Within seconds, Han was wading into an out-and-out -out melee that looked too graceful to actually endanger anyone. Rin were natural gymnasts. They swung their opponents by their bristled tails, hooting through their beaks like a flock of astromech droids. They almost seemed to be dancing, playing, releasing their tensions. Jason opened his mouth to say, Don't stop them. They need to cut loose. At that moment, he collapsed, his chest flashing with fire as if he'd been torn open. His legs burned so fiercely he could almost feel hot shrapnel, the pain blasted down his legs, then into his ears. Jaina? Joined through the Force even before they were born, he and Jaina had always been able to tell when the other was hurt or afraid. But for him to sense her over the distances that lay between them now, she must have been terribly... The pain winked off. Jaina? He whispered, appalled. No! He stretched out toward her trying to find her again, barely aware of fuzzy shapes clustering around him and a Rin voice hooting for a medical droid, he felt as if he were shrinking, falling backwards into a vacuum. He tried focusing deep inside and outside himself to grab onto the force and punch out or slip into a healing trance. Could he take Jaina with him if he did? Uncle Luke had taught him a dozen focusing techniques back at the Academy and since then. Jason. A voice seemed to echo in his mind. But it wasn't Jaina's. It was deep, male, vaguely like his uncle's. Making an effort, Jason imagined his uncle's face, trying to focus on that echo. An enormous white vortex seemed to spin around him. It pulled at him, drawing him toward its dazzling center— what was going on? Then he saw his uncle, robed in pure white, half turned away. Luke Skywalker held his shimmering lightsaber in a diagonal stance, hands at hip level, point high. Jaina! Jason shouted the words in his mind. Uncle Luke! Jaina's been hurt! Then he saw what held his uncle's attention. In the dim distance, but clearly in focus... A second form straightened and darkened. Tall, humanoid, powerfully built, it had a face and chest covered with sinuous scars and tattoos. Its hips and legs were encased in rust-brown armor. Claws protruded from its heels and knuckles, and an ebony cloak flowed from its shoulders. The alien held a coal-black snake-headed amphistaff across its body, mirroring the angle of Luke's lightsaber pitting poisonous darkness against verdant light. Utterly confused, 
Jason stretched out through the force. First, he sensed the figure in white as a respected uncle. Then abruptly as a powerful depth, blazing in the force like a star gone nova. But across this slowly spinning disk, where Jason's inner vision presented a Yuzhan Vong warrior, his force sense picked up nothing at all. Through the force, all Yuzhan Vong did seem utterly lifeless, like the technology they vilified. The alien swung its amphistaff. The Jedi Master's lightsaber blazed, swept down, and blocked the swing, brightening until it washed out almost everything else in this vision. The Yuzhan Vong's amphistaff seemed darker than any absence of light, a darkness that seemed alive but promised death. The broad, spinning disk on which they both stood finally slowed. It focused into billions of stars— Jason picked out the familiar map of known space. Luke dropped into a fighting stance, poised near the galaxy's center, the deep core. He raised his lightsaber and held it high, near his right shoulder, pointing inward. From three points of darkness beyond the rim, tattooed assailants advanced. More of them? Jason realized this was a vision, not a battle unfolding in front of him with little to do with his twin sister. Or maybe everything to do with her. Did these new invaders symbolize other invasion forces? More world ships? Besides the ones that were already beating back everything the New Republic could throw at them? Reaching out to Jaina, maybe he had tapped the Force itself. Or maybe it broke through to him. The galaxy seemed to teeter, poised between light and darkness, Luke stood close to the center, counterweighing the dark invaders. But as their numbers increased, the balance tipped. Uncle Luke! Jason shouted. What should I do? Luke turned away from the advancing Yuzhan Vong. Looking to Jason with somber intensity, he tossed his lightsaber. It flew in a low, humming arc, trailing pale green sparks onto the galactic plain. Eyeing the advancing horde, Jason felt another enemy try to seize him. Anger, from deep in his heart. Fear and fury focused his strength. If he could, he would utterly destroy the Yuzhan Vong and all they stood for. He opened a hand, stretched out his arm, and missed. The Jedi weapon sailed past him. As anger released him... Fear took a tighter hold. Jason flailed, leapt, tried stretching out with the Force. Luke's lightsaber sailed on, shrinking and dimming with distance. Now the galaxy tipped more quickly. A dark, deadly tempest gathered around the alien warriors. Disarmed, Luke stretched out both hands. First he, then his enemies, swelled to impossible sizes— Instead of human and alien figures, now Jason saw light and darkness as entirely separate forces. Even the light terrified him in its grandeur and majesty. The galaxy seemed poised to plunge toward evil. But Jason couldn't help staring at the fearful light, spellbound, burning his retinas. A Jedi knows no fear. He'd heard that a thousand times— but this sensation was no cowardly urge to run. This was awe. It was reverence. A passionate longing to draw nearer, to serve the light and transmit its grandeur. But compared to the forces battling around him, he was only a tiny point. Helpless and unarmed besides, because of one moment's dark anger. Had that misstep doomed him? Not just him, but the galaxy? A voice like Luke's, but deeper, shook the heavens. Jason! It boomed. Stand firm! The horizon tilted farther. Jason lunged forward, determined to lend his small weight to Luke's side, to the light. He misstepped. He flailed for Luke's hand, but missed again. 
and again his weight fell slightly by centimeters toward the dark enemies. Luke seized his hand and held tightly. Hang on, Jason. The slope steepened under their feet. Stars extinguished. The Yuzhan Vong warriors scrambled forward. Whole star clusters winked out, a dark cascade under clawed enemy feet. Plainly, the strength of a hundred-odd Jedi couldn't keep the galaxy from falling to this menace. One misstep, at one critical moment by one pivotal person, could doom everyone they'd sworn to protect. No military force could stop this invasion, because it was a spiritual battle. And if one pivotal person fell to the dark side, or even used the ravishing, terrifying power of light in a wrong way, then this time everything they knew might slide into stifling darkness. Is that it? he cried toward the infinite distance. Again, Jason perceived the words in a voice that was utterly familiar, but too deep to be Luke's. Stand firm, Jason. One of the Yuzhan Vong leapt toward him. Jason gasped and flung out both arms and grabbed a flimsy bedsheet. He lay on his back, on a cot under a corrugated blue synth plass roof. The room was bigger than a refugee shelter. It had to be the medical end of the dome's hardened control shed. Junior, another familiar voice drawled. Hey there. Glad you could join us. Jason looked up into his father's wry half-smile. Worry lines crowded Han's eyes. Behind him, the Rin named Droma clutched and twisted his soft red and blue cap. His long mustachios drooped. In recent months, Droma had become his dad's... what? His friend, his assistant? Certainly not a partner or co-pilot, but a real presence. The settlement's most valuable droid, a 2-1-B medical unit that Han pirated no one knew where, lingered on Jason's other side, retracting a flexible breath mask. What happened? Han looked befuddled. Hit your head on the way down? Skinny here. Droma pointed at the droid and finished Han's sentence. Wants to dump you into the Bacter tank. Rin were shrewd observers, perceptive enough to lock into other people's thought patterns and finish their sentences. Han swung toward his friend. Listen, Bristleface, when I want to say something, I'll say it. Jaina, Jason managed. The back of his skull throbbed in rhythm with his pulse. Evidently, he had hit it as he fell. He almost opened his mouth to describe what he'd seen, but he hesitated. Han was already confused by Jason's emotional paralysis, and the way he'd begged out of the other Jedi's rescue and fact-finding missions. As hard as Jason had tried to pull back from Jedi concerns, the Force wouldn't leave him alone. It was his heritage, his destiny. And if the fate of billions rested on a balance point so narrow that one misstep could doom everyone, did he dare even mention his vision until his own path seemed clear? He'd almost gotten himself enslaved once, following a vision into danger. The Yuzhan Vong had gone so far as to plant one of their deadly coral seeds against his cheekbone— Maybe this time he'd been given a private warning to steer clear of some dangerous course. Would he know it when it opened up in front of him? This vision hadn't eased his confusion at all. What? his father demanded. What about Jaina? Jason squeezed his eyes shut, refusing to trivialize the force by using it to ease a headache. What is it, he begged the unseen force, that you want me to do? Or would he cause the next galactic catastrophe by trying to prevent it? We've got a contact rogue squadron, 
Jason blurted. I think she's been hurt. Chapter 2 At the control shed's other end, a shapely young Rin female sat near the middle of a wall of mostly dark displays, cradling a child in her lap. The colony's resident hut, Rhonda Basadi Diori, lay snoozing along the near wall. His long, tan-colored tail twitched. Piani. Han Solo stepped into the main room right behind Jason. We need a line out. The smile faded below Piani's chitinous beak. Rin were such sensitive body language readers that she was probably closing in on what had them worried. Out system? she asked. Yes, Jason said. Can you raise the relay repeater? We need to get a message to my sister, with Rogue Squadron. Piani eased her sleeping child away from her shoulder, then laid him in a padded cargo crate on the floor. I'll try, she promised. But you know Admiral Dizzlewit. Sit down. Have a bedgie. She motioned toward a sideboard, where several small dark fungi steamed beside a hefty pot of calf. Bedgies were easy to raise. Seed a shallow tank with spores, wait a week, and come back with a net. They were becoming standard refugee fare. Jason wasn't even slightly hungry, but Han grasped one between thumb and forefinger and nibbled. Steamed, unspiced bedgies were unspeakably bland, but the Rin matriarchs had taken to hoarding their herbs. Solo! Rhonda awoke from his nap. He rolled over and ponderously pulled his upper body into the air. Why are you here? Jason had tried to get along with Rhonda, raised as a spice merchant, sent by the huts to run slaves for the Yuzhan Vong. Rhonda had defected at Fondor, supposedly. Getting a message out, Jason said numbly. A Jedi knows no fear, he'd been taught. Fear is of the dark side. Fear for himself he could thrust aside. But for Jaina, he couldn't help being afraid for his sister. They were linked at an uncanny depth. Still young, relatively light, and lithe enough to move under his own power, Rhonda slithered closer. What are you doing here? Han demanded. Rhonda puffed out his sloping chest. I told you, with my parent Borga defending Nal Hutta, with only half the clan's support, and pregnant with my sibling at that, where am I? Stranded, as shipless as one of these idiot vores. I am willing to stand communication watch day and night. That way. I will hear any news from home and free up your workers for— We'll talk about it, Han interrupted. Piani, what— Scowling, the Rin whirled her chair away from her set. I can't even get through to Dizzlewit. He left orders. No civilian use of relay without authorization, she mocked. So I applied for authorization. She shook her long, sleek mane of hair. I can notify you as soon as I get it. Han glared. He and the Duros Admiral Derez Watt had ended up crosswise twice before his first week on Duro ran out. Admiral Watt hadn't even tried to pretend he felt hospitable toward refugees. It had been hoped that the Yuzhan Vong wouldn't be interested in a planet that was nearly dead. Salkor Searching the core region for a place to locate millions of war refugees had struck a deal with the Duros High House, one of the few remaining local governments that still seemed willing to accept refugees at all. Displaced people could help reclaim its surface, bring abandoned manufacturing plants back online, and take over the food synthesis plants that still fed Duros in their orbital cities. Duros, who had worked groundside, could go home. Refugees with military experience, it had been argued, 
might even help defend Duro's vital trading hubs, including one of the New Republic's top ten remaining shipyards. Except that the refugees weren't volunteering for military service in anything like the numbers what anticipated. Commanding the orbital city's overlapping planetary shields, four squadrons of fighters, and the Moan Cal cruiser Poesy, Admiral Watt provided the refugees some cover, even as the orbital cities retooled for military production. With the Fondor shipyards lost, and all the other main military shipyards such obvious targets, the New Republic was hastily decentralizing military production. Unfortunately, most of the New Republic's other warships in this area had been redeployed to Bathawi or out the Corellian Run. Jason had heard that the Adumari had attempted a flanking attack on Yuzhan Vong positions up near Bilbringi. He hoped it was true. Jason eyed Piani's comboard. How's the cable to Gateway? Could we get them to send out a signal faster? Thanks to Selkor's official presence at that nearby settlement, Gateway reportedly had a dependable uplink, even an outlink. Insulated fiber cables connected the two domes, but Duro's only surviving fauna, mutant Fefsa beetles, found fiber cables perfectly tasty. Duro's corrosive atmosphere was too murky for line-of-sight transmitting or satellite bouncing. Predictably, Piani shook her head. Gateway's scheduled to send out a cable rider in two days. Gateway was bigger, just older, and much better established than this settlement. Better organized, Jason guessed. Not that he meant to criticize his dad. Han was giving Settlement 32 his all. 32 maintained a pipeline that provided Gateway with water, which was reclaimed from an ancient numbered pit mine. Gateway maintained the communication cable and supplemented 32's food production. Han thrust his hands into his pockets and eyed Jason, raising one eyebrow. You're not chasing Minox with a flitter fly net? I hope I am. Jason fingered his hair back behind his ears. I didn't want to get you worried. We're at war. Everybody's worried. The moment passed without either of them mentioning Chewbacca, and Jason drew a shallow breath of relief. These days, nearly everyone had suffered at least one loss. Piani's mate hadn't reached Gindine's capital city in time to catch an evac ship. He was likely dead, or worse. They all had to carry on. What can I do to help? Rhonda slithered closer. Nothing, Han snapped. He turned to Jason. Tell me if it's important. If you need this checked, I'll see what we can raise on the Falcon. He gestured toward the dome's main entry. A caravan's worth of ragtag ships had been hauled from the landing crater by mammoth cross-terrain crawlers, equipment courtesy of Selcor, designated for reclamation work, and parked under tarps, protected from corrosive fallout. The security guards had just turned Metz's young clanmates out of that area. Jason's worry for Jaina struggled with his administrative concerns as his dad's assistant. For about three seconds. Yes, he said, glancing guiltily at Piani, who belonged to Metz's clan and wasn't much older than the offenders. It's important. Right. Hein pointed at Rhonda. You stay here. Let me know what you hear out of Nalhada. Depend on me, Captain. Rhonda plucked a bedgie off Piani's hot plate and dropped it whole into his mouth. Twelve minutes later, Jason perched on the Millennium Falcon's high-backed co-pilot seat. Han whacked a bulkhead, not in the joking way Jason had seen him do it so many times, but angrily. Hey, Han growled, fossil! Give me generator, and I don't mean tomorrow. And in its inimitable way, 
the falcon produced a glimmering array of lights. Han dropped into his own seat and flicked three switches. Give her a minute to come up. Right, Jason assured him. I know, was what he wanted to say. But he understood. Han had recovered enough from Chewie's death to have the falcon modified, including better air scrubbers for ferrying refugees, and a non-reflective black exterior that Chewie would have howled over. But he'd never installed a standard co-pilot's chair. Just being on board the beloved hunk of junk made Jason slightly nervous. Jason eyed a wire bundle that hung from a half-opened bulkhead. Han and Droma came out here now and again. Tinkering, Han called it. Therapy, Droma whispered. They waited in silence. The weeks when Han's grief had overwhelmed them all drifted up into Jason's memory. He'd happened into a cantina when Han had gone looking for oblivion. And on a worse night, he'd heard Han scald Leia, using words that never should have been spoken and could hardly be forgiven. Jason had never mentioned that night to his mom. She probably hoped Jason had forgotten. Jason doubted his dad remembered even saying them. He hoped his mother could somehow forget. Pain wasn't always a bad thing, though. Jason almost wished Jaina's pain would blast back into his awareness. At least that would mean she was alive. They might find out in a few minutes. A cascading rhythm of beeps rang in the cockpit as the repeater frequency came alive. Han slapped a tile on the bulkhead. Solo here, in the Millennium Falcon. Call is for Coruscant, New Republic Military. I want Colonel Darklighter's office. Then they waited again. Jason, Han said softly, what scared you off from using the Force? Two years ago you were as gung-ho as Anakin. I haven't seen you levitate anything since you got here. Jason gripped the arms of Chewbacca's chair. It's complicated. His dad wasn't criticizing. He just didn't understand. He'd already said he was glad for Jason's help, but now that Jason had bailed out of the larger fight, he was falling farther and farther behind his Jedi siblings. Try me. Han's eyes bored into Jason. Jason had told him what happened at Centerpoint. The powerful hyperspace repulsor and gravity lens had responded to Anakin's touch all right. It reactivated just as before. And at that moment, the Yuzhan Vong fleet, the one that the New Republic had hoped to lure to Corellia, appeared out of hyperspace at Fondor instead. Han's cousin, Thraken Sal Solo, insisted that the mighty shield should be used as an offensive weapon. He tried to bully Anakin into firing at the Yuzhan Vong across the vast distance between systems. Jason begged Anakin not to take the shot. Firing that weapon would have been the ultimate aggression. Anakin yielded to Jason. For one moment, the brothers shared a true moral victory. Then Thraken seized the controls. He blasted the Yuzhan Vong battlegroup and decimated the noble flotilla that Hapes had sent to the New Republic's aid, thanks to Leia Organa Solo's diplomatic efforts. The Yuzhan Vong retreated. The surviving Hapens fled home, and now Thraken Sal Solo was being hailed as a hero. I could have fired center point without hitting the Hapens, Anakin had insisted. Jason had resisted believing him for almost a week. Then the self-doubts caught him. Maybe Anakin could have done it all. Destroyed the aliens, spared the Hapens, saved Fondor. When did aggressive defense become the aggression that was forbidden to Jedi? Keeping only his lightsaber, Jason found passage from Coruscant to Duro. If he couldn't fight alongside Uncle Luke and the others, maybe he could at least help his father manage refugees. Now surely he was on the right path. 
I only know that you can't fight darkness with darkness. That didn't explain anything. He tried again. So maybe a Jedi shouldn't fight violence with violence either. Sometimes I even think that the more you fight evil, the more you empower it. Han Solo opened his mouth to protest. It's different for us, Jason insisted. If we use the Force aggressively, that can lead to the dark side. But where does strong action become aggression? The line keeps blurring, the console beeped, rescuing him. Rogue Squadron, a tenor voice rang in the cockpit. Colonel Darklighter's office. Captain Solo, is that you? We were just trying to raise you. Jason's heart plunged through his stomach. Yeah, it's me, his father growled. We're checking on Jaina. Good timing, the voice answered. This is Major Harthus, by the way. Jaina's X-Wing has been destroyed in a firefight. She had to go EV. A fellow pilot brought her in. Injured. Legs. Chest. Bacta ought to take care of it. Han grunted as Jason exhaled in relief. Her pressure suit held, but she was close to an attack cruiser, one of ours, when the drive blew. She got a massive mag field exposure. Jason's blood turned icy. Will she recover? Han echoed his question into the pickup. The voice hesitated. Tentatively, yes. We'll update you as soon as we know. We're also trying to raise her mother. Is Leia with you? Isn't she back on Coruscant? No, Captain. Selkor administration seems to have lost her. Lost her? Han echoed sarcastically. Sorry, I can't help with that. Jason flicked the console's edge. I could stay out here, he offered. I'll try to find her. Han's eyes focused on something in the distance. Sure, he said. The pain in his voice reminded Jason that things were not well between his parents. You do that. Leia Organa Solo glanced into a dark corner, where her young bodyguard Baspacan stood like a darker shadow. She hadn't taken on a planet-wide project since... Was it Baspacan's homeworld? Honegger? She sat at the head of a long synthwood table. Surrounded by bickering scientists, she would have liked to cradle her head in both hands, plug her ears, and demand that they stop acting like children. Duro did that to people. Conditions here were appalling. Still, with Borsk Felia clinging to power on Coruscant, this was one way she could shore up the New Republic, protect the Jedi's reputation, and wear herself out so thoroughly that every night she'd dropped onto her cot too exhausted to worry about her own scattered family. Over the past year she'd been bounced from system to system, caught up in on-again, off-again administrative and diplomatic work, wherever the New Republic's Advisory Council pretended not to send her. Even if she was starting to feel like a non-person— this Duro project might be the most significant job she ever took on. To remake a world in these terrible times would be an enormous victory. Her reconstructive meteorologist clenched a fist on the tabletop. Look! the scientist growled, glaring at the huge furry towels sitting opposite her. There were excellent reasons for setting our domes on the dry side of these ranges. The worst toxins fall with the rains. Any settlement placed on a wet side, like our partner 32, will be utterly unsuitable for spirograss rangeland, but ideal for water reclamation. If we try to alter our wind patterns, we'll set up an environmental catastrophe. Would anyone even notice a catastrophe? The Tals sat with his large, lower pair of eyes shut, his small upper pair blinking slowly. Rangeland needs more water than you seem to think. With all due respect, he nodded up the table to Leia. Not only here, but in other areas, 
We cannot depend on mined groundwater. It's saturated with soluble toxins and costly to pump. While we're here, a Hodin plant development specialist rested his off-green forearms on the tabletop. His long legs almost didn't fit under the conference table. I would like to petition for Sector 4 of the reclaimed marshlands. I have several promising vegetative species under development. I apologize for interrupting my esteemed colleague, the cereals specialist put in. But Sector 4 was promised to the grains project. And where's Kriar? The meteorologist Sidris Kolb spoke Leia's mind. So far, Dr. Dasid Kriar had missed every one of these weekly meetings. Not that I blame him, Leia thought wryly, watching the Hodin pass her data pad back to her personal aide, a Bella Old Song. At each meeting, they downloaded their current research into Leia's administrative files. Kriar, a plant geneticist, sent his reports via his own data pad. Leia had known many truly eccentric people, whose brilliance showed not only in their results, but in odd personal habits. Zakaris Ghent, the slicer-turned-intelligence expert, came to mind. Fired by her vision of creating a haven for refugees who'd lost everything but their lives, and could yet lose even that, Leia had agreed to work as a liaison between this bickering gang of researchers and Selcor back on Coruscant. The researchers were happier alone in their labs, or surrounded by a few subservient techs. She didn't put her name on that weekly report. She was sick of dealing with Coruscant's new breed of bureaucrats and their veiled condescension. They could find her if they tried hard enough. Leia couldn't fault Kriar's texts for their devotion. His most recent breakthrough, cooperating with the distinguished microbiologist Dr. Willowalt, had been a bacterial sludge capable of top-fermenting tanks of toxic, pollution-laden water pumped out of the swamps. It digested the leavings of imperial war factories, leaving rich organic sediment and a gaseous factor they could collect and use for fuel. Under Kriar's supervision, refugees were pouring local-made duracrete into Selcor-imported forms, dividing sectors of the toxic marsh that Gateway Dome surmounted. They'd created six miniature ecosystems, cleansed six half-click squares of marshland, added tons of cleansed soil-building material, and created Duro's first arable croplands since the Duros left the surface. No wonder Kriar didn't take time off for staff meetings. He probably was as tired of bureaucracy as Leia was herself. She had wrung a hefty Selcor budget out of the New Republic's advisory council, as her payment for traveling to the Hapes Cluster and begging for the Hapen's military aid, her own contribution to the Centerpoint disaster. Mustn't think about that. It wasn't her fault. Wasn't even Thracken's, really. No one had intended to see the Hapen fleet wiped out. It all came down to communication. It bothered her that the paired settlements could barely keep the cables intact. How could she supervise a planetary reclamation project, a symbol of rebirth amidst all this death and loss, when no other settlement reported to her scientists on a regular basis? Her cereals man turned to the elderly microbiologist, what we really need, he suggested, is a strain of microbes that will digest particles out of the air. Then we could take down the domes and move out onto the surface. That's true, Leia said dryly. Until we scatter, we're sitting flinks for Yuzhan Vong sharpshooters. The cereals man's bushy eyebrows shot up. How like a scientist, she reflected so involved in his own project that he'd forgotten the galaxy staring over his shoulder. A Bella Old Song finally finished taking Leia's data pad around. Adjusting her pale blue shoulder wrap, she handed the data pad to Leia, who eyed the readout, then saved new information before returning it. As usual, Kriar's file was longest. All this would go into her weekly burst for Selcor, 
She nodded to her aide, who hurried out with the data pad. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules. Remember, Leia added somberly, anything we do at cross purposes not only slows our effort, but wastes the resources Selcor is willing to send. Gateway and 32 were already at odds, co-opting each other's shipments whenever they could. I'll see what I can do, she promised her rangeland manager, about getting you a freighter load of those inorganics. Thank you. Aj Koenis, the Tals, opened one large eye to glare at meteorologist Kolb. Leia emerged from the research building which was an elegant prefab shipped in by Selcor. Her own office, due south in the cylindrical admin complex, would take a good stiff walk to reach. She wanted to move and think. Baspicon followed at a distance, happiest when she ignored him. That way he could keep his mind on his sworn obligation to protect her. She strode down Main Street, as they'd taken to calling it, swinging both arms— Gateway had been erected on the ruins of Teana, an ancient Duros mining city. Under the new refugee huts, two upturned rock layers came together, one relatively soft and one exceptionally dense. Leia hoped to convert the old hard rock mines into shelters, in case of breaches in the dome or other emergencies. Selcor had sent two mammoth stone-chewing machines, and she'd been promised a state-of-the-art mining laser. If she paused and stood still, she could hear the big chewers underfoot. Chewers. Chewy. Leia's chest ached every time she thought of the beloved Wookiee. She strode on, frowning. She couldn't flinch every time something reminded her of his name. Naturally, it had taken a falling moon to kill the big Wook. Duro had no moon. Only twenty orbital cities. On her left, an open-sided barn housed her major construction machinery, used for outside projects and new housing. Housing. She'd been warned to expect an influx of Faline and Rodians. Not at Gateway, she hoped. That combination would be explosive. Refugee settlements were springing up all around the planet's equator. They nestled like baby vores under the protective orbital cities, sheltered by their planetary shields. A new neighborhood lay beyond the construction barn, a few duracrete block buildings made from her engineers' experimental concoctions, local cement mixed with marsh grass that had been steeped in an antitoxin brew and then heat-dried. Beyond that... A hydroponics complex gave off the unsubtle odor of organic fertilizer. She entered the admin complex by its north door, then plodded up a flight of stairs that circled an interior light well. A U2C1 housekeeping droid hummed softly, its hose-like arms sweeping back and forth, rattling with the pebbles that constantly fell out of local duracrete. Two stories tall, plus a basement— this building had been constructed on site by Selcor before the big ships left. Was that only nine weeks ago? Leia opened the door of the sparsely furnished room that served her as office and quarters. Near the north-facing window, which overlooked the research building, construction shed, and a patchwork of refugee families' straggly garden plots, she'd placed the massive Selcor desk. A stranger had offered a pair of heirloom wall sconces, I don't want to burn down our tent, she'd explained, so Leia agreed to keep them until that family took permanent housing in the new apartments Leia hoped to build, the projected Bale Organa complex. Along the left wall were her cot and a cooking unit. The refresher was down the hall. Something smelled odd. C-3PO stood beside the focus cooker. His head swiveled. Good evening, Mistress Leia. I am sorry— this would have been more savory an hour ago. Not your problem, 3PO. She sank down at the table. I'll eat now, before it gets any worse. Whatever it was, 
probably soy pro cutlets, beside a pile of local greens that had been overcooked to a slimy gel, probably had been tasty once. She made appreciative noises for C-3PO's sake. His culinary programming wasn't at fault. Her meeting had gone long. He took up his usual position at the routing board, assigning incoming supplies and checking duty lists. He would spend the night working there. May I wonder, Mistress Leia? She chewed a rubbery bite. Go ahead, 3PO. If you would permit me to make a personal inquiry... He trailed off again. Leia thought she knew what was coming. Is it possible, he said, that Captain Solo will be permanently absent from our... operation? I had rather thought he might appear, or at least communicate by this time. The soy pro stuck in her throat. The last time he called in, he didn't know exactly where he was going. She eyed the protocol droid's gleaming finish. Was that a touch of corrosion on his left shoulder? She'd sent him outside the dome several times, grateful for an assistant who didn't need to breathe. Duro stink wasn't toxic to most species, but the atmosphere had gotten significantly worse over the last few decades, and now working outside without rebreathers was nearly impossible. Masking up had become habit for most of them. Why do you ask? Han hasn't exactly been respectful to you over the years. C-3PO let his arms hang at his sides. Recently, I was given a reason to take some pride in our ongoing relationship. I was surprised to learn that on Ruin, he was greeted as something of a hero by my cyborg counterparts. Say that again, 3PO. She rocked forward. Han, a droid hero? Where did you hear that? After we returned to Coruscant. C-3PO reached out expansively with one arm. There was a hollow net story you might have missed, since you were somewhat preoccupied. On Ruin, several thousand droids held a peaceful demonstration against the Salish Ag establishment, which had meant to deactivate them. I remember that, she broke in. Vaguely. Something about droids being warehoused, so that if the Yuzhan Vong arrived, they might be presented as a peace offering. Obviously... Ruin didn't intend to resist the invaders. In the subtext, he said, I found additional references to someone that the droids had called a long-awaited one, the only flesh and blood who would be able to help them. As it turned out, Captain Solo did save them from imminent destruction. In our recent flurry of activity, I neglected to mention... Good heavens, Leia said softly, Whatever was he thinking, she'd love to rub his nose in that little tail. Actually, she'd love to rub his nose against hers. It had been so long. Did his long silence mean that an enemy had found him? But he had Droma's help now. He'd made it plain that he didn't want hers. If he was dead, and their last words had been scornful taunts, she would regret it for the rest of her life. She was almost tempted to stretch out with the Force, looking for him. No. He could be on the other side of the mid-rim by now. If she reached out and felt nothing, she would fear the worst. She finished her meal in silence, then assembled her dishes for C-3PO to recycle. Whatever happens, I'll take care of you, she promised, I need you. Then she frowned at the data pad beside her elbow. Before she could turn in tonight, she had to check on the secondary rock chewer crew. She needed to make sure Abella sent off her weekly burst to the main Duros orbital city, Buru, and then renewed their request for better satellite data. Then there was Gateway's still non-functional bakery. Its staff had requested a shipment of salt and sucrose, anticipating a cereal crop. 
Ruin had sent this year's surplus burr millet seeds as a goodwill gesture, and then slammed the door on accepting any more refugees. Also, Selcor still hadn't delivered that mining laser. No wonder she hadn't had time to go looking for Han. She would have given everything to see him, the way he'd been before tragedy tore them apart. He'd matured so much from the scoundrel she'd come to love, although he'd never lost the glimmer in his eyes or the quirk to his lips. Till he lost Chewie. Suddenly he was Han with the itchy trigger finger again, Han with the low-life friends. Scoundrel she could tolerate, even enjoy. All right, she admitted to herself, scoundrel she'd adored. Over the years he'd learned to drop the defenses that first turned him into a scoundrel. He'd learned to let her glimpse his real idealism. He needed warmth in return. Over the years, slowly, she'd learned to give it. She loved both sides of him, the knight errant and the scoundrel. But this time, she must wait until he came to her. She couldn't baby a full-grown man. At least he'd been involved in the Rin rescue episode. Unlike Han, she tried to stay current on Holonet News. His ongoing involvement with the Rin seemed like a sign of recovery. Four hours later, she let down her long coil of hair and tumbled onto her cot. What am I doing here? flitted through her mind. Living with only a protocol droid for company, Baspicon and Olmok slept in the stairwell, made her feel as if she'd forgotten something critically important day after day. It really was fortunate she was too tired to worry. Much too tired. To worry too much, anyway. About him. Or the children. Her last thought was, I really should reach out through the force for them. How many days has it been? Chapter 3 the war vessel Sunalak, underway for decades, showed its age in a thousand small ways. Luminescent colonies of lichen and bacteria grew at intervals near its passengers' head level. Many of those colonies flickered, and some had dulled or dimmed. Communication nodes, where tiny non-dedicated villips stood on protrusions of fiery red-orange fong coral, had turned as gray as ash. Striding down one of its coral-lined arteries, Savang La ignored those marks of age and death. A living cape clung to his shoulders by its needle-clawed gripping fingers. Rust-colored scales hung like armor plates from his breastbone and shoulder blades. Each larval armor scale had been seated against bone while a priestly choir sang a tonal incantations on his behalf, renewing his pledges of devotion to Yun Yamka, god of war. Over half a year, the plates had grown slowly, stretching his tendons, tugging his joints to new angles. Then the priests had declared Savang La's painful transformation to war master complete. Savang La embraced pain. Suffering honored his gods, who had created the universe by sacrificing parts of themselves. Two sentries stood ahead. Their claw joints were immature and deadly sharp, their tattooed insignia far from complete. Outside his communication center, they snapped their fists to opposite shoulders. Savang raised one hand, receiving their homage and signaling his door. The organic door valve thickened at its edges, then dilated. A striking young attendant, black honor bars burned across her pale cheeks, sat at her station. Seif sprang up and saluted. As she did, her seat extended pseudopodia and propelled itself sideways. War Master, she said reverently, 
I roused the Master Villip in your privacy chamber, and I commanded the executor to present himself. She strode to the far bulkhead. This part of Sunalak had grown an array of geometrically staggered coral blastulas, where dozens of smaller villips lay quiescent. Savang La strode past them into the largest blastula of all. He waited until the cubicle's sphincter closed, then frowned at the leathery ball isolated on a display stand. Budded like yeast from master villips, and nurtured in onboard nurseries, or raised in berry-like galls that parasitized certain swamp plants, the mollusk-like genus enabled instantaneous long-distance communication. The villip mirrored the disgraced executor's face, sparely fleshed, with the crooked nose of multiple breaks showing great devotion, and maybe more vanity than was appropriate. In place of his left eye, he'd inserted a venom-spitting Playerian bull. Few of Nomenor's contacts had ever suspected his true identity, not even his succession of duped human servants. His long-term mission included finding and neutralizing their people's most dangerous enemies. Ironically, after his major assignment at Romamul, a few residents of the New Republic honored him as a fallen hero, slain, they thought, in a war he had actually incited. Yun Harla, the trickster goddess, seemed to smile on no manor. War master. The villip gave a good imitation of no manor's voice. Its bass undertones suggested deference and submission. How many have they added to your herd? Savang asked. Six thousand four hundred, since we spoke. Many came from Fondor. Another dome is under construction. Abominable, but temporary. Be careful not to tip your hand. Savang's fringed lips, slit many times in devotion to Yun Yamka, curled in a smile. Fondor had resisted one of his supreme commanders, Nas Choka, less than a clecket ago. Two months by the infidel's calendar. In the process of destroying its ghastly mechanized chipyards, Choka had taken only a few hundred captives— then a torrent of starfire wiped out half of Choka's flotilla and three-fourths of the enemy's own ships. Savang's tacticians still were trying to decide whether that had been a deliberate sacrifice on the enemy's part. The infidel's usual urge to preserve life had been their greatest weakness, their most heinous spiritual perfidy. Were they learning? Had they discovered that sacrifice was the key to victory? According to spies, the torrent originated in the system the infidels called Corellia, at a monstrous mechanical installation they named Centerpoint. Until Savang La's strategists could explain the weapon's hideous power, they advised him to find a coreward staging point that lay behind multiple gravity wells from Centerpoint's direct line of fire. By happy coincidence, the disgraced executor had been sent to just such a world. Watch for worthy ones, Savang reminded him. With better sacrifices, we might be cleansing the inner worlds now. Nomanor ducked his head. And Jedi, he promised, pronouncing the difficult word well. He'd lived among these people for years. Difficult to catch, but some seem worthy. Savang La nodded and touched the ridge crest of Nomanor's villip. The face faded and smoothed out. The villip retracted, sucking itself back through its mouth hole. On his distant world, Nomanor would be putting his new masker back on. Not an oogleth, 
but a newly bred type that imitated a non-human species. On Orr's human contact on the enemy's capital world, had agreed to deliver shiploads of captives to his current system. As soon as Savang arrived there, he would have the glad task of sorting the worthy from the unworthy. A reverent mass sacrifice might convince mighty Yun Yamka to let Savang reach the galactic core, where fertile gardens, tended by fecund slave races, were promised by the supreme overlord. Six thousand more infidels would enhance the sacrifice, bringing him that much closer to the world he truly wanted to offer his gods. Coruscant Chapter 4 Mara Jade Skywalker had been a wide-eyed child when Emperor Palpatine brought her to Coruscant. She'd survived Palpatine's training one hour and one day at a time. Now everyone tended to think of Coruscant as Ground Zero again, this time as the Yuzhan Vong's ultimate objective. Meanwhile, her husband was training another apprentice, obviously assuming there would be peace and justice to defend in the future. She wondered, though, if it was hope, or just habit, that kept them all sticking to business. She stared over folded hands at her younger nephew. Seated next to Luke, wearing a light brown tunic under his Jedi robe, dark-haired Anakin Solo had a Saturnine intensity, a Corellian surname, and his father's wry lift to one eyebrow. Still, his blue eyes simmered with the eagerness to save the galaxy, alone if necessary, and that was pure Skywalker. Recently returned from Yavin 4, Luke had formed a habit of gathering several Jedi every few days in some secluded but public place. All Jedi had fallen under public scrutiny in recent months. Ithor was lost, despite Corin Horn's sacrificial effort. Renegade battle squadrons led by young Jedi knights dived in and out of three major invasion fronts, blatantly disregarding military strategy. Almost as damaging, the intelligence her former boss Talon Card recently helped the Jedi gather, concerning the Yuzhan Vong's imminent attack on Corellia, proved false. If the Jedi couldn't work together, they would be vaped separately, or tumble one by one to the dark side. Seven Jedi had circled their chairs deep in central Coruscant's governmental district this morning, a few meters from a balcony overlooking a bustling mezzanine. A fountain bubbled nearby, looking and sounding like something out of the Empire's glory days. The days when she'd been the Emperor's hand. She carried around plenty of regret from those days, things she wished she'd never seen or done. But she'd made her peace. She'd given up the one thing dearest to her, her ship, Jade's Fire. In its place, she'd received, well, enough. Again, she eyed Luke and Anakin. Whenever she saw those two together, she glimpsed two outward reflections of the same inner strength. They had the same compact build, though Anakin hadn't finished fleshing out, and those matching pokemark clefts in their chins. But most telling of all, those terminally earnest attitudes— Colonel Kenth Hamner, a strikingly tall human Jedi with a long aristocratic face, served the New Republic's military as a strategist. He shook his head and said, With Fondor's shipyards gone, and the hyperspace routes mined, we're pulling in from the inner rim, even the colonies. Rhodia is in serious danger. Thank the Force, Anakin brought Centerpoint back up. Anakin leaned forward gripping his hands as he interjected, "'As long as we don't lose Corellia. Thraken's likely to expel all the Drawl and Salonians, declare Corellia a human-only zone, and lock out the rest of us, if we let him.' Mara knew Anakin well, so she could imagine the thoughts he didn't speak. "'Because I didn't fire Centerpoint when I could have. Now Thraken's a hero, no matter how many bystanders he killed.' 
With Governor General Marcha kicked out of office, Thraken and the Centerpoint Party were making a strong bid for power at Corellia. Kent Hamner shook his head. Don't blame yourself, Anakin. A Jedi must keep his power under control. We have to hesitate and consider the consequences. You couldn't hurry to fire Centerpoint, and you did well. Maybe Centerpoint will be the Corps' last defense, if we can get it repaired. From there, we could defend the shipyards at Kuat and protect Coruscant. True, Luke told Hamner. A new wave of Yorick coral warships had hit the Corellian run, near Rhodia. Anakin's sister, Jaina, Mara's apprentice, had deployed with Rogue Squadron toward that front. And with so many Yuzhan Vong between them, it was difficult to censor through the Force. Yuzhan Vong somehow damped it down. The Thawi, though, between the embattled huts and threatened Rhodia, clearly was endangered. The last time Mara had heard of Kip Duran, he'd parked Kip's dozen near Bathawi, spoiling for a fight and expecting it right there. Mara had just about had it with Kip Duran. She noted, though, the way Kent Hamner deferred to Anakin. Anakin had saved her life on Dantooine, where Yuzhan Vong warriors chased them for days while her mysterious disease slowly sapped her strength. Since the fall of Dubrillion, since the retreat at Dantooine, and especially since Centerpoint, strangers saluted barely sixteen-year-old Anakin in Coruscant's Grand Corridor. Vendors of exotic delicacies offered him samples, and supple Twi'lek women twitched their long leku when he passed. Luke also wore a Jedi robe today, almost the shade of Tatooine sand. So did Silgal the Moan Calamari healer, who sat bowing her massive head over salmon-shaded webbed hands. She'd brought along her new apprentice, quiet little Tekli. Tekli, a Chadra Fan with marginal force talent, seemed perpetually wide-eyed. Her large, fan-shaped ears swiveled whenever an atmospheric craft passed their balcony. These days were growing long for the healers. Silgal had confided that they were seeing stress illnesses like never before. The fearful strain of watching an invasion displace and kill so many peoples was like watching a disease eat away at a helpless friend. Mara caught a glint of blue from Luke's direction. She intercepted his concerned glance and choked off the dismal thought. Her disease, like a protean cancer, had undergone constant random mutations, making it uncontrollable. It should have been fatal. For three months she'd been in remission. The tears of an alien creature, Verger, briefly in custody with a Yuzhan Vong agent, had restored her strength. She hesitated to call herself cured, though. Just as Luke hesitates to call this group a council. Because it isn't. For the moment I feel good. That's enough. So she eyed him right back, admiring the signs of maturity. He'd lost that half-ripe farm boy look years ago. Around his intense blue eyes he'd gathered a network of smile lines, and furrows of concern over the bridge of his nose. Here and there, especially near his temples, he'd sprouted a few gray hairs— Altogether distinguished, she decided. Ever since that hour in Nirawan's caves, when deadly danger forced them to fight so closely, reaching so deep into the Force that each saw the world through the other's mind, she and Luke had moments when they seemed to fight, think, even to breathe as one person. Utterly different on the surface, their strengths balanced perfectly— Destiny had been kind to Mara Jade, the former Emperor's hand, and she didn't need the Force to see that their union made Luke Skywalker a happy man. So naturally, the risk of her suffering a relapse worried him desperately. They still had so many dreams to chase. Luke flushed. Then conduct your meeting, Skywalker, 
she thought at him, amused by his embarrassment. Quit worrying about me. Though their force link rarely let them communicate in actual words, he clearly caught the message. He turned to Kent Tamner and said, Day Azerjaman on Nalhutta hasn't reported for almost a week. I asked his son Tam to head out that way, carefully, and see if he could get any leading through the siege force's shadow. As at Kalarba, the enemy's massed presence near Nalhutta seemed to damp down the force. Day's a good man, Silgal said softly. Lobaka and Tinian got out of hut space, didn't they? Luke nodded. They just reported in from Kashiik. No sign of enemy activity there. At least the Yuzhan Fong aren't messing with Wookiees at home, Yulaha Kor said lightly. Yulaha was a delicate young Bith, with musical talents that admitted her to any number of intelligence-rich social occasions. Yulaha looked careworn, her posture so slumped that Mara barely could see her large eyes under her protruding hairless head. Her comment provoked nervous laughter around the circle, which showed Mara how desperate for levity even the Jedi were getting. Nothing out of Bilbringy? Hamner asked. Moan Calamari? Luke let the colonel steer the conversation to the New Republic's remaining military strongholds. Nothing unusual at Bilbringi, he answered. Tenel Ka and Jove and Drark have stationed themselves in public places, looking for dead spots in the force that could be Yuzhan Vong in maskers. The same from Mark Ramedjev, finishing up his research on Bathawi, he said, shooting Mara a rueful glance. With Borsk Falia clinging to power as chief of state, the reduced Fifth Fleet was back in Bothan space, useless to the core. And our supply and information lines to Moan Cal are still cut. They'd been cut for months. The other Jedi sat silently for almost a minute, reflecting on the reports. Luke's eyes fell half shut. Mara laced her long fingers hoping he wasn't trying to get a spin on the future. If the future beat him over the head and demanded to be seen, that was fine. Pushing for it was another matter. The fountain burbled, a free-form Moan Calamari construct with irregular surfaces. Its top bowl rotated, sending sheets of water down its sides. Mara appreciated its sonic cover. Luke, though, still seemed fascinated by water that didn't have to be forced down from the sky by moisture evaporators. He called these meetings randomly, at different places, but he often chose spots near running water. Maybe he was starting to notice the shapes and patterns of his life, starting the subtle transition from young adulthood toward a hopefully wiser age. She pursed her lips frustrated to catch herself thinking that way. She was healthy again. She liked maturity. She respected strength. But youth had privileges, hopes she still hadn't fulfilled, and maybe never would. She'd seized Verger's elixir because her instincts said it would work. She had no instinctive leading on when, if ever, she might safely conceive a child. On the far side of the circle, little Techley cleared her throat. Fur trembled on her large round ears. As Luke's eyes opened, Mara felt hers widen a trace. The Chadrafan apprentice had never spoken up during a meeting. I debated whether to even report this, she began, her voice a musical whisper. Anakin's lips twisted sardonically. Mara made a mental note to speak with him about his attitude toward the marginally gifted, if Luke didn't do it first. Go on. Silgal gave an assuring wave with one webbed hand. Techly glanced at her mentor, then continued. Two days ago, 
I was down near Dome Town, in a new strip called Joko's Alley, looking for a friend, she added hastily, as if embarrassed to admit she'd been prowling such a riotous area of Coruscant's understory. Yes? Luke gave Tekli a sober, attentive stare. Overseeing the Jedi Academy had taught him patience. They keep learning, he'd told Mara, as long as someone encourages them. I heard someone talking in a tap calf about... Which one? Anakin demanded. Luke extended a hand, palm down. Wait, Anakin. Go on, Tekli. She raised her head and stroked her long whiskers. It was the leafy green, actually. Two Rodians were talking about one of the employees, and how if that was a human, he'd eat his... I couldn't hear the next words. But we've all heard about Uglith maskers, and how the Yuzhan Vong can pass as human. Maybe it's just general jumpiness, Master Skywalker. But it would be easy for... for one of your more gifted Jedi to check out. Do you want to go back? Luke asked gently. Tekli shook her head. I'm no fighter, sir. Mara caught a side glance from Anakin. He raised one dark eyebrow at her. She pursed her lips. Luke glanced toward her, then Anakin. That's all right, Tekli. I just had two capable volunteers. The Jedi will always be strongest, he added, when everyone uses their full talents. Whatever you're given to do, do it with all your ability. Tekli's broad nose twitched with pleasure. You're sure you feel up to this? Luke demanded. Mara walked beside him down the open-air mezzanine. Along one grand edifice, a gardener droid clung to the trunk of a singing fig tree, pruning away last year's erratic growth. Luke's cloak billowed behind him, drawing stairs. The stairs bothered her, after so many years as a shadow agent, and she never wore Jedi robes unless she absolutely had to. Of course I'm up to it. I haven't felt so obnoxiously healthy since... She trailed off. Well, in a while. Or I can send someone else with you. Mara laughed. Anakin's fine. She'd asked for a few minutes alone with her husband, so their nephew followed at a polite distance. Without even stretching out through the force, she felt Anakin's alert mental state. He took his sentry role as seriously as he took everything else. He feels terrible about Centerpoint. She added, That's a load, on top of blaming himself for Chewie's death. He's doing better with that, but he's carrying some serious baggage. Luke knew it, of course. Luke caught people's feelings just as quickly as she got leadings from her instincts. He feels even worse about listening to Jason, Luke pointed out. That rift between them worries me. Jason... Worries me, Mara countered. He hadn't left Coruscant in a good frame of mind, and they hadn't heard from him in two months. They crossed a side passage. A chill breeze, probably from some ventilation system set for Tal's comfort, made her shiver. Luke almost opened his mouth to speak, then shut it firmly, raising one eyebrow. A plea for understanding— He'd almost slipped and asked again if she was all right. He was pushing his limit for the day. Don't hover, husband. Again she thought words at him, but she softened the rebuke with a wink. His lips twitched. He almost smiled. They'd had this exchange, what, a hundred times? It had become one of the myriad comforting rituals of their marriage— almost seven years, that had tempered her bitterness with his unwavering devotion. She glanced back. Anakin followed silently, steps scuffing along with his knee-high brown boots, 
the way he often did when trying to look relaxed and casual. Three young human women and a sinuous Fauline, probably low-ranking government employees, stopped walking almost in step and watched him pass. With those dark good looks, Anakin definitely had crowd appeal. Coruscant needed a vital young hero. Anakin seemed to attract those who wanted Jedi vigilantes, Kip Duran's faction, as well as those who still approved of the more traditional Jedi stance of power under extreme discipline. Kip had courted Anakin hard, between his squadron's engagements. Mara compressed her lips. She was almost as worried for Anakin as for his despondent brother. Anakin would surely be tempted, precociously talented, he couldn't claim Luke's virtuous, hard-working upbringing. She'd seen Luke's memories, his deepest regrets, and his most secret griefs. She knew how closely the Dark had pursued him. As it would chase Anakin, who was raised by an ex-smuggler who loved to bend rules, a loving but often absent mother, her talented aide, and a protocol droid and at the Jedi Academy in the shadow of two siblings. If Anakin didn't fall to the dark side, then having resisted temptation could leave him even stronger, maybe the most powerful Jedi of his generation. About that Yuzhan Vong agent, she murmured, if Tekli really spotted one, I want to take him alive. We could get more out of one live prisoner than one more corpse. The xenobiologists did have a few hard-won cadavers, preserved on various worlds, such as what effect trank darts might have on their chemistry. It's not ethical to experiment on prisoners. Luke's eyes barely narrowed. How are we— It would also be good to know if they can be stunned. He interrupted her in mid-objection. Point. Their living armor seemed to turn blaster bolts. But could a low-energy stun pulse get through? Even if it only disabled the living Von Doon crab, that might immobilize a warrior inside. Running that little experiment, and certainly not on a prisoner— would mean getting closer than anyone but a Jedi would dare try to get. And Luke hadn't demanded to take the mission. He'd also just brought her around to his point of view without challenging her, she realized. Mara touched his arm, and he closed his hand on hers. Their deep bond had suffered during the dark days when she thought she was dying. She'd pulled back into herself, even from Luke. What a relief to be able to re-engage in their relationship. Their marriage ought to be challenge enough to last anyone's lifetime, with or without small dreams to follow them. The dinner crowd had started to slacken as Mara led Anakin off the repulsor train into Joko's alley. She strolled to an overlook, planted both hands on the railing, and stared down. Far below... Layers of lights faded into the dangerous undercity. A hawk bat swooped, picking granite slugs or some other urban wildlife off duracrete walls. A brilliant yellow turbolift cube raced an orange module up the wall across from her, returning visitors to Coruscant's more populous upper levels. This district lay far enough down that she couldn't see the high-speed air travel lanes when she looked up past the edge of military-controlled Dome Town. Only local traffic zipped along at this level. A patrol unit hovered, its pod lights blinking a slow blue pulse. Quiet evening, so far. Anakin eased up alongside her, turning half away. Satisfied with her reconnaissance, Mara put the chasm behind her and stared into the crowd. Hesitantly, she opened herself, just a bit, to the force. Bubbles of emotional noise burst here and there, mostly from people near Anakin's age. An older Quarren couple walked past quickly, heads down, shoulder to shoulder. 
She saw tension in their twitching facial tentacles. The taller individual kept glancing away from his partner. They kept a broad, personal space around themselves. Carrying something a little too valuable tonight, she concluded. In the other direction swaggered two human males, one rather loose-limbed, his face glowing with the effects of several mugs of lum. She caught a few words as they passed. Over to the Peace Brigade. That way, if the Vaughn get this far... The voice faded, leaving Mara frowning. Coruscant, long a coal bed of intrigue, was turning into a fear-driven focus cooker. Peace Brigadiers, humans who had decided to collaborate with the Yuzhan Vong did not wear their clasped hand insignia openly, but she guessed that time was coming. She slipped one hand inside her long black vest. Beneath the pocketed cred cards and her comlink, she wore a loosely hooded burnt orange flight suit, and her blaster and lightsaber, the one Luke had given her. Long habit made her carry her shoulders at just the right angle to drape her clothing over her armament, Anakin's tunic and loose pants did the trick well enough. He had one odd bulge at the belt. Probably a Sabrashi fear stick. But a casual passerby would take them for a woman escorting her son on an evening out. Son. Again she frowned. With every month that hurried past, driven by the invasion or paced by concerns about the fate of the Jedi, the urge to hold her own child tugged harder and looked less plausible. Every month, she and Luke resolutely turned away. Sometimes, according to Silgal, Ulos, and the other healers, the bizarre disease that plagued her had killed its victims by breaking down the proteins that surrounded cell nuclei. Sometimes she'd even felt that starting in, seemingly nibbling her bones or other specific organs— an illness that attacked cellular integrity could destroy an unborn child, or alter its cell structure to produce... To produce what? she wondered. If she ever had a child, would it even be human? No. She would content herself with a gifted niece apprentice and two talented nephews. She and Luke also sponsored, visited when they could a thirteen-year-old Bakaran orphan, Melinza Thanus. Melinza's father had died of a lingering ailment, and her mother was killed at another centerpoint crisis years ago. Luke still felt deeply responsible for the girl, adopted by a well-placed Bakaran family. At distant Bakara, at least Melinza seemed safe from the Yuzhan Vong, Thinking of Bakara made Mara imagine how the defeated Sai Ruk might have dealt with the Yuzhan Vong. Did these new invaders, evidently dead to the Force, have life energies that could have been drained off to power Sairuvi technology? That would be the ultimate humiliation. Anakin eyed a transparent kiosk. At eye level it showed a three-dimensional animated hollow of five levels in this area— Looks like the leafy green is two corridors north, he said. Want to catch another train? We'll walk, Mara answered. Stay sharp. She felt him hang back on her left as she melted into the flow of passers-by. It was a good, defensible two-person formation, with master on point. Mara turned her head slightly. Tonight's lesson, she told Anakin. It's a review. Anakin would never learn skullduggery from her husband, who stuck out in a crowd like a Sonesi preacher. Hmm. Anakin eyed a trail of moving lights, set like a slidewalk to draw pedestrians into a new restaurant. Evaluate constantly, she said. The more information you collect before shove comes to shake, the more choices you'll have, and the fewer ways your enemy might surprise you. He held his hands folded in front of him, thumbs pressed together. I know that. They passed a door that belched out weird odors and a gaseous red mist. What about last week? On the simulators? 
she demanded. And while you're thinking about that, lose the Jedi pose. His arms dropped to his sides. Flying against you? I never had a chance. You attack too early. It's your pattern. Knowing your weakness is the first step toward conquering it. And I know what you're thinking, Anakin Solo. You think I'm losing my edge. Mara altered course as three slightly drunken young Twi'leks lurched their way up the promenade. Anakin maintained his position, well out of their path. He was a fast learner. His entire generation of Jedi was having to grow up quickly. Of course, there hadn't been much peace in the galaxy during her adolescence either. More moving lights arched overhead, setting eerie glimmers in clothing, hair, fur, and exposed skin. The crowd pressed tighter in the pedestrian corridor. Here and there she spotted billowy sheets of yellow fungus, developed by a Hodin scientist to help oxygenate dark areas of the Undercity. About half a click farther along, the overhead lights became a tumble of arrow-shaped green leaves. She glanced through a broad doorway. The lights inside weren't as dim as many they'd passed. Across the passage was a garish skin art studio. Well... She murmured, Techley's friend has good taste. She pushed into the leafy green. Anakin kept his right elbow near her left. The tap calf was built around a central column. As Mara's eyes adjusted, she saw that the column had been carved and shaded to look like a living tree trunk. Above, it parted into dozens of seeming branches. Leaves fluttered in an artificial breeze. Quite an assassin's loft, in her professional opinion, especially at center, where the branches looked strongest. Good evening, gentle friends. A table? Mara glanced down at a young drawl, maybe an early emigrant from Corellia. Yes, she said, something near the door. She glanced up, considering that loft at the trunk's center and close to the outside wall, where she could keep an eye on the entire establishment. Follow, please. The drawl led them along a soft, springy surface and paused beside a booth built to human dimensions. Mara took the seat facing the entry, leaving Anakin to watch deeper inside the establishment. Her forearms sank into the tabletop, which seemed to be covered with feathery moss, the carpet looked like fallen leaves. She hoped the food was hygienic. Something for you, gentles, to begin? Their server offered the traditional hospitality, meanwhile keying holographic menus to appear over the tabletop. Elbow water, she answered. Anakin nodded. Two. The husky young drawl's furry back receded along the fallen leaves. An artificial spring bubbled around the tree's base, humidifying the air. Mara made a mental note to tell Luke about the place. Surreptitiously eyeing other patrons, she saw nothing more hazardous than a young Doug couple arguing over dessert. She and Anakin selected options in the usual way, by flicking the heads-up menu's live spots. Then she turned sideways and leaned against the booth's inner wall. See anything? she asked. Not worth mentioning. His eyes kept moving, though. Good, Anakin. If I really hated technology, this is one place on Coruscant where I might feel half comfortable. True enough. There wasn't a service droid in sight. That fact alone was almost enough to make her suspect the manager-owner. Over the long run, Droids were significantly cheaper and more reliable than most hired help. As their server returned with elbow water and two covered warmer plates, a family of whiffids left noisily, the father humphing around his tusks. Mara spotted another attendant, walking somewhat hunched, carrying a tray out of what looked like a cavernous kitchen. He set down the tray and started gathering used serviceware off a leafy table. That had to be the one Techley spotted. 
He held himself crookedly. He could have been badly injured, but... That one, Anakin whispered. Check him through the force. She pressed farther back in the booth, narrowing the angle between Anakin and the human-looking attendant, so she could see them both without moving her head. Anakin narrowed his blue eyes, leaning forward enough that a strand of hair fell across his forehead. He frowned. You look like the champion of the galaxy, she whispered a warning. He compressed his lips, irked. Then he straightened several centimeters. Mara slid a hand under her vest, getting a grip on her lightsaber. Nothing, she murmured. Nothing. Mara stretched out and double-checked Anakin's pronouncement. The alleged human did feel like a shadow, a dead spot, an emptiness. Anakin was already rising from the table. No, Mara said sharply. Not in the middle of a restaurant full of bystanders. What do we do? he demanded. He's going to get away. Hardly. He's working a shift. We finish our dinner. Mara leaned against the mossy tabletop. And before we move in, we see if he's got reinforcements in the kitchen. Chapter 5 Rhonda lumbered into the Solo's sleeping shelter. Han was out at the reservoir today, tinkering with something at the pumping station. Jason had come back for a spare comlink. Rhonda barely could fit into the open space between cots, but he tried. Bad enough, he fumed, twitching the end of his tail away from the pile of belongings at the foot of Jason's cot, that I could not rush to my homeworld's aid. But now, to be told I must subsist on the same ration allotment as one of the Rin. He drew up as tall as he could, puffing out his midsection. Is my body type even remotely similar to those small furred pests? My metabolism requires... Not the same allotment. Jason slipped the comlink into a pocket and sat down on his cot, resting his back gingerly against the wall. Some of these buildings had been collapsed by rambunctious Rin children. The same percent of standard nutritional ration. If your metabolism is measured at three times a Rin's, you'll be issued not enough. I will waste, shrivel, atrophy. Already I am small for my age. In the light of the shelter's open door, Jason saw Rhonda's sunburst-like irises enlarge, narrowing the pupils to slits. Was there news from Nalhada, Rhonda? Have you heard? Is your parent in danger? Bullseye. Rhonda's four-fingered hands opened and closed in frustration. I have heard nothing, he rumbled, from my exalted parent. I'm sorry, Jason attempted. We... The New Republic will not defend Nalhata, Rhonda thundered. It is sacrificing our world, just as it sacrificed Tina and Gindine. We were triaged. They are pulling their forces back toward Coruscant. The mighty tail twitched again. And those precious shipyards at Bilbringi. Bethawi's going to be threatened soon, too, Jason said flatly. Rhonda naturally expressed his concern as fear, which easily led to aggression. We're all in danger, Rhonda. The fleets are spread so thin. Then why aren't you out fighting, Jedi? Rhonda clenched one stubby hand. I watched a skillful Jedi kill a Yamask. You have talents beyond anything you are able to use here. Your family has done great things. I have my own issues, Rhonda. Jason shook his head, suspicious of Rhonda's flattery. He might not know Hut's sincerity if he heard it, but as for his family having done great things, well... 
Rhonda surely knew who strangled Jabba. Rhonda wriggled closer to the shelter's single window, on the opposite wall from the door. If we could get to Coruscant, you and I could strike a blow that would make the Yuzhan Vong regret ever coming to this galaxy. My clan has resources on a dozen worlds. We could afford to equip our own squadron. But sadly, fighters are not built for my people. Jason tried to imagine a full-grown hut in an X-wing. The canopy wouldn't even close. He had loved flying an X-wing, though. That ship made him feel nimble, powerful, almost invincible. I hear you are an exceedingly good pilot. Rhonda narrowed his huge black eyes and cleared his throat. My sister's better. Jaina. Three days had passed, and Rogue Squadron still hadn't gotten through with a prognosis. So is my brother, Jason admitted, granting Anakin the honor he earned at Lando's Folly, on the asteroid training run and at the battle for Dubrillion. But your honored siblings are not here. Destiny brought us together, Jedi Solo. I could make your name even greater than it already is. Jason stretched his arms, cracking his knuckles. His name? At the moment, his name might as well be Bantha Fodder with the Jedi and the New Republic military— I will find a way to leave Duro and rush to Nalhata's aid. If all I can do is arrive too late and crash a ship in the middle of the invaders' celebratory banquet. Or I shall locate Kip Duran and throw my support behind his squadron, carrying the battle to the enemy. The hut slithered toward the door. Rhonda, Jason soothed, we do need your help. Here. Oh? Rhonda paused. Tell me, young Solo, what can I do besides stir hydroponics vats, besides tend the water pumps, and— Jason's comlink beeped. Hold on, he said, raising one hand in entreaty. Rhonda, don't go. He yanked the comlink off his utility belt. Jason Solo, he said. This is Piani at Communications, a tinny voice announced. We've finally got that message. You'd better get down here. Stunned, Jason flicked his comlink to another channel. Dad, did you get that? The elder Solo's voice sounded fuzzy. Even from short distances, low-power communications were iffy in Duro's weird atmosphere. On my way. Han said. The same contact person as before greeted Jason over the voice-only link. Her vision will clear up without medical intervention over time. She's out of action for several weeks at the inside, though. Han burst through the control shed's door. Vision? What was that? The exposure clouded her corneas, Captain, Major Harthus repeated. It's reversible, but it'll metabolize very slowly. The voice hesitated. In someone older, we might have implanted artificial eyes, or a Traxxas ultrasound enhancer, but she's young, and a Jedi can heal herself pretty well. Longer pause this time. We're, uh, also up against some wartime shortages. Han shook his head. That's all right. If those eyes will heal, you leave them right where they are. That was our feeling. We can't tie up military personnel to nursemate her, so we're furloughing her to family. The officious voice finally softened. We'd, uh, like to send her to you on Duro, Captain. That'll save us the trouble of hunting down her mother. Mara got up from the mossy table. Stay here, she murmured. Their suspect had vanished into the leafy green's kitchen. 
Anakin scowled at her half-finished gaunt steak. Be careful. Wonder of wonders, the boy wasn't going to insist on following her. She'd pull off this reconnoiter alone more easily. If I'm not back when you've finished your scrimpy, come looking. Anakin stabbed a slice and sawed off a long, thin bite. The kitchen entry wasn't far from the fresher, and she spotted an empty table nearby. She'd already counted the leafy greens' sentient staff and checked each one through the force. Only their suspect seemed absent. Now for the kitchen personnel, in case he had reinforcements or maybe a boss. She walked purposefully to the empty table, then sat with her face in the shade of her hood. When all the servers, especially the one under suspicion, were off on their rounds, she slipped to the kitchen door. She palmed the opening panel as the servers had done. The door swung aside. No one challenged her. Keeping one hand near her blaster, which was already set for stun, she eased left along a wall, away from the noisiest area. She found a station where a line of small, four-armed droids, the first mechanicals she'd seen inside the leafy green, were laying garnishes on trays. Programmed to react only to food configurations, they ignored her. She heard four distinctly living presences clattering at other stations, a large sentient staff. The owner was definitely trying to project a pastoral setting. It was a place where a Yuzhan Vong might choose to establish a cover ID. She reached down inside herself and then listened through the force. Sentient one near a cooking surface came through loud and clear and sweaty. There was sentient two, talking near one's shoulder. Number three scurried toward the back of the establishment. Sliding silently along behind a bank of cooking machinery, Mara tracked her. Through the force, she wasn't Yuzhan Vong either. And when three departed, Mara located a back door. The fourth noisemaker also cast a shadow in the force. Not a pleasant shadow, but not Yuzhan Vong. Behind her, the door slid open. She straightened and pulled her vest closer. Footsteps hustled toward her. She lowered her head and stalked toward the entry. I'm sorry, ma'am, but you can't... Ma'am? Ma'am! She jerked up her head. Cleave isobabble, she exclaimed hotly. Takara dojui! A human server stood with her forehead scrunched up in bewilderment. Mara ad-libbed again this time pantomiming an urgency she didn't feel. The server spread her hands and smiled, then beckoned. She led Mara out through the door into the dining area, then pointed toward the refresher. Mara seized her hands, nodding quickly. G.F. Wentz, she exclaimed, still improvising. Then she hustled up the hall. In the ladies' refresher, she pushed one wisp of red-gold hair back under her hood, waved the water on and off several times, counted ten, then emerged and hurried back to her table. Anakin was sopping up the last of his glotka sauce with a final bite of scrimpy. Just in time, he muttered. Mara slid in. He's the only one, as far as I can tell. One of the cooks has a bad feel to him, though. We'll grab when our quarry's on his way home. Anakin shrugged. You're in charge. She made a wry face, thinking, For the moment, Solo. In about five years, you'll probably be giving the orders. You're set for stun, aren't you? He nodded curtly. Spotting a target who didn't show up in the force would take a little extra attention. Mara posted Anakin at the green's back door, and she loitered in the busy skin art parlor across the pedestrian corridor. When the early night shift ended and late workers came on duty, she caught movement out of the corner of her eye as her pale, hunched target slipped into the flow of passers-by. Thanks, she told the attendant, who'd rolled her hookah toward the view bubble while Mara superimposed abstract samples on her bared shoulder. Not today, I guess. 
Nobody contact, the attendant called after her. Entirely laser done. Mara was already out the door, straightening her flight suit's neckline and hood. She located Anakin through the force and nudged him to get moving. At the same time, she double-checked their quarry. He still wasn't there, except to her eyes. Mara, who was tall enough to see over half the beings between them, followed the server. Now and then she caught a clear glimpse. He held his head straight forward, looking right or left only when necessary. Got him in sight? She heard Anakin at her left elbow. Straight ahead, easing left. Where? There! Anakin exclaimed. He's not wearing armor, just the masker. As far as I can see, they still might not stun easily. We'll find out, Anakin said. I'll get off to one side. He edged away. Mara kept pace with the pedestrian flow while Anakin drifted left. The restaurant server reached a station where repulsor trains departed the Dometown area. Mara pushed closer, watching more attentively, flowing parallel to her target until he'd chosen a loading platform. Then she pushed through the gate behind a family of armored Poseidons. She slipped one of her false IDs through the reader, then settled in to wait, keeping her head down. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Anakin pass the gate. Not long ago, he would have waved a hand over the reader. She was glad when he used a false ID. The more he learned to operate without using the Force, the better attuned he could stay to its flow and others' movements. He would learn his own capabilities, too. In this respect, Jason's retreat, for lack of a better word, seemed good and honorable. Sometimes she imagined Jason forty years in the future, either teaching at the Academy or ensconced on his own little world, like Yoda, if he survived. The next repulsor train swept out of its approach tunnel, emerged on the side of the city canyon, and braked silently. Mara pushed in with the rest of the crowd. By now, she'd counted and catalogued them by species, sex, and threat level. More intriguing than her fellow passengers was the fact that this run would take them right back where they started, toward the governmental zone. The train traveled smoothly, its minimal noise covered by conversations inside the thirty-passenger compartment. Her target pushed out through standing riders as they approached Embassy's Row and the main Selcor office. Mara caught Anakin's glance and cut her eyes toward the door. He nodded, then followed the server. Mara let the pod reach one more station, before getting off and doubling back. She caught Anakin's sense like a shout through the force. The quarry was moving more quickly now, up a lane Mara knew to be lower-income housing for embassy's staffers. She hustled closer, listening for any warning from her finely honed danger sense. The server finally turned around. Mara kept walking straight, but Anakin stopped and looked aside a little too innocently. The target ducked down a narrow side passage. Anakin sprinted after him. Shaking her head in frustration, Mara broke into a run. For all Anakin's potential, he had the subtlety of a hut in a moan cal meditation pool. He's barely sixteen, she reminded herself. Still plenty young enough to be trigger poppy. At least he'd quit trying to wring vengeance for Chewie out of every suspected Yuzhan Vong in the galaxy. The cul-de-sac was a high gray corridor that wormed into one of Coruscant's complex edifices. A few windows, none with ledges, opened overhead. Yellowish light standards hung from the third story. The stranger hunched close to a doorway, bending toward an access panel. Anakin sprinted forward, drew his blaster, and fired. Flickers of blue energy connected with the bent form. The server whirled, raising one arm. Evidently, that's not close enough. Not even the Uglith masker seemed affected, so far as Mara could tell. Her lightsaber cleared her vest as she came on. A black shape slithered down out of the server's sleeve. With his free hand, he flung something toward Anakin. 
Whatever it was, it screeched as it flew. Anakin ignited his lightsaber one-handed and lit the cul-de-sac a pale, eerie rose purple. Mara couldn't spare Anakin any more attention. Her danger sense was tingling. The server seized his limp black staff at both ends. It stiffened in his grasp, liquid eyes glittering, reflecting Mara's blue blade. She swept her lightsaber low, hoping to hobble the enemy agent. He brought up the amphistaff, blocking her swing, then tried to force the locked weapons higher. Mara gave ground for an instant, shifted direction, and swung again. At the corner of her vision, Anakin swung at a small black flying object. It swooped at his face, clawing for his eyes. She disengaged, sidestepped, and aimed a stroke at the amphistaff's head. Get with it, Solo! Stun him! Until she defanged this amphistaff, she couldn't spare one hand to grab her blaster, and Anakin's was in his left hand. The amphistaff went limp and almost fell out of her opponent's grasp. In the same instant, he abandoned his hunched posture. His face and torso stretched like something out of a bizarre nightmare. Mara refused to be distracted. She tried another low cut, this time opening one seam of his pants near the knee. White fluid spattered on stone. She'd cut the masker. In that moment, the amphistaff straightened again, surprising her with a stream of venom. It splashed on the exposed back of her left hand. Her quarry laughed and swung high, going for her throat. She ducked. Her hands stung. She and Silgal had developed a biotoxin drill, and she called scavenging white cells, now laden with the mysterious essence of Verger's tears, to her left hand. Evidently convinced he'd killed her, the warrior reached for a pouch at his belt. Mara straightened and swung one-handed, aiming for the pouch. Again, that tingling at the back of her mind came just in time. She backstepped swiftly as the alien flung down the pouch. Something splashed out of it near her feet. It reached up Pseudopodia, grabbing for her feet. You again! Scowling, she vaulted the sticky blorash jelly. She tossed her lightsaber to her stiffening left hand and reached inside her vest for her blaster. Anakin was closing in from behind out of the enemy's line of vision. His lightsaber dispatched the swooping attack creature. Then he pulled his other weapon from his belt. Not a smooth-sided fear stick at all. It almost looked like a Stokely spray stick, but it was smaller and shorter. Mara left her blaster holstered, reached across to cross hands on her lightsaber, and swept in again. The warrior swung his amphistaff once more. Maybe the staff creature's ability to heal itself made it almost impervious. She swung hard and fast, aiming directly into the snakehead's crest while ducking aside. Half of the head flew off, hitting the nearest stone wall with a satisfying crunch. The amphistaff went limp. Yes! At that moment, Anakin fired. A blast of pale blue webbing shot hissing out of his weapon. Mired by gooey residue, the Yuzhan Vong managed to fling two more razor-edged living discs. One circled Mara's head, diving and spinning. The other went for Anakin. She dispatched hers as the warrior fell, struggling against the web's stun charge. Finally, she drew her blaster. It whined as she fired off a stronger stun burst from practically on top of her target. Even that didn't quiet him. Evidently, they couldn't be stunned. At all. She closed down her lightsaber, got a good grip, and whacked his temple. He collapsed. Anakin sprinted close. Let me unmask it, he exclaimed. Mara stepped back, still gripping her lightsaber, and let youthful determination take over. She opened and closed her left hand cautiously. It still tingled, but it hadn't lost sensation. The warrior's face seemed to be bleeding white where she whacked it. Cautiously, Anakin fingered a faint line along the creature's nose. The skin started rippling, as if something was moving under its surface, then peeled back from the motionless face, taking the wounded spot along with it. 
The living Uglyth masker shrank into the throat of the Yuzhan Vong's restaurant uniform, making slurping noises as it pulled free of its carrier's pores. Underneath, the alien was pale-skinned, with little flesh on its face. Bluish sacks hung under both eyes, with one upper cheek burned almost through, leaving a scar that showed bone. Tattoos like concentric energy bursts crossed its forehead. The exposed cheekbone showed a network of healed, jagged fractures. The masker created a rolling bulge as it shrank toward the warrior's legs. The Stokely web finally trapped it near its owner's knees. Good idea, the Stokely stick, Mara murmured. Anakin stuck it in his belt. New model, short range. Almost concealable. Surprised me, she admitted. It bothered her that he'd found one before she'd even heard of it. As he beamed, she pulled out her comlink. Enforcement? Mara here. We've got our infiltrator. Chapter 6 With the captured Yuzhan Vong laid out on an examining table, and the wounded masker contained inside a transperisteel tank, Mara folded her arms and rested against a wall. New Republic intelligence would take over from here. But she lingered. Anakin hadn't gone far either. Exobiologist Dr. Joy Eichroth had pulled back her fair hair into a tail. She spread an array of tools and drug ampules on a tray near the table, then stood shaking her head. We know only enough about their physiology, she said, to know that we don't know enough. Mara pushed away from her wall. At least we found out that a stun burst won't bring them down, no matter how close we get. I doubt, Icroth said, that many people will want to get that close. The Yuzhan Vong had been draped with a poncho, after medics confirmed she was female. Tufts of black hair grew here and there on her skull, and half her body was tattooed with concentric designs like the ones on her forehead. Icroth pointed out a focal point that looked vaguely like a living creature. Claws protruded from her knuckles. The exobiologist had anchored restraint bands over her forearms and across her legs and torso. Silgal stood with Mara. She'd examined Mara's hand taking skin and blood samples for the other medics. Then she tried to revive the Yuzhan Vong. Neither inhalants nor mild shocks worked. By invitation, she too lingered. Belindi Kalenda, of NRI, recently demoted to lieutenant colonel over the misinformation flap, strode into the room, and Icroth straightened. Lieutenant Colonel Kalenda was small and dark-skinned, and she wore her tightly curled hair in a bunch at the nape of her neck. She got a good look and frowned. I'm impressed, she said, tricked by the alleged Yuzhan Vong defector, then again by their fainted Corellia. At least Kalenda hadn't been drummed out of the service. I wouldn't have thought it was possible to get one of these alive. She shot one more glance at Dr. Eichroth. Your recording? We can't waste this. If we get anything, Mara said. She'd faced enough of these aliens to expect a fresh surprise every time. Above the table hung a full body scanner. This time there'd be body fluid analyses, readings of organ functions, maybe even a map of the body's microelectric fields. A chem readout might hint at what drugs could affect them. Personally, Mara would appreciate information on their nervous systems, especially what might bring them down, besides whacking their temples. She stared at the alien warrior, half wishing they might have spoken woman to woman instead of as predator and prey, captor and prisoner. Mara knew what it felt like to slowly realize she'd been raised by the wrong side. The Yuzhan Vong warrior stirred. Mara stepped closer. Kalenda eyed the overhead readouts. The warrior's eyes opened. She recoiled from the machinery above her, 
working her face violently. Mara stretched out a hand. We don't want to harm you, she insisted. I know you know Basic. I saw you at work in the leafy green. Let us help you. We'll send you back to your people if— The prisoner interrupted, shrieking out a long, unintelligible speech, maybe to her gods. As she did, her body arched, fighting the bonds. Dr. Eichroth edged back. Anakin stepped closer, one hand on his lightsaber. From the warrior's right hand, a claw stretched to four times its sessile length. It slashed the steel-fab forearm bond as if it were flimsoplast. Then, with one arm freed, the warrior balled a fist. Anakin ignited his blade with a snap hiss. No! Mara shouted. Without hesitating, the warrior slashed her claw across her own throat. Black blood spurted. Silgal sprang forward, pressing a wad of synth flesh to the wound with one broad, webbed hand, while reaching aside for fluid packs. Another aid restrained the prisoner's free hand. A surgical droid that Silgal had parked out of the prisoner's sight rolled close and went to work. Mara exhaled, hoping the readouts would provide some usable information. She'd gotten a bit of data herself. Even more respect for those fighting claws. She would make sure that information went out in Dr. Eichroth's report. An hour later, as midnight passed, she sat at a light table, rerunning that report and Silgal's medical scans. The prisoner had managed to bleed to death, and Mara sent Anakin home in his skimmer. Luke stood at her shoulder tracing with one finger the lines of multiple skull breaks. Mara watched him sidelong, trying to read his reaction. His face had been savaged years ago by a wampa ice creature. Would these people accept back to treatment, since the only technology it required was a tank to contain the organisms? Probably not. They wore their scars proudly. The claws are creatures, too she observed out loud. It was late enough that she no longer cared she was rambling. Parasites, embedded deep into the bone, that's got to hurt. They cherish pain, Luke murmured. Mara shook her head. Loosed from her hood, red-gold hair flopped over her shoulders. This wasn't worth what we risked for it. You took one Yuzhan Vong operative out of commission, Luke pointed out, and found a way to kill the Amphistaffs. Not enough. Mara, he exclaimed, and she heard the exasperation in his voice. Just having you on your feet is almost a miracle. Can't you be thankful for small accomplishments? Trim from years of lightsaber drills and self-imposed gymnastic training, He'd picked up a scar or two himself, and his right hand was only a recreation. His exquisite empathy gave both hands a powerful sensuality, though. You know me better than that, she muttered, turning back to the scans. Look at the nervous system. The microelectric fields are fully redundant. If they like to suffer, they're built for it. That must be why they can't be stunned. One point for you. Half smiling, he leaned closer to the readout. She didn't have as many bone breaks or scars as the one they scanned on Bimiel. That isn't hard to figure out. They give low-ranking youngsters undercover work to prove themselves. Mara fought back a yawn. Luke stared pointedly at the Yuzhan Vong female. Thanks, Mara said dryly, but you don't have to pretend not to notice. I have a good reason to be tired. Let's get some sleep. Luke had parked a skimmer on the rooftop pad. He slipped in first, claiming the pilot seat. Mara let him. From the intelligence complex, it was a short hop, mostly open air, back to their part of the Imperial Palace. Mara stared over a solid line of wing and tail lights. Reminiscing? Luke asked. 
She pulled her vest closer, hoping her sudden shiver was due to the evening chill. Several times, close proximity with the Yuzhan Vong had seemed to spark relapses of her illness. Hardly, she said. He'd learned to respect her silences, and the times when she simply didn't care to explain. She kept quiet as he slipped the skimmer into a parking slot as smoothly as any other pilot with fighter status. He'd retested, kept up his hours, and was still legally qualified to fly almost anything the New Republic could scramble against the Yuzhan Vong, short of a Moan Cal battleship. Count on Skywalker to do everything legal and square. The corridors in their part of the palace were lined in exotic woods sculpted with intricate swirls to deaden the echoes of feet hustling up Wayland marble tiles. Mara hung back, keeping both hands in her vest pockets, and let Luke open the door. It was plainer than most, but a good meter taller than either of them. She sent the door shut and dropped her long vest over a service droid. From her left, a greeting tootled from the data recharge station— Luke greeted his mechanical friend with an equally friendly chirrup. Hi, R2. Their suite was small but elegant, and she liked living in a central location. Ahead, down three steps, a transparisteel vista window looked out over Coruscant. The spires of a new construct stuck up between Mara and the moonset. She yawned. Leaning against a wall, she stared out at the large moon watching as it crept lower, seeming to grow larger and duller as it slipped into city haze. Even a simple moonset looked ominous nowadays. If the enemy remade Coruscant, as they'd done to Belkaden, what color would these moonsets turn? Warm arms slipped around her from behind. Bed? Luke murmured against her ear. She closed her hands over his. In a minute. What's wrong? Nothing. That was her knee-jerk reaction, and Luke knew it. For some silly reason, he still asked. I feel almost obnoxiously well. You're... uneasy, though, he said. And no, I didn't use the force to see it. I just know you. Well done, she muttered, not in a mood to smart-mouth him. It's not for myself. Look out there. How many thousands of homes do we see? How safe are they, really? His chin rested on her shoulder. He didn't answer, but his arms tightened on her waist. All over the rim they've lost homes, whole worlds. Closer in they're not thinking about anything but how to survive. What kind of life is that? She meant it as a rhetorical question, and he didn't answer. You've learned, Skywalker, she thought wryly. Since he didn't argue, she had to press on. We're Jedi. We protect life. That's worthwhile, but it has nothing to do with the kind of life they live. We can't make choices for them. How long have you been telling me that? Years, and I'm still right. But people who live in constant terror and grief, how much better are they really than the slaves sprouting coral all over their bodies? He simply tightened his arms around her middle. So again she had to answer herself. Better, of course, she admitted. They aren't in agony. But don't you ever wonder? Or maybe you can tell me. What is the effect on the force of all this violence and desperation? The threat of invasion brings out fear and anger. The dark side gets stronger. What counters it? Little hopes, Luke answered. Little joys. Mara stared at the shrinking moon. It's like our situation, she admitted. But it's everywhere. He raised one hand to stroke her shoulder. Her head drooped. 
Just preserving those who are alive feels like a dead end. But what choice do we have? Only to go on serving. With every day we still have life in us. Luke's voice was softer than the dying moonlight. To defend people who can't defend themselves. To die for them if we must. Like Chewie did. Mara leaned back against his chest. I outlived the Empire, she muttered. The loss of my livelihood. A man I loved and served. I could outlive the New Republic. I love stability and ease. And you, incidentally. His hand tightened. But simply... Staying alive isn't everything, don't you see? We're only trying to prevent the subtraction of life. You've added to mine, Mara, he said softly, dryly. Come get some rest. Chapter 7 Crowded around a tracking screen in the hardened control shed, Jason, Han, and the Rin Piani watched a small blip grow on the tracking screen, while Rhonda sulked in a corner and Droma stared out the view bubble. A tickling sensation finally thrust itself into the back of Jason's mind. It's Jaina, he confirmed. Han crossed his arms, frowning. How is she? Jason examined the feeling. Mad, he concluded. One of 32's snake-like coffer dams was extended to the Medrunner. Jason and Han stood at the foot of its landing ramp as the hatch opened. First off was a Moncal pilot, wearing the tricircle insignia of the New Republic Medical Service. She had long, feminine webbed hands. Captain Solo? Han stepped forward. You've got my girl, I hope. His voice echoed oddly inside the coffer dam. Her attendant's helping her forward. Sign here, please. The pilot thrust out a data pad. Nope, Han said. Not till I see her. Watching over his father's shoulder, Jason spotted a dark gray coverall, dark hair chopped surprisingly short, and his sister's face, half covered by some kind of mask. Jaina batted away her droid attendant's extended limb. I can walk down a ramp. Hi, Dad. Hello, Jason. Thanks for coming to pick up the pieces. She walked down, limping slightly. Han embraced her, rocking from foot to foot. Then Jason slipped his arms around her shoulders. Until he knew more about her injuries, he didn't want to squeeze. I'm not a skeleton leaf, she growled, tightening her grip. Her fingers dug into his triceps. Here are your instructions. The medical droid presented Han with a second data pad. Jaina turned away. Two curved, darkened lenses hung from a soft headband, with several connectors alongside. Jason hoped the meds hadn't had to implant anything under her scalp to make the thing work. You can see well enough to recognize us, he said. That's not bad. I can tell you apart through the force. What I see is shadows and darker shadows. It's getting better. She shut her mouth firmly, but only for a moment. I can already make out shapes on a threat board. Sending me here was a waste of fuel— unless you've heard something I haven't. She folded her arms and glared at Jason. Am I terminal or something, and they just haven't told me? No, Jason exclaimed. He couldn't resist stretching out through the force. His sister's presence pulsed red hot, an ember, not a flame. No, you're healing well. They just didn't want to risk you in combat. Or risk that you'd endanger someone else, he added, trying to push her anger away. Standing beside her made him edgy, almost as if the ground were vibrating. 
Not you, too. Jaina pulled off her mask and pushed her face closer to his. Her eyes did look cloudy, the pupils faintly gray. Finished with the medical team, their dad clapped an arm around her shoulder. Come inside, sweetie. I'll get you settled before I head back to the pumping station. They found her a cot in a hut with an elderly Rin woman, whose husband had died on the Jubilee wheel over Ord Mantel, and who was glad for company. As Han hurried off, Jaina grudgingly let Jason stow her belongings under the shelter's second cot. She turned her head toward the small window. I can see fine if there's enough light. That's a problem in 32, Jason admitted. The cloud cover doesn't let much in. And these Selcor shelters had just one door and one window. A little light gets in through the roof panels, he added, gesturing upward. These huts were suited only for domed environments. One good storm would blow off the roofs, then wash the mortar out from between mud bricks that reinforced the synthplast walls. How long did it take to get used to the stink? Jason's face warmed. He glanced at the older woman seated on the other bunk. Jaina wasn't just smelling Duro's atmosphere. The Rin had this odor. That's partly me, the Rin said bluntly. Less than a day. Jason got the words out quickly. And Clarani, you know it's not you in particular. Your people just have a different body chemistry. Jaina shook her head slowly. Sorry, she muttered. You're generous to take me in. The last thing you need is an ungrateful kid in your house. Don't worry. Clarani gestured left and right, taking in the door they'd left open for light, and the small window with its primitive shelf row storage. I'm tired of sleeping alone. When Jaina raised a hand to adjust her mask, Jason spotted a tremor. She really had been through it. So bring me up to speed, he said casually. What have the rogues been up to? And who fried your X-Wing? I did. That's the worst of it. You? She sighed. I was chasing a skip. At Kalarba, she added. Yes, they told us. I guess Druckenwell's gone too? That had been a major imperial manufacturing center. And Faline. They've reached Rhodia. It's the heavy end of the hammer, pounding and pounding. Unbelievable, Jason muttered, wondering if the Faline had fought to the last drop of green blood, or else used their infamous pheromones to buy a measure of freedom. Jaina didn't offer details, and this wasn't the time to press. I stayed a little too close to a cruiser that was under attack, she said. When it blew, I caught some radiation. I should be fine in a couple of weeks, she insisted. No permanent damage. Good. In return, Jason gave her a fast explanation of 32's water purification project, the ancient pit mine that had filled with toxic groundwater, the settlement's nominal partnership with Gateway beyond low blasted hills, and their supply problems. Corduro Shipping contracted by Selcor to deliver supplies to the refugee domes, had missed two shipments this month, and been late with the other eleven. There's plenty of work here, he added. Mechanical stuff, your specialty. She snorted. Save it for somebody who doesn't know how to vape skips, Jason. They're taking this galaxy away from us. The forces need every decent pilot we can get. That's where you ought to be. Even Dad... She sounded disturbingly like Rhonda, anxious, angry. Again, he thought of his vision, and the potential repercussions of one step in the wrong direction. Instead of stuck here, taking care of helpless folks, Clarani put in, think again, young woman. Who were you fighting to save? You're not out there playing death tag for fun and excitement, true. 
To Jason's surprise, Jaina's voice sank. And I worry. A little. That when I get back in an X-Wing, I'll punk out. Not you, Jason said. It's different now. She laced her fingers on the lap of her dark gray coverall. Did they tell you I lost Sparky? No. Jason turned toward the Rin woman. Sparky was her personal droid. She's had him... A while, Jaina said. Long enough to start depending on him. I know they're just mechanical, but... He was great. Her shoulders slumped. Jason shook his head. Never having owned a droid, the Rin woman said, I might not seem sympathetic, but we'll all lose more than we already have before all this is over. You ended up E.V.? Jason asked. Jaina nodded. He compressed his lips. Losing a fighter around you and going extravehicular did terrible things to the comforting illusions that kept fighter pilots rushing into those cockpits. At the back of their minds, it was always the other guy who got shot up, the one who just wasn't as quick or as good in a clinch shot or as sharp-eyed. He stared at Jaina's mask. Want dinner? he asked. Part of the stink is what we'll eat tonight. Jaina shook her head. My day cycle just shifted. It's almost midnight where I've been. I just want to sleep. Do me a favor, she added, looking straight at him. Jason felt her emotions shift subtly. I want to spend the night in a healing trance. Give me a push. I can't get as deep as I want without you. He hesitated. I know, she said. He had the sense that her stare, such as it was, didn't waver. The whole galaxy knows you've been trying not to use the Force. This is me, your sister. I need to get well. You're right. Embarrassed, he shoved his reluctance aside. I'll help. But you need to know that it's gotten worse. Why? she demanded. When she tilted her head up and frowned, she looked almost exactly like their mom. I saw this vision. He described it for her. She listened, nodding. But she asked again for his help. He couldn't refuse. Soon she lay in a deep, healing subsleep, her chest rising and falling so slowly that a stranger might have worried that she wasn't breathing. But when he looked with his spirit, he saw that her legs, right side, and left hand were all targets of an intense effort. Around and through her eyes, energy flowed with particular intensity. Bacta, that miraculous microscopic healer, had done such a good job on her tissue injuries that she wouldn't have any visible scars. She wouldn't limp much longer either. I'd be a good healer, he complained to himself, but he knew the answer to that. Just because he was skilled in an area, that didn't make it the call on his life. People who told him he was lucky to be so broadly gifted didn't have to make his decisions. The next morning he spotted her ambling up the alley, trailing one hand along the rough wall of the nearest hut. He grabbed her other hand and guided her to a mess area. Rin of all ages congregated around five females with sight-built cooking pots. Jaina sniffed the air. Jason touched her elbow and guided her to a place in line. Looks like... He glanced into the nearest pot. Mmm, breakfast frag. He lowered his voice and muttered in Jaina's ear, Selcor must have gotten a contract for some planet's entire frag harvest. He trailed off as the near cook spotted them. The rogue pilot, she exclaimed. Up and down the serving line, Rin heads turned. Two leather-winged vores stared down pointed faces. A family of humans set their trays aside and applauded. Jaina's lips twisted. You to the front of the line, Missy, the cook said. 
Maybe we can't do anything for your wingmates, but you tell them when you get back that Camarata said thank you. When Jaina tried to protest, Jason elbowed her. These refugees can only give you a touch of special treatment. It's all they have. Let them honor Rogue Squadron if you don't want it for yourself. He guided her to the front of the line, steadied her bowl while one of the women ladled a dipper full of pale brown steamed grains mixed with a few bits of dried fruit. Then he got himself a bowl full and grabbed two mugs of imitation calf. They took a seat on a long slab of duracrete. Jaina gripped her spoon halfway up the handle and got a bite into her mouth. Bland, she said, but not bad. I'm sorry I was lousy company last night. This can't be real easy for you. Always understanding everybody else's viewpoint. That's my little brother. He smiled wryly. For about two years she had been taller. She shook her head, then turned aside, so he saw the reflection of a Rin family on her faceplate. I hate this, she said. I'm the older sister, the ace pilot. Did you know I almost got as many kills in the last three weeks as the squadron's top ten percenters? Do you realize what that means to me? Yes. You're one of the hottest pilots there ever was. I'm scared to lose that, Jason. Of course. But I read your diagnosis pad last night. You really are expected to get better, fast. Then why did they send me here? Her voice dropped to a whisper. I told you last night. The med facilities are bursting. Yeah, she said. And do you know they haven't been able to raise Mom? I don't understand that. Well, they didn't try real long and hard. But I hope nothing happened to her. We'd know if... Jason trailed off. So where is she? He shrugged. Working refugees? She could be here on Duro, and we'd never know it. We can't keep the comm cables up. The Merc's too thick for line of sight, and we haven't gotten a good antenna from Selcor yet. Jaina finished her breakfast and patted the Duracrete, looking for her mug. As Jason shoved it toward her hand he spotted motion at the edge of his field of vision. An immense, tan-colored blob of motion. Uh-oh, he murmured. What? Her head whipped around. Rhonda, he said quickly, our resident hut, wants revenge on the Yuzhan Vong. He'll try to get you into his own plans for combat. He's been working on me. Tell him I can't. You tell him, Jason said. Here he comes. Chapter 8 Two days later, Jason adjusted his breath mask and leaned against 32's Duracrete main gate, waiting for the Cordero supply shuttle. The gray dome faded toward a foggy height. Selcor couldn't afford to equip its refugees with costly Enviro suits, only cheap chem suits and cumbersome rebreathers like Jason's. There were times when he'd gladly blast off again. Rhonda's offer rose back to his mind, but he rejected it. If he turned to aggression, that would betray everything he'd promised to stand for, not to mention his vision. But couldn't he fight without using the Force? On his right, the sealed end of a retracted, tube-shaped coffer dam lay along one edge of a blasted-out crater. That tube could be run out to mate with a freighter's cargo hatch. 32 had been promised a load of chemical fertilizers for its hydroponics operation. Without them, the new crop of foodstuffs would wither in the tanks. Still, it didn't take a Jedi Master to realize this freighter wasn't coming. Frowning, Jason slipped into the wide gate, a modified airlock. He paused to let air currents whisk most of the crud off his clothes, sloshed his boots in a settling tub, then paced up the dome's edge to the control shed. It isn't coming, a deep voice rumbled. Rhonda had positioned his belly in front of the control board. Two older humans sat cross-legged on the floor, playing a tile game. Beyond them, the view bubble looked out on the landing zone's blast crater. Any word out of Nalhada? 
Jason asked gently. The glorious jewel, Rhonda fumed, is under remote bombardment. Missiles are bursting in her atmosphere. They are causing no damage my people's sensors can pick up from remote stations. But we know what the enemy did to Ithor. Jason frowned. Did your people evacuate? Many of my Kajidic had already left for Gamor and Tatooine. Rhodia, too. Rhonda's broad slash of a mouth pulled aside. But now Rhodia's under attack. Jason shook his head. Noble news out of Kubindi, though. Tragic, but noble. Oh? Jason leaned one arm against the comboard. News from out system was getting rare enough to tolerate listening to Ronda relay it. Word is out that Kips doesn't... Jason clenched a hand at that name, but he didn't interrupt. Held off a Yuzhan Vong attack force long enough that the Kubas got every spaceworthy ship off planet. You cannot call that anything less than heroic. Grandstanding came to mind, but Jason held his peace. I thought he was over at Bathawi. Exactly. Anticipating their attack, he made the long trek— Listen, Rhonda. Jason frowned. I just don't admire Kip the way you do. And Kip has no patience with huts. But Jason didn't say that. He killed millions. Rhonda waved a stubby arm. Long ago— he was young. Well, I'm young now, and I don't approve. Tragic, Rhonda said softly. The way the Jedi are dividing. Supposedly Jedi protect others. I see none of that from you, Jedi Solo. Take Worth Skidder. He was a warrior. He recited the story again. Skidder's bravery on board the Yuzhan Vong cluster ship. Skidder's attempt to communicate with the hideous Yamisk war coordinator. Skidder dying in bitter agony, sending the rescue crew off without him. Rhonda had vowed to avenge himself on the Yuzhan Vong, honoring Worth Skidder. Jason wondered what the young hut really wanted. As far as I can see, Rhonda concluded, Duron is the only Jedi who truly is carrying the fight to the Yuzhan Vong. That's only half true, Jason said carefully. The Jedi, based on Coruscant, are working just as hard as Kip, without calling attention to themselves. No fanfares, no tricks flying into battle. Rhonda spat toward a bucket he'd placed in the room's darkest corner. The tile game players startled then returned to their game. How long, he rumbled, will Coruscant hold out if the Yuzhan Vong attack? That's the last place the fleets would let them take. But Jason had wondered the same thing. That really would be the end. And Uncle Luke had stood near Coruscant in his vision. Listen, Rhonda. Master Skywalker is right. We have to be cautious about using the Force. We have to resist anger, hate, and aggression. Those will tempt us into an evil that's just as dangerous as the Yuzhan Vong. Rhonda grumbled in Hatiz. It's right for us to gather intelligence, Jason pressed, to protect and advise others, to heal their hurts. That's the Force of Good, Rhonda. Kip's people, maybe they haven't slipped over to the dark side, but they're sliding. Rhonda clenched his tiny hands and puffed up to his full size. Spare me your dark side and light side. If you're a Jedi, act like a Jedi. Or get out of the way and let other Jedi do what this war requires, to protect others. I'm working on that, Jason insisted. Abruptly... Rhonda turned conciliatory. Of course you are, he soothed. But not before Jason made one more mental note about Rhonda Besadi Diori's flattery. 
It could turn ugly in an instant. The hut was a spice merchant, a manipulator. Here is my vision, Rhonda said. My fantasies have matured, and you could find glory helping me fulfill them. Jason rolled his eyes. Go ahead. Rhonda moistened his lips with his fat, wedge-shaped tongue. I see myself, he said, as a pirate chieftain wreaking havoc on the Yuzhan Vong, with Kip Duran as my example. Jason wondered how Kip would react to a hut using him as an example. Who better to head my squadron than a Jedi? And fate has delivered a Jedi to me, one who is withdrawn from their normal operations. You see, Jason, all I need is to somehow get an influence over you, then convince you to do what I want. Surprisingly frank, for a hut. There isn't a single ship here at thirty-two that would suit your purposes. No, the hut admitted. But over at Gateway there are faster vessels. Ours for the taking. No, Rhonda. I won't steal. I don't want to be a pirate. And I don't believe in your vision. I'm sorry. Now I need a Goku line. Sighing heavily, Rhonda slid away from the main comm board. Jason settled in at the ground orbit comm unit, drumming his fingers on its edge while he waited for his call to go through. He wondered if Rhonda might resort to intimidation once it grew obvious that flattery wouldn't produce what he wanted. Jason's first call raised the Duros military, as usual. The Duro Defense Force was a nervous bunch these days. Admiral Watt's comm team was on the job this morning. Negotiating the usual runaround took most of Jason's next hour. Rhonda thrust his huge head through the door three times, demanding progress reports. Waiting for Admiral Dizzlewit, Jason murmured each time. Finally, Jason talked himself far enough down the line to reach a shipping clerk who seemed willing to check records. Yes, the shuttle in question had arrived at Buru City. Corduro Shipping had taken charge of the transfer. A Corduro pilot had taken off with it, bound for Erdorf City, the smallest Duros orbital city. Stolen. I know these routing checks are inconvenient for you, Jason said tightly. You've done an incredible job getting me this much. Many thanks. He cut the connection and flicked his comlink. Dad? After several seconds, he got an answer. Find it, Junior? The Duros diverted it. Rhonda's monstrous head poked through the door again. Jason pushed his chair aside and beckoned the hut forward, still explaining. Dad, I think this would justify spending the fuel to go up and talk to them. Han had taken 32's outdated I-7 Howl Runner shuttle up to Buru twice that first week, talking to Admiral Watt. No, Han said firmly. They don't want to talk. We'll think of something. Borrow supplies from Gateway, maybe. Jason knew exactly what his dad meant when he said borrow. An unexpected transmission called Savang La away from Sunalak's Villip Choir. In that chamber, signal Villips fashioned optical fields that showed long arcs of space, sent by Villips' position for relay. Images from Nal Hutta showed the seeding of microbes that would reshape the scum-ridden pestilent planet and its ghastly moon, covered with technological monstrosities, back into something fertile and lovely. Some of the organisms, bred by master shapers, would digest Nar Shaddaa's metal and transparisteel into dust that would settle into lower strata. Other microbes would break down both worlds' duracrete into sand for new soil. Still other bacteria would attack organic matter, including the hut's bloated corpses, to enrich that soil. Buried under natural terrain, the world and its moon would live again. There was also the matter of Mujmai Ainan, 
a lieutenant who had proposed taking Kubindi with half the usual number of coral skippers. Disgraced by the substantial evacuation of Kubindi, Ainan waited in a meditation chamber. In less than an hour, the gods would receive him. Savang La was not pleased to be called away, but the executor's report was worth hearing. Seated in the coral-lined privacy chamber, he glared at the Villip's rendition of No Manor's dumbfounded face. Not one Jedi, but three? No Manor's eyes widened even farther. It was unusual for a war master to repeat information. Yes, war master. Three have been spotted now. The war master drew up to his formidable height, squaring his spiked shoulders. Not by you. By my agents. I scrupulously avoid their presence. Their names, Savang ordered, relaxing. Leia Organa Solo remains supervisor of this dome. My assistants alert me whenever she approaches the laboratory. Your assistants approach worthiness. I wish I could convey your compliments. When Duro is liberated, you may offer them yourself. The villip showed Nomanor's head nod in gratitude. You honor us all. The other two Jedi came to my attention only this morning. My agents on Buru have monitored a number of out-system calls from Settlement 32. They finally identified a passenger who arrived by medical evacuation ship as Organa Solo's daughter, Jaina. Corduro's shipping reports dealing with another at 32. Jaina's brother, the cowardly Jedi who went missing from Coruscant. Perplexed, Savang La interrupted, Is this family in blood feud? Avoiding one another to prevent embarrassment? I find no evidence of either. It seems possible, though almost unbelievable, even for this godless race, that the offspring have no idea of the mother's location, nor she of theirs. The coward's name... Name me no coward. He is not worthy to be known. Then may I offer a suggestion? Savang La nodded. I have developed a new organism. Savang La frowned. Numanor fancied himself a shaper, dabbling in others' sanctified specialties. When we need to break down these abominable domes and let in living atmosphere, Anor continued, it should be useful. Meanwhile, I would like to test it in the two younger Jedi's dome. Brak Tukum Nom Kan Bin Tu. He quoted the adage to weaken the hinges of the enemy's fort. Why not your own? It would be an honorable self-immolation. Belek Tu, War Master. Numanor apologized, and the War Master let him continue. This research complex serves our long-term purposes, and Jedi Organa Solo helps other workers make maximum use of resources. For that reason, this dome's destruction should be delayed. Savang La could not fault the executor's reasoning. Only so long as she remains ignorant of your presence... Somehow these Jedi recognize us through Uglith Maskers. I have little faith that your new Gablith Masker would deceive her. 
Jedi magic worked without sacrifices to the Yuzhan Vong gods, which made it almost as abominable as the infidel's technology. The priests, he added dryly, change their minds daily. Whether the portents identify these Jedi as abominations too evil to even sacrifice, or worthy enough to offer individually, but do not encounter her in person. I serve you with my life and death, Numanor answered. Savang La touched his villip. Numanor's face faded, shrank, and was sucked back into the villip's interior. Savang La sat for another minute stroking his frayed lip with a finger claw. Destroying Duro's shipcrafting facility would deny his enemies warships and materiel. Cutting their trade routes again would wreak economic havoc. And at Duro, he would make an example that the galaxy's surviving inhabitants would not dare to ignore. Chapter 9 Mara sat with Luke at a long briefing table, in a sequestered room protected by sonic containment fields. At the table's head, Idar Nilikirka, chief of fleet intelligence, stood beside a three-dimensional galactic map that gleamed over the table's modulators. Most of its starfield shone faintly blue, but a substantial slice, starting near Balkaden, had been reprogrammed to shine red those systems that had been taken by the Yuzhan Vong. Nilikirka swept his laser pointer through that sector. As you see, our hyperspace probes are returning limited information. Kalarba, Druckenwell, and Faline are lost. Even if we could retain Rodia, he said, glancing at Rodian Counselor Narek, the Corellian run is cut. He swept his pointer through that hyperspace lane. Our scouts report having found several more points seeded with Dovin Basil interdiction mines. Counselor Narek's ears swiveled toward Chief of State Failure. Once again, a midrim world is sacrificed in the name of protecting the core. Or Bathawi, Narek said angrily. Mara frowned. The Bothan Chief of State had managed to keep the remains of the Fifth Fleet deployed at home, but he looked twitchy. Defensive. Ripples danced almost constantly across his furred face. With such grave damage to Fondor, we are equally concerned with protecting Kuat drive yards, Counselor Tribak of Kashiyik said through his translator droid. He gestured toward the Advisory Council's newest member, Senator Vicky Shesh of Kuat, who nodded acknowledgement. Center Point Station. Fior Rodan of Kaminor said, is ideally positioned to defend Kuat. But what is Centerpoint's current status? Can we count on Corellia? Chelch Dravid shifted in his seat, looking uncomfortable. Mara didn't envy him. Corellia had been used as a trap, a target to tempt the Yuzhan Vong into Centerpoint's range. Now the Corellians had backblading in mind. My report isn't good, Dravid answered. After Centerpoint was fired toward Fondor, there was some kind of interior malfunction, probably due to Sal Solo's mishandling. That information must not reach the Yuzhan Vong, though. As long as they consider Centerpoint operational, it provides a deterrent for this entire region. Mara sensed uneasiness around the table. Several heads nodded somberly. Failure crossed his arms over his tunic. And now Corellia threatens to act alone, making the center point weapon its rallying point. He glanced aside at Counselor Dravid. Without Fondor's shipyards, the Corellian said, New Republic forces could not have used center point as planned anyway. The Hymns devices which would have allowed our forces to maneuver in and out of the interdiction field, were built there. Admiral Seen Sav, the Sullustan Fulcrum of the New Republic Defense Force, 
had been threatened with a senatorial vote of no confidence after the Centerpoint catastrophe. He barely survived. Chief Neely Kirka, he asked. What news from Kubindi? The burly Tamarian shook his head. Our only communication has come courtesy of Jedi Kipteron. I'm sure you've seen that on Holonet. Sav's jowls quivered with distaste. Who hasn't? I suppose Jedi Corin Horn has returned to his usual heroics as well by now? He suggested, turning to Luke. Sitting next to Mara, Luke shook his head. Corin is still in seclusion on Corellia. Lying low, Mara knew, after the Ithor catastrophe. Sav sniffed loudly. Cal Omis, formerly of Alderaan, said, I find it interesting that the enemy took Kubindi without harassing either Fwilsving or Kessel. The biology people, Neely Kirka said, believe that the Kubaza's history of genetically engineering insect species made that world's resources appeal to the Yuzhan Vong. And the disinformation campaign? Failure turned to a tall, slender woman standing behind Chief Neely Kirka. Mara knew Major Hallis Sopper by sight. The former documentarian, now employed by NRI, opened her hands. We know the Yuzhan Vong are superstitious. Unfortunately, until we can get a better sense of what they consider good and bad portents, there's little we can do to convince them they're seeing bad ones. Admiral Sav slowly shook his head. Thank you. Major Sopper, we will inform you as information becomes available. Felia raised the room lights to a slightly brighter level, and Neely Kirka deactivated his map as Major Sopper left the chamber. Borsk Felia cleared his throat, making a braying noise. Counselor Pwo! He indicated the tentacle-faced Quarren seated across from him. You requested a place on the agenda. Counselor Puo lowered his head, resting his facial tentacles against his chest. Master Skywalker, he said, I am glad that the topic of Jedi Horn and Jedi Duran was raised. Unless you can exercise a greater measure of control over the Jedi, you must prepare for a new round of persecution. Luke raised his head, but didn't speak. Your nephews... Quo continued, allowed Sal Solo to fire the center point weapon. True? Yes, Luke said. Mara glared at the aging squid head. At the New Republic's request, Luke reminded the council, we are disturbed, Quo said. Jedi and other vigilante groups are becoming increasingly active. Justice must be meted out under the rule of law, not by petty tyrants in X-Wing fighters. Mara eyed Fior Rodan, who'd made no secret of his opposition to forming any new Jedi Council. Rodan stirred. There was a time, he said, when the presence of twenty Jedi on Coruscant might have seemed like a guarantee of our safety. Now it seems that you had an order of twenty vigilantes and eighty do-nothings. Master Skywalker, apologies, Caloma said, but you see how controversial the Jedi have become. Rodan narrowed his dark eyes. Master Skywalker, he said, managing to make that title sound demeaning. It is increasingly obvious that the Jedi choose to help some peoples, but not others. Why? Luke shook his head, and Mara felt his mood turn deadly sober. Jedi are responsible to the Force, not to me. I've tried to coordinate them. I've tried, he added, shooting another side glance toward Counselor Rodan, to re-establish some semblance of organization. 
But there are people who feel that if we were better organized, we'd be a danger to the New Republic. Can you blame them? Rodan asked. We are determined to keep the Jedi and their quaint philosophy separate from this government. To the extent of refusing to sanction us, Counselor? Of threatening persecution? Chief of State Failure's cream-colored fur rippled again. Your agents misinformed us concerning the dangers to Corellia and Fondor. That failure contributed gravely to the Centerpoint catastrophe. The Yuzhan Vong planted misinformation by altering the hut's shipping patterns. Luke answered, We won't be fooled next time, and we won't be able to observe hut smuggling behavior any time soon. Point, Mara observed. The huts were mired in the fight of their lives. Thalia sat stroking his beard. When peace and justice are threatened, Luke said, our mandate to rescue becomes a mandate to defend whole worlds. It's true that some Jedi have used that mandate to rationalize extreme behavior. Despite what some of you think, I've done my best to correct them. Their freedom to make choices means they are free to make wrong ones. Commodore Brand, silent until now, spoke up at last. Hear, hear! It's never easy to use power, Luke said, shaking his head and giving Rodan a long look. You've all dealt with that problem, and with the ethics of spending other beings' lives in battle. That is why governments have high councils, Rodan said, to check powerful individuals. Mara finally heard some tension in Luke's voice as he said, and this body, Counselor Rodan, certainly has chosen to defend some systems at the expense of others. Rodan of Commonor glowered. Luke rested one elbow on the table. Some Jedi have stepped back from using the Force almost entirely, for fear of misusing it. My nephew Jason, for one. Mara happened to be looking at Vicky Shesh at that moment, the Kuwati senator raised one manicured eyebrow. The Jedi are scattered, Luke went on. They're my commitment. We're all answerable to you. Is that so? Merrick of Rhodia muttered. Luke turned to the Rhodian. Yes, he said, it is. For as long as this body represents peace and justice... Mara clapped a lid on her urge to give Narek a saccharine smile. Narek clasped his hands over the table. My homeworld is about to suffer the most terrible depredations. And mine, Luke said, is probably next. True enough. Tatooine was just rimward from Rhodia. Narek's green hide darkened. That is not my concern. All worlds are my concern, Luke said. In a lounge on one of Coruscant's floating docks, Mara sank into a cushioned repulsor chair and blew out a breath. This divisiveness could bring down the New Republic, without requiring the Yuzhan Vong to bring in a single ship. At one edge of the floating dock, a local shuttle pulled away. Mara's eye caught movement on the lounge's far side. A tall female with short, wheat-blonde hair walked toward them. Mara opened herself to the force, and before she could reach toward the woman, she felt something primitive but alive clinging to her body near her hip-hugging belt. She brushed at it with one hand. Tresina Lobi, Luke murmured to Mara. Mara had met the woman, the first of her people, the Chevs, to show force talent. Tresina had a charming knack for melting into mixed crowds. Were you expecting her? Mara asked. She brushed her stomach again. Granite slugs often sloughed off walls, and maybe a small one had rolled down under her long vest. She held back her disgust, trying not to distract Luke. Granite slugs were hot ugly, but harmless. 
Luke raised an eyebrow. For the last few minutes, anyway. The Chev woman halted about two meters from him. Master Skywalker and Mara. Her voice was low and musical. Forgive me for coming with urgent business. That's never a problem, Luke said graciously. Sit down, Tracina. Get your breath. Again, he glanced at Mara. Mara shook her head. It's nothing, she thought at him. She eyed the Chev woman. I'm all right, Tracina said. Despite the woman's Jedi discipline, Mara remembered her as someone who usually smiled. But not today. I just got back from Duro, she said. I went out with my apprentice, Thrini Vey. Mara nodded. In the last year, Luke had assigned Jedi listening teams to most major systems, and some critical minor ones. She crossed her hands over her vest, just below her belt line, and pressed gently. She felt nothing through the vest. No lump, no defensive wriggle. That was not good. Thrini and I have been keeping watch on several Duros shipping concerns, Tracina said. The situation there has been quietly getting... complicated. In what way? Mara asked. This couldn't be her disease flaring up again. It couldn't. Well, I hardly know where to start. Tracina shook her head. The Duros High House wasn't at all thrilled by Selkor's reclamation proposal. Evidently their shipping concerns bought out a few representatives, and then Selkor carried the vote. Why would the shipping concerns do that? Luke asked. Meanwhile, Mara ran a fast physical inventory. She did feel oddly tired infinitesimally wearier than listening to pompous counselors ought to make her. She'd never been able to sense the disease itself through the Force, but she did feel an odd thickening of her own cells, below the pit of her stomach. It had attacked her reproductive system before. Not this time, she vowed. Back at their rooms, she still had a few precious drops of Verger's tears. Luke frowned. Again, Mara shook her head slightly, then stared at Tracina. The Chev woman's wheat-blonde hair caught a gleam of the sunset light. Thrini and I thought we had a lead, she said. Selkor's contractor for outsystem goods, Corduro Shipping, has been intercepting shipments. They're letting out tap-calf talk that they're reselling to other refugee groups. But there are quieter rumors of goods being stockpiled in another orbital city. Interesting ruse, Mara said, determined to concentrate. You stick to business too, Skywalker. Then Thrini heard a mechanic claim he'd been working on one city's drive and steering unit. They've multiplied its drive power by factors of several hundred. They want to be able to take it out of orbit, Mara concluded. They could retreat if the Yuzhan Vong attacked the refugees down on the planet, including Han, Jason, and Leia. And now Jaina, according to a flagged medical report sent directly to Luke. What are Duro's defenses like? There's a Moan Cal light cruiser, Poesy, fighter complement of E-wings and B-wings, and some local police craft they call Dagger Ds, Divided among poesy and some of the cities. Tracina finally sat down. Thrini and I were collecting information in the capital city, the one the Duros call Buru. We traced some of the intercepted goods from one shipyard arm to another, where it left for another habitat, Erdorf, the one that's supposedly being modified. And? Mara prompted gently. Tracina's hands had tightened on the arms of her chair. Eleven days before I left Buru, Tracina answered, Thrini vanished. Luke didn't look pleased when Mara left him with Tracina at NRI, nor when she claimed she needed to do something back at the suite. 
but he didn't argue. He didn't need to. She knew he'd get there as quickly as possible. As she entered, R2-D2 rolled away from his post at the local data feed in the kitchen and whistled a query. No thanks, R2. I don't need you at the moment. He wheeled around and retreated. Mara took a chair with her back to the broad window, sank down, and withdrew deep into herself. Before she used the last of Verger's miraculous healing dose, she'd better know what she was up against. She was determined to do whatever she could, on her own. She and Silgal had experimented with self-examination techniques, the only possible way to deal with a disease that continually mutated. Focusing the force finally, she confirmed that the odd sense focused deep in her uterus on one side. It was a thickening of cells almost like a tumor, multiplying more quickly than her normal cells. She probed deeper for their cellular essence. Shifting her grip on the force, she poised to destroy their blood flow. Then she sensed something weirdly familiar. Besides the tumor-like echo of her own cellular essence, completely familiar, after fighting her disease for this long, she sensed another human life signature. It was Luke's. By all the star dragons ever spawned, that could mean only one thing. Mara's eyes flew open, her arms and legs stiffened. Pregnant? This couldn't have happened. She'd taken all precautions. Her bizarre disease had transformed molecules and cells and attacked discrete organs. It could be death or disfigurement, or some other unimaginable horror, to an unborn child. She clenched a fist. What could she do? There were medical options. Like a garu bear defending her cub, she attacked that thought instantly. She would let no medical aid harm her child. Again, her own thoughts caught her up. Her child? Did she carry her posterity or her death inside her? The tall front door slid open. Luke plunged through, and before he even got close, she felt his mind trying to grab her, protect her. What's wrong? he demanded. Mara, what is it? Do you always think you have to rush in and save someone? she asked making a vain stab at sounding wry and superior. But her voice shook. Luke dropped to his knees beside her chair. He seized her hand. Mara, what is it? The disease? She took his hand. She laid it over her abdomen. Feel this, she said softly. Use the force and tell me what has happened. He arched his eyebrows and frowned up at her. Don't argue, she said. Just do it. I want an unbiased second opinion. She watched his eyes. They narrowed, and the line of his eyebrows softened. He was preparing to comfort her, to do whatever he must. Then his eyes widened, sending a sudden blue flash up at her face. This wasn't my idea— Mara swallowed on a dry throat. It's already in terrible danger. The disease could attack it. Cause mutations. Mara, he interrupted. He seized her hand. Mara, anything could kill any one of us. Today, tomorrow, the Yuzhan Vong could pull down one of Coruscant's moons, or we could fall out a window. She nodded silently. Struck once again by Luke's unwavering faith in goodness and his hope in the light. He shifted his hand slightly, shaking his head in plain disbelief. Life is risk, he murmured. I don't feel anything dangerous about this. Not yet, Mara whispered. But this wasn't supposed to happen. I know he said. His hand shifted again. His eyes fell shut. She felt his desperate concern. Softening a little, Mara laid her free hand over his, on her stomach. 
Finally she dared to envision actually holding a child, looking into a face that was part Luke and part Mara, just as her niece and nephews were part Leia and part Han, but completely themselves. She'd pictured it many times as an abstraction. Then she pictured the monster her disease could make of a defenseless cluster of cells. Defenseless? Not so long as I've got custody. Something deep inside her mind was shrieking, terrorized. Something else was dancing wildly, utterly and joyously abandoning itself to hope, to joy, to a new and total commitment. Luke spoke softly. Maybe Verger's medicine made you vulnerable to the Force. As an agent of life. She straightened her shoulders. You want this. You're glad, she accused him. Until this moment, her husband said, I had no idea how badly I did want it. I was prepared to be stoic and give up hope for my sake. He raised his chin, and she felt a wordless caress. She twisted her mouth sideways. For two people who know each other so well, somehow we missed something. No, he said. Something just changed. In me, maybe. Maybe you. Maybe in the Force itself. All I know is... This is the right risk to take. And that, he concluded, shaking his head, makes me happy. He looked up again, wearing a foolish grin she hadn't seen in months. It could make me very happy, actually. Mara balled her fists. Listen, Skywalker. Nobody finds out about this. Nobody. Still kneeling beside her chair... He slid his hands around her waist. I agree, Mara. With one exception. You should have at least one good medic. They... No. Even Silgal really couldn't help me fight this disease. If she couldn't help me, she couldn't protect our child. That's going to be my job. Other things could go wrong. She silenced him with a glare. He frowned then nodded solemnly. And you can get that out of your mind, too, she snapped. I am not going to lie down and keep watch on my symptoms, waiting for something to go wrong. She marveled, though, at how suddenly and how completely she wanted to protect this child that didn't even vaguely resemble a child yet. Maybe, her conscience whispered, this sudden protectiveness was like the way Luke felt about her a love so fierce and uncontrolled that sometimes it threatened the beloved's independence. Maybe there was no such thing as real independence, not with contentment. This child, though, could already be under the influence of Yuzhan Vong biotechnology. It, no, a child was not an it. He could die before he ever saw daylight. She could deform in a thousand deadly ways. He could... Are you all right? Luke's hands caressed her shoulders. Mara, we should at least have Silgal do a few basic tests. No, she muttered. No one, Luke. Not Leia? Not the Solo kids? Just how do you expect to keep this from Anakin? He demanded. She laughed shortly. The last thing a boy his age even considers is an old woman getting pregnant. Keep a lid on your feelings and he won't suspect. He does expect me to be concerned for you. Then I'm sure you won't disappoint. Luke exhaled slowly, and she felt some of the tension leave him. You're right, he said. There are people who would pin hopes on this child that maybe they shouldn't have, he, or she, can you tell? Mara fell into the force again, absorbing everything it would tell her. She had extraordinary powers to communicate with certain people. 
She'd been able to sense Palpatine from anywhere in the galaxy. So far, though, this sense was utterly primitive. Caressing the life signature, she felt again those faint echoes of her own savor in the Force and Luke's. A new thought distracted her. Her mind worked backwards, counting days, wondering when. She half-smiled and answered Luke's question. No, I can't tell, but I don't want to say it. Then for now, she? He, Mara said firmly, though she honestly couldn't tell. Then she finished the sentence he'd interrupted with his own question. If he survives, he could be truly great, or greatly evil. Or, she added grimly, greatly damaged by this disease. I won't let that happen, Luke. I swear. This is my child, too. He seized her other hand. Mara, you're going to have to make an allowance for that. If I get protective, please don't take it personally. You'd better not, she growled. Then she folded around Luke, embracing his shoulders. He struggled up off his knees, then pulled her to her feet. His arms tightened around her back and her waist. His lips pressed hard against her mouth. His breath tasted sweet and musky. And at the back of her mind... She could feel him rejoicing. Some hours later, Mara sat staring out the transparent steel window, watching traffic lights flow across the skyline. Flaming auroral veils framed the traffic lights. She'd wrenched her thoughts back to Duro, and Center Point Station, non-functional again. She had the sensation that a pattern was emerging— Give her an hour or two and she'd find it, if she could concentrate. Do you think Leia is on top of this shipping problem? she asked. Luke's voice spoke out of the darkness, from the floor beside her deep chair. By now she's probably either solved it, or sent Han to fix it. They've got to be in close contact. But you'd like to ship over to Duro and check it out? Stay out of my mind, Jade. Without even trying, she sensed his glee at having turned her customary rebuke back on her. I'd rather go myself than send somebody else into danger, he said, and I should talk with Jason. I'll take Anakin if you don't... M Mara glared into the darkness. Hmm. You do mind. Almost hidden by shadow... He ran a hand over his hair. Mara, I don't want to put you in danger right now. I... Who's got the better danger sense? Mara touched a control, admitting more of the city's night light through the window and illuminating her husband's concerned face. Luke uncrossed his legs and leaned forward. You can't deliberately risk that child... The intensity in his eyes reminded her of the worst days of her illness, and his despondency. Do you think, she answered, that I ever, ever deliberately risk myself? Grab some reality, Skywalker. If the Yuzhan Vong get near Coruscant, I'm on the evac ship. In fact, I'm driving. But this isn't even close to that danger level. His lips firmed. She could almost feel him preparing to outflank her, to bury her objections under patriarchal affection or pull rank. Mara cherished her farm boy's sincerity, but she refused to be sheltered. She wondered if arguing was simpler for women who couldn't tell what their husbands would say next. My instincts are shifting, she admitted, diverting his thrust before he could make it. I've been running an inventory. I can already feel new hormones starting to kick in. I'm getting protective too, Luke. Already. He leaned away from her, looking so wide-eyed hopeful that she hated to burst his bubble. But in me, 
she explained, protective is active. I'm going with you. In fact, maybe I should take Anakin and head out, she suggested. Then you could stay in touch with the advisory council. When they start using words like persecution, we have to pay attention. He arched his eyebrows. He didn't want to be left behind either. We have Thrini Vey missing, and four of our family in an area that's fallen under suspicion. What about the advisory council? Kent Hamner is an excellent strategist. He can handle an advisory role. The admirals like having you around, she said, pushing him just for the fun of it. As if he'd caught a flicker of that thought, or more likely her amusement, he slumped back down in his chair. Don't do that, he pleaded. Mara laughed. It'll be good to get away from this place. I think we should take Anakin, too. What do you think Tresina and Thrini stumbled into? That, she said, is what we'd better find out. Chapter 10 Rhonda Besadi Diori stared hard at the Rin who had been assigned to keep watch on the communications board. And him. The creature seemed to be asleep. Silently, Rhonda activated a private frequency. Clicking the transmission switch did not activate his Kajitix repeater network, because one of the Duro's orbital cities was in the way. He resolved to be patient. With Jason Solo self-righteously determined to do nothing, Rhonda had turned to the sister. Jaina was the more experienced pilot at any rate. Rhonda had been, he believed, more than polite, and solicitous. He'd praised her for her constant efforts to heal herself and regain her fighting trim. He'd hinted that he could get her back into action before Rogue Squadron could send another Medrunner, taking her back out to the battle. Today's news out of Nalhada had been ghastly. Unknown and unknowable creatures released in droves, his relatives lying slain in their palaces. Rhonda must find some other way to use self-righteous young Jason, so obviously a son of his hut-killing mother. And he would. The Yuzhan Vong had trained Rhonda in prisoner transport. He clicked the transmitter again. This time a soft series of tones answered. Splendid. He leaned close to the transmitter. This is Rhonda, he said softly, keeping one eye on the sleeping rain guard. Who is on watch? He heard static for a long time. Then, Rhonda, where are you? His parents' voice. I am well, he told her. And on Duro. I have only moments. I might be able to buy our people some concessions from the Yuzhan Vong. On board the cluster ship, he'd seen that they were desperate to get Jedi in custody, for study. There are two young Jedi here. I might be able to deliver one. If they would be interested, have them contact me at the settlement they call 32. It's near a large open-pit mine that's been made into a reservoir. Well done, Rhonda, Borga said. Something with which to bargain. We have too little of that. The invaders do not seem to indulge themselves with any of our trade goods. We are trying to win rights to Tatooine as a safe world. I will do what I can. The moment Rhonda signed off, he wondered if he'd done the right thing. Selling Jason might be a mistake. Jason still might join him if Jaina led the way. Well, he could always claim the young human escaped. With two options open, his fantasies of a strike team and the chance of buying his people a haven, one or the other would surely turn for his benefit. Maybe both. He turned his head slightly. The ineffectual Rin guard slept on. Keeping peace on a team of research scientists who were competing for limited resources 
was starting to remind Leia of trying to feed two-year-old force-strong twins from the same plate. Only her hopes for a reborn world and a refugee haven kept her going. One woman pounded Leia's makeshift conference table. Our best hope, she said, scowling, is to develop that master net. Without a self-perpetuating web of interdependent organisms, everything we do will either undo itself in less than a generation, or else overbreed without natural controls. We can... Overbreed? Dr. Plee, the Hodin, folded his long, pale green arms over his lab coat. At the moment, unless they do overbreed, how in Kessel are we going to make any headway? They've given us a planet. And it's a planet we've got to get under control. And he's no help at all. Overbreed? The Yuzhan Vong had to breed like crazy, Leia reflected. Otherwise, how could they throw away so many warriors' lives? Then she frowned at the single vacant chair. Once again, Dacid Kriar had begged off by Comlink. Once, she hadn't minded it. Three times, she disliked it. But this made five meetings out of five. No wonder Kriar's fellow workers resented him. He's reactive, the meteorologist said. He responds to crises only if we point them out. The microbiologist raised a finger. But he has solved every one of them. We've kept him so busy fixing our problems that he hasn't had time to do anything original lately. So put him to work on your master web, Dr. Plea growled. Get this world seeded and clean it up so we can take down these domes. I'm not claustrophobic, but the Sith you're not. Aj Koenis, the big Tals, nudged him with a powerful-looking furry arm. I've seen your... Leia pushed wearily to her feet. Does anyone else have a progress report? Sidris Kolb stood. Cloud seeding is off to a shaky start, but... Shaky? demanded Kala, a Quarren who had missed the previous meeting. I asked you to delay that another six weeks. I've barely made headway with existing surface water. The last rainfall samples we took had six hundred parts per million of... And they were off again. This time Leia let them run. Sadly, everyone's project seemed to threaten everyone else's. Interlinked as they were, they ought to support each other. She would find a way to make them cooperate, or else she'd send them all home and start over with a fresh crew. Duro was too important to lose to their bickering. Not many hours later, another emergency called Leia to the supply depot where she released her frustration on a hapless shipping clerk. What do you mean the rest of it isn't coming until next week? We need that allotment. The new hydroponics will stall without soluble potash, or whatever it is. Blast those duros! The supply clerk, to his credit, sat there and took it until she paused for breath. Sorry, Leia muttered. Not your fault. We're all getting a little short in the fuse and I am glad to get that mining laser. Can you open the line to Buru? Ten minutes later, she was getting another runaround on the ground orbit comm unit. Listen, she said, gritting her teeth to keep from shouting. I want that stuff here, where it belongs. I've got the biggest population on world. Sorry, ma'am, the voice on the other end said. Corduro took that shipment to Settlement 32 for their water treatment plant with an allowance for next month. They do supply you with... Next month? Incredulous, Leia glared at the Goku. They think we can stockpile? Who is this guy? The shipping clerk shook his head. He seemed to feel that since the water purification benefits your people even more than his own, you wouldn't mind. Do you want to send a message? I'm too busy to waste the effort. Contact Selcor and see if we can get a duplicate shipment. And a new administrator for Settlement 32, she would have added, if she'd thought it would do any good. 
Maybe Selkor could draft Lando and Tendra. Down a stone tunnel between Gateway's laboratory building and the toxic marshes, Nomanor had set up an underground office. Leia Organa Solo's people had dug out the long tunnel. He'd created a side passage, using small organisms that fed on soft rock. As they bloated and died, he disposed of them by the thousands deep in the marshes. There they decomposed, their gut bacteria working the miracles that delighted Organa Solo's people. He marched through his outer chamber, fingering the disengagement spot on his gableth masker. Poor by poor it pulled out of his body. He gritted his teeth. Unlike War Master Savang La and the rest of them, he did not believe that his pain fed the gods. He claimed to serve Yun Harla, the trickster. And if she did exist, she probably loved the deception. But No Manor served only himself, and his chance of promotion. He had told the War Master the truth, by one definition. Leia Organa Solo was not true Jedi, and her daughter still was not proven. But if Savang La thought of them that way, he would be all the more impressed when No Manor destroyed them. As soon as 32 collapsed, Organa Solo would probably put him to work analyzing the catastrophe. He wished he didn't have to avoid her. He would love to see her face when they brought word that her children had been caught in the disaster. He shook off the semi-solid mass of masker around his ankles, then stretched languorously, relishing the sensation of free living air on his own skin. He had an hour to spare to relax. He plucked one of his tiny pets off the wall and hefted it one-handed. It didn't feel quite fully grown, which made it perfect for another purpose. Stretching up, he pressed its wriggling cilia deep into a ceiling crack. He'd weakened several sections of ceiling this way, then stationed other kinds of creatures down in the fracture zones. On his command, they could inflate themselves like woodcutter's wedges, bringing down long or deep stretches of ceiling. It was simply one more precaution. Jason crouched at the edge of a hut, scraping worm-like creatures off the underside of its synth plas eaves. They could be edible, Metza cautioned, gripping her hips to make a bunch of culottes fabric on each side. One of her people had found these creatures less than an hour ago. Maybe we could raise them? Extra protein for the frags, too? Jason tried not to gag as he sealed his sample sack. It's a thought. But feel this spot on the eaves. There's a pit. He ran a hand along the area where he'd scraped off the wriggling finger-length creatures. They're actually eating synthplasts. Then carry them in something other than that skimpy little sack. Jason wasn't going to take them far. Have your people watch for more. He looked down the narrow lane. This spot is close to the offloading area. They probably came in on a supply ship. At Hydroponics 2, Jason found Romani, the other clan leader, who'd been a biologist, working alongside Han and Jaina. Not my specialty, Romani insisted when Jason presented the wriggling sample sack. One of the worm-like creatures seized a pinch of synthplas and started chewing. Han glowered. Jaina put down a hydrospanner and adjusted her goggle mask. Jason flicked the creature off the synthplas. Maybe not, Romani, but you're the best authority we have. Without sending over to Gateway, I didn't want to do that. Right. Romani ran long fingers through his bushy mane. They'd quarantine us, and if the Duros heard about this, they might not send any more ships. We were mighty glad to get that extra shipment. He and Han exchanged a knowing look. Jason's mind bounced back to the Duros. I wonder if one of the core Duro ships brought in the egg pod these he shook the little sack, hatched from. 
Each gray worm had nine segments, and twice that many legs, with massive black eyes and mouth parts that were all out of proportion to the rest of their bodies. Jaina shook her head. Can't see them? Han asked gently. She blinked. I am getting better. The blurs have edges. Here we are, the wren said, eyeing the creatures, huddled under a synth plas dome. Great, Han said, just great. Jason pulled his cloak around him a little tighter. Romani, you and Metza could organize the children into hunt teams. We've got a little sucrose set aside for treats. We could pay them by the worm. Hey, Droma! Han shouted over the top of a hydroponics vat. I don't suppose you people eat little wiggly bugs. A white-maned head appeared over the transparent lid. With the right spices, Droma said with grave dignity, almost anything is edible, and Rhonda would probably love them. This time, Jason finished Droma's sentence. Then he looked aside. Han stared at Jaina, arching his eyebrows, his eyes soft and sad. Jason glanced from his father to his sister, comparing profiles. People generally claimed she resembled a young Leia, but below her bobbed hair, her forehead and cheeks really did have the same angles as Han's. Jason abruptly pitied any man who wounded Jaina's heart with less than a galaxy between himself and her father. As Jaina hiked off with Romani to look for Metza, Jason asked his dad, Do you think all this is going to take the edge off her fighting ability? If she doesn't want it to, it won't. Han shifted his weight, frowning. She's too much like her mother. Jason looked up sharply, hearing a depth of loneliness that Han never expressed openly. You're right, he told Han not wanting to say too much. He hustled after Jaina, though. He caught up at Metz's hut. I think it's time we went looking for Mom, he told his twin. Lenya, this morning's comm operator, stared at the transceiver with her oblique eyes wide. Even Rhonda seemed flabbergasted. Jaina had found Admiral Dizzlewit's soft spot— he had some sympathy for injured military personnel. Jaina had been given immediate access to the outsystem relay. Selcor! A human male wearing a high blue collar and short cape appeared on the relay screen, amid the usual cloud of blurred snowflakes. Deep space relays went down or out of repair every day, blasted by the Yuzhan Vong or sideswiped by space debris but nobody dared to go out and fix them. They'd lost commercial Holonet broadcasts completely. How shall I direct your call? Jaina sat up a little straighter, and Jason pulled his hand off her shoulder. We're looking for Ambassador Organa Solo, Jaina said. Do you have official business? Not again, Jason groaned to himself. One more runaround. Yes. Jaina said. We're calling in from a cell core locale. Not bad on the spur of the moment, Jason muttered while the screen blanked. You're not the only one who can make the truth sound impressive. Get the news from Nalhutta, Rhonda urged. Gamely, they stayed online while bureaucratic underlings shuffled them back and forth. Then a long-faced, elegant woman appeared her black hair pulled back severely to show exquisite ears. Jedi Solo, she said smoothly, and what a pleasant surprise, two Jedi Solos. How may I assist you? Jason bent toward Jaina's ear, but she'd already identified the voice. Senator Shesh, Jaina said. We need to contact Mother. I've been furloughed out. Injured. The last we heard anything specific, she was on Coruscant. Can your office trace her? I'm sure we can, the senator said. 
It is splendid to see you together, and looking so well. There was something false in her tone, though. Jason leaned toward the image. Rhonda pushed forward into his way. Senator, he gushed, please, you must send additional troops to— I'm sorry. Senator Shesh tilted her head. We mustn't hold this line open for non-essential communications. I'll have my staff return your call. Wait. Jason stretched forward over Jaina's shoulder. This connection took us an hour to— The senator's image dissolved into a network of fine diagonal lines. Jaina gargled a cry of frustration. Rhonda! I'm the one who got the call through. I'm the one who deserved to talk to her. You ruined it! Rhonda undulated backwards, away from the console. Tempted to insist that Selcor would surely call back, Jason pressed his lips shut. The callback might take days or weeks, or it might not come. Speaking of worms, he said, and he couldn't resist glancing at Rhonda as the hut left the shed. Senator Shesh rubs me wrong. Jaina frowned. But she's been named to the Advisory Council. She's practically the head of Selcor. I know, Jason said. And Selcor isn't exactly keeping its commitments. Think about the way she was standing, too. And that falseness in her tone of voice. The way she held herself, and that strange little smile. They reminded me of the holovids I've seen of another senator. Gina twisted the mask in her lap. I hate guessing games. Palpatine. Pre-Empire, he explained. When he was on his way up, and he didn't care who or what he destroyed to get there. Jaina frowned. And she's the one, she said, who delivers what we need to survive. She's also the one, Jason said, who put us here who decided Duro was safe. I don't like where you're taking this, Jason. Neither do I, he said softly. Not at all. Chapter 11 Savang La stroked the villip in his privacy chamber. His agents had recently delivered a newly budded subordinate villip to their contact on Coruscant. This first time, his contact might need a few moments to realize she was being called. On future occasions, his agents would deliver appropriate discipline if she delayed. She must have been eager. In only one minute, the villip softened and averted on its stand. Bumps formed on its pale surface. An aristocratic nose emerged first, then a dominating chin, high forehead, strong cheekbones— a firm, stern mouth. He'd studied the human species enough to recognize the flare of her nostrils and the widening of her eyes as signs of distaste. For the villip itself, maybe. In her diplomatic work, she would have dealt with many species and their methods. She controlled her reaction quickly. Senator Shesh, he said, forming words in her language as prompted by the teaser worm he'd slipped into his ear. He enjoyed seeing her eyes and nostrils twitch again as her villip spoke his words. I will receive your report. The villip rotated slightly forward. She must have inclined her head, a sign of respect. Warmaster La... Thank you for responding to my offer to open negotiations. I will receive your report, he repeated. She was young in his ways. He must make some allowances. Her eyes widened slightly. We are withdrawing from Kubindi, she said, and from Rhodia. We wish to live at peace with your people. Peace? as the teaser worm translated her tongue, meant willing and appropriate submission. Excellent, he said. We accept your peace.
In turn, she said, we would like some assurance that your invasion is nearly complete. Surely you can provide your people with homes and sustenance now. Leave us the worlds that remain. We must learn to live alongside each other in peace. His eyes narrowed, and he wondered if the teaser worm had translated something incorrectly. Peace flowed from a submissive underling to a conqueror, never in both directions. Our ultimate need, he said, is the system you have prepared. For that, receive thanks. From Duro, he could neutralize the famous drive yards in her home system of Kuat, as well as the monstrous weapon at Corellia. But she had been told nothing about these plans. You have assured me you will set agents to work, sabotaging Centerpoint. The villa inclined itself again. As soon as it can be done. Thanks also for your gift of the Uglith maskers. I enjoy traveling unrecognized. I might hope, she added in a lighter voice, that the masking and unmasking process becomes less uncomfortable over time. He saw no reason to coddle her. The sharp sensation of each pseudopod piercing a pore was a vital part of the masker's function. No, he said. Her left eye twitched. She hadn't yet accepted the discipline of pain. You are to be praised, he told her, for helping bring about a lasting peace for your people. Your role will be widely honored among us and your own folk. But not until peace comes. She raised her weirdly mobile eyebrows. Promise me that. Was she learning humility, or was she simply afraid of how her exaltation would come about? She had every reason to fear. He would want native rulers for his slave population, but the gods needed worthy sacrifices. Sunalak's priestess, Vekta, was bloodthirsty on their behalf. Perhaps this woman simply didn't want her people to know she'd changed loyalty. Your villip will invert again now. Remember to care for it. Ending with the insult of extra words was an appropriate way to chastise her. The villip spoke again, though. Wait, War Master Law. I have new information. He waited. It concerns my Selkor operation at Duro. I learned today... There is a Jedi at one settlement who has sworn off using his abilities. Maybe you can make use of him. This matched what he'd heard from Nomanor and other agents. The young one had allegedly abandoned his comrades in arms. Savang La could hardly imagine such treachery. Though such an individual did not deserve the dignity of having his name reported, he might prove useful if dissected. Have you learned anything else you should report? The villip remained silent for several seconds. Eventually, she said, I dislike delivering individuals, but as I told your agent, Pedrick Cuff, I am a businesswoman. That was not additional information. Savang La laid a hand over his villip. Silencing it. Chapter 12 Jason woke up clenching his hands so tightly they hurt. He rolled away from the sleeping hut's wall and peered toward his dad's comm unit, on a stack of mud blocks at the foot of his cot. Something had been flung over the chrono, and he could see only a pale red glow. The night felt old, though. Old and deadly. He sat upright, shut his eyes, and tried measuring the feeling. Under his uncle's tutelage, he'd worked on developing his danger sense. 
It had saved him in several tight situations. If those had been flickers, this was a full-fledged conflagration. It occurred to him that he didn't hesitate to use the force this way. Not in the least. I'm just listening. There's nothing aggressive about it. He threw on the nearest clothes and slipped outside. Along the dusty lane, he eyed the next hut for those mysterious worms. Several days earlier, the youngsters had stopped bringing them in. They couldn't find any more. At least that was one less thing to worry about. He found Jaina several huts down. Nothing was obviously threatening her, so he scratched that danger off his mental list. Silently, he opened her door and peered in. The grizzled Rin woman's snore had a high whine, like the falcon halfway through its warm-up. Jaina slept on her back. Normal sleep, not a healing trance. He could barely see her by the dim light of outdoor security lamps. Her hair had just enough curl to stick straight up in the front, like his often did when he woke up. He tiptoed over to her cot and dropped his hand onto her shoulder. Gina, he whispered. Her eyes fluttered open, and she turned her head. Jace? What is it? Sorry to wake you, he whispered. Come outside so we can talk. He led the way into the lane between huts. The big overhead lights gleamed faintly, giving the illusion of a necklace of moons under the gray dome. He caught the faint odor of Rin and a whiff of frag bedgy stew. Jaina stood beside him. In the dimness, her vision mask looked like a military night sight. You don't have to tell me, she said brusquely. Something's wrong. You feel it too? He glanced around. Blue roofed huts, hydroponics tanks, the control shed's inner corner, jutting into the dome. Nothing looked amiss. She nodded. Danger. To the whole colony. Jaina shut her eyes and leaned against the hut's exterior, frowning hard. Look at her, Jason's inner voice taunted. You'll rely on somebody else's casual force use. What kind of hypocrite are you? I just don't dare to stumble, he answered the voice. I'm the one who was warned, not Jaina. She shook her head and tucked a strand of hair back up under her mask. I can't find anything wrong, she said. Sith spawn, I hope we don't have Vong on the way. One way to find out. He led toward the control shed. Rhonda lay wedged along the back wall, snoring softly. Jaina told the night tech about their sensation. We don't know what it is, she said, but we're both getting it. Keep a tight watch. Yes, ma'am. The young human tossed off a casual salute. Back outside, Jaina paused at an intersection of two lanes. Okay, brother. You're the one with the functioning eyesight. Get a good look. She reached toward an illumination control. Jason almost stopped her. If she turned on the day lamps, she'd wake up the whole colony. Maybe for nothing. This didn't feel like nothing, though. He ducked back into the shed and seized a pair of macro binoculars off the supply wall. Clutching them against his chest, he climbed a set of rungs up the shed's exterior wall as the big lights came on. Then he peered out over the colony. Nothing. Nothing. And nothing. No skulkers, no lurkers, no obvious breaches, or... Wait... A flock of large moths, or maybe small birds, gathered around one of the day lamps. Adjusting the macrobinox resolution control, he got a closer look. More moth than bird, he decided, though the black wings didn't divide quite right. They had horns instead of antennae, and large white imitation eye spots on their black backs. He zoomed out again, swept the binox back and forth, and spotted a larger group of them, seemingly plastered against the dome's underside, up near the top. What is it? Jaina called up at him. I'm not sure. Looks like... Huh. Almost looks like young Minox, or... 
spotting movement at the corner of his peripheral vision, he sighted the binox down and left. Close at hand, one of the creatures fluttered up from under a hut's blue eaves. He clambered down. Telling Jaina, I'll be right back, he sprinted up the lane to the hut where the creature had taken flight. He looked up and down and around, and there, under the eaves, something papery dangled from the synthplas roof panel. He flicked it free, then examined it on his hand. What? Jaina's voice demanded behind him. His mind flashed back to Yavin 4, a menagerie he'd kept in his room, and a collection of pupa cases, where his pegglers had overwintered to emerge in the spring as exquisite rose wings. His insides congealed. Wake Dad up, he said. Fast. I'll activate the Erd L droids. The infestation had vanished because the worms had pupated. Now they were emerging as airborne adults. Whatever they ate, Jason was willing to bet that up out of everyone's reach they were laying eggs for a second cycle of destruction. Settlement 32 might have a few weeks to find and destroy the eggs. But his danger sense said otherwise. They were feeding now, in numbers that all the dome's emergency repair droids wouldn't be able to stop. He armed the Erd LLs, hybridized binary load lifters with long telescoping waists, with the only tools he could find, batter beaters from the open-air kitchen booth. Two sleepy wrens staggered out of the nearest shelter, leaning against each other. One squinted, while the other pointed at the near Erd LL. It swung a batter beater, knocking loose a flurry of the seemingly white-eyed creatures. Fluttering along behind its swath, the white eyes settled back against the dome's underside. Jason switched on his comlink and pressed in an ID sequence. Yo! A Rin voice growled. Did somebody lose track of the day cycle? Romany, Jason said. I need you. Emergency. Jaina came back at a quick walk. Dad's coming. Good. Go wake up the Vores and get a rebreather count. For the Vores, a breach could be deadly. That winged race was superbly adapted for its own atmosphere. But off Vortex, Vor's lungs were notoriously twitchy. Jaina headed up the lane. Next, he called Metza. He met her and Romani, who brought his lieutenant Ravana, at the open area at the center of the Rin Group's wedge of huts. By this time, Han had arrived. Quietly, Han said, without panicking anybody, Get your people suiting up, just in case. Jason broke in. At the moment I'm more afraid of a stampede than a breach. But we haven't done a breach drill in too long. Call it a drill, if anyone will believe you. Metza honked scornfully and jogged away. Romani slipped into the nearest hut. Okay, kid. This way. Han led Jason to the dome's center where he pulled out a large blue tank with hose and nozzle. I told Selcor this was useless, that we wouldn't be cleaning the ceiling. Guess I was wrong. Jason helped him haul the tank to the hydroponics area, where one of the Erd LL droids was uselessly brushing white eyes aside. Down! Han barked. Retract! The droid telescoped downward. Han secured the tank on one metal arm, then grabbed the droid's other hand. Give me a boost, he grunted. Jason was reaching forward when a large furry object catapulted between himself and his father. I can do that, Droma announced. He clambered up nimbly. About time you got here, wire hair. Han brushed dust off his sleeves. Think you can figure out... Up! Droma honked. The Erd LL elevated again. The nimble Rin gripped a metal loop on the droid's large flat hand, locking his feet, ankles, and prehensile tail around a rigid extension arm. What's in the tank? Jason demanded. It was about to come showering down on everyone's heads. Don't know, Han admitted. Supposed to be non-toxic, 
even divorce. Six minutes later, they knew it wouldn't harm the white eyes either. They kept fluttering up from under eaves. Rin roamed the settlement, crushing intact pupae, but for every white eye they found, ten more flew up to the dome and started chowing down. Gina sprinted back. The Vores need thirty-eight more rebreathers, Dad. Han fixed Jason with a stare. Think you can talk thirty-eight Rin or humans out of their breath masks? Jason gulped. I guess... Look at this! Droma shouted. He slid down the Erd LL's midsection, holding something in one hand. Jason, Han, and Jaina circled him. Droma held up a clear spray nozzle. Trapped inside, a white eye attacked the synthplast nozzle with relish. Viewed from below, its mouthparts looked like twin rasps. They ground against the clear surface and then rotated inward, swallowing the dust. Worse than Minox, Han grunted. That's it. Jason, get on the horn to Gateway. I'll get a few vores into land speeders. We're getting out. Jason sprinted back to the control shed, counting days in his mind. Gateway should have had a comline crew out late yesterday, if they were on schedule. If the lines were down, though, 32's only hope was to load up the caravan ships and hunker, praying their air scrubbers functioned long enough for rescue to arrive, or else to lift off on repulsors and head for another settlement. Some of those ships barely had made it here, and some refugees were dropped by ships that traveled on. Rhonda sat up. Slowly blinking his huge eyes, he belched. Jason ignored him and strode to the comtech. I need gateway. Intercolony assistance. The tech punched panels. To Jason's relief, a crisp voice came back instantly. Gateway. Gateway, this is 32. We've got a breach pending, a big one. We need the evacuation crawlers. On their way. What kind of breach? Can it be mended? I don't know. We've got some kind of an infestation. Copy that. We'll have the crawlers to you in about... Pause. Twenty-six minutes. Meanwhile, keep your people calm. Get them in breathers and chemsuits if you can, and aboard whatever crawlers you have on hand. We have one small crawler gateway. They used it to move ships off the landing crater and under shelter. Affirmative. One crawler. Load it. Jason faintly heard another voice, evidently someone else near the person who'd greeted him. Thirty-two. The voice came back. What kind of infestation? Jason hesitated. We're, uh, already suiting them up. Thanks, Gateway. Thirty-two! The voice repeated firmly. Describe infestation! Jason admitted, Nothing I've seen before. I'll save you a sample. A different voice spoke over the link. Make sure it's tightly contained, Thirty-two. Will do. Jason turned around to see Rhonda rising on his long, strong tail. What is this? the hut demanded. We're evacuating the dome, Jason told him. Those little worm creatures have metamorphosed into something like moths. They're all over the dome's underside, eating it. Use the force, Rhonda demanded. Crush them! Choke them! Jason tried to imagine seizing hundreds of tiny creatures, throttling the life out of them. No, he said, too many of them. You haven't tried. Rhonda slithered forward. Listen, Rhonda, Jason didn't need this. You can get in the way, or you can help. Get your breath mask and help keep order. We're about to take twelve hundred scared people through one gate— you ask me to direct traffic? Rhonda puffed out his chest. Me? Rhonda Bessati Diori, you ask? Jason pushed past the hut toward the shed's door. All right, then. Just stay out of the way. Stay in here, he added, turning around. As soon as Gateway's crawlers call in, ready to load, come link me. This quarter of the dome teemed with refugees, some of them masked, a few chem-suited. A family of Vuvrians staggered past, bobbing their huge heads, 
to point first one eye, then another, then another, up at the dome's underside. Their faces reminded Jason of deflated balloons, with perpetually puckered mouths and knobbed, drooping tentacles. Right in front of him, a rin pointed a blaster at the dome. Jason rushed forward, shouting, Put that away! He was about to stretch out with the force when the rin fired a blue stun burst. The energy dissipated before it reached the growing moth colony. Good try, Jason said grimly, but we've got a no-blaster policy. He grabbed the rin's weapon and tucked it into his belt. Atop the other Erd LL's outstretched arms, two rin clung and swatted white eyes with long-handled kitchen tools. A few mangled moths fell to the ground. Others fluttered around the rin. One rin dropped his spatula and got busy swatting moths off the other. And himself. The winged vores would have been incredibly helpful in a larger dome, but thirty-two was too small for them to maneuver, and one whiff of duro stink might kill them. They shuffled along on the ground, huddled around their young. Jason calmly on. Twenty-two minutes, he said. They want us in breathers and chem suits. Tell Metza and Romany. I've got a droid freezing up. Jason spotted Rhonda, pushing out through the assembled crowd toward the hydroponics area. He sprinted to intercept the hut. What are you doing? he demanded softly. Get back to the gate and stay put. I will lock down the food supply against our return. Dad's got a Vouvrian crew working on that. Go on, get back. If you try to give me orders, young Jedi, you will regret it. Jason shifted his approach. Not orders, Rhonda. We need you. Please do it our way. Help keep those people from wandering away from the gate. If they do, we'll have a stampede when the crawlers get here. Muttering a retort, the hut turned tail and slithered back toward the gate. Jason took a deep breath and looked over the Rin area. Other than Rhonda, the alert was going well, with the last families donning gear and proceeding toward the gate area, except for the SWAT team, still hard at work atop its Erd LL droid. Close to the Vor quarter, a dribble of gray haze started flowing from the area thickest with moths. The colony's breach siren sounded, a low electronic moan. The hindmost vores, still emerging from their huts, shrieked and erupted forward, a mass of slender limbs and long faces. Jason sprinted toward them. The forefront of the charging contingent hit him and spun him against a rough mud-brick surface. Winded, he took a few deep breaths. Then he spotted a vor without a breath mask. Here, he shouted, tossing his own. The delicate-looking creature jammed the mask over his pointed face and pushed on. Then he spotted another gray dribble. Moths skittered away from the second breached spot, settled closer to a strut, and started chewing again. Jason hoped Duro's atmosphere would kill the creatures. He grabbed his comlink. Dad? Gateway's here, Junior. Bring him on. Copy that. Jason thumbed off the link and pressed away from the wall. One of the vores staggered and fell. A rin bounded up and gathered the slender female into his arms. Two vores turned around, shouting something, and grabbed their kinswoman back from the rin. Thanks. Jason clapped the rin on one shoulder. Go on, go ahead. I'll bring up the rear. He scrambled up onto a roof and got one good look. The entire colony had streamed out onto the lanes pressing toward the gate like fizz brew against a bottle cap. Some stragglers were spinning around, pointing up at the two, now three, breached spots, ducking and cowering like ten-year-olds with a crystal snake loose in their quarters. A gray cloud boiled down over the vor's huts. Jason caught a whiff of Duro's ghastly odor, the concentrated stench of thousands of abandoned Imperial war factories, he held a fold of his vest over his mouth while he strode toward the gate. A rin met him, wearing a full chem suit and mask. What else do you need? It wheezed in Romany's voice. 
Has anyone checked your people's shelters? If we leave anyone behind to sleep, they might miss the ride out. Romani pulled two hefty adults out of line to assist him, then demanded the chem suits of a less muscular pair. We're going back, he explained. We could be here for a while. Go on, get on board. The others protested. Jason left them to their argument and pressed back into the control shed. Rhonda and the Comtech were gone. Jason peered out the view bubble. Outside, five enormous idling vehicles reminded him of hydroponics tanks laid side to side and joined over three axles, each of their knobby tires bigger than five refugee huts. Flexible coffer dams had been extended to three of them. Colonists wearing full suits streamed away from the boarding tubes through Duro's perpetual fog, toward the farthest vehicle, directed by similarly suited Selcor personnel. He pushed out of the shed into the mob. More Selcor crewers had taken control of the boarding area, directing refugees forward. To Jason's dismay, Rhonda slithered forward, knocking down Rin and humans in his rush to reach the gate. Hey! Han's voice rose. Jason spotted him standing on a stack of crates. Back off, Rhonda. Push like that and you'll be the last one on board. The hut drove on, parting the wave of refugees like one of Lando's cruise ships at full throttle. Han drew a blaster. Hold it right there, Rhonda. If I let you do this, there's no stopping anyone. Rhonda halted, glaring back over his shoulder. Refugees paused to help up the ones Rhonda had bowled over, then streamed around him. Jason spotted a young mountain of belongings alongside the gate, and an officious-looking Twi'lek in a Selkor chem suit directing refugees to drop their bundles before he let them pass. Jason sidled alongside the Selkor man. Look, he murmured, these people have hardly got anything left to call their own. Don't beggar them all over again. The Twi'lek spread his pale hands. We will send back for your belongings. For now, saving life is our priority. Wait, what's that? An elderly human woman clutched one hand to her chest and supported her husband with her other arm. Something black and furry stuck up out of the woman's bunched coat. The Twi'lek seized the coat and fingered it open. A furry bundle clung to the woman, splaying four scrawny limbs against her tunic. Jason recognized a young whisper kit, betrayed by one quivering ear. Sorry, the Twi'lek grunted. Don't know how you got a pet this far, but it can't come aboard. The woman's blue-gray eyes thickened. Sir, we're keeping it safe for our grandson. He's with the Fifth Fleet, and we promised... Saving life. Priority. The galaxy teetering on a balance point the size of one frightened whisper kit. Jason shoved forward and tugged the Twi'lek's fingers off the woman's coat. If we don't see it, it isn't here. He turned around and glared at the Selkor official. How much, he muttered, does a whisper kit eat or breathe, compared with what leaving it here would do to morale? The Twi'lek set his knobby jaw. What whisper kit? Jason backed away. The duro stink grew stronger with every breath. The last mixed mob of Rin and Vuvrians pressed forward dropping bundles in their haste to reach the coffer dams. The final refugees trampled the bundles. Droma flicked Han a salute. That's everybody, Solo. Han lowered his blaster. Go on, Rhonda. Jason, stun him if he gives you trouble, but don't leave him here. Jason followed the fuming hut up the near crawler's boarding ramp as Han sprinted past. Rhonda halted just inside the hatch, blocking Jason's way. Three Selcor crewers loped up behind Jason. Come on, one urged. We're moving out. Rhonda, Jason shouted. Farther in. The hut turned his head, rumbling angrily. 
Your father said I would be the last one on board. So this crawler is full. Something pushed Jason from behind. He fell over Rhonda's surprisingly solid body. The hut's muscular tail whipped around, flinging several wren against other refugees. One fell senseless. Jason thumb-checked the stun setting on his confiscated blaster, leveled it at the hut, and fired. Rhonda drooped. Hoots, whistles, and muffled applause broke out on board. Something dug into Jason's ribs. Nice going, Jaina growled. He exhaled. Glad you're aboard. What was that about not being aggressive? He was hurting people. Jason returned the blaster to his belt. And I wasn't using the force. And the Yuzhan Vong aren't hurting people? So they shouldn't be stopped with everything we've got? Ignoring her sarcasm, Jason braced himself against the hatch. The crawlers started to vibrate. Everybody get steady, he shouted. This road's a little rough. Chapter 13 As the crawler lurched along, the warmth and odor of several hundred none-too-clean bodies, compounded by nervous sweat, made Jason wrinkle his nose. He felt lucky to be next to a hatch. He'd be one of the first off. Lovely, Jaina murmured. Where's my breath mask? At the far end of the hold, someone started singing. Singly and in groups, Rin joined the melody, some whistling harmonies through their perforated beaks. Jason didn't need words to recognize a traveling song. The perennial outcasts were moving on to their next adventure. His comlink chirruped. Excuse me he said to the wren he elbowed while raising it to his mouth. Sorry, he told the one he shoved while trying to steady himself. Jason Solo, he said. Crow deck here. You're the one who called over? Affirmative. Tell me again what caused the breach. All I've got is a report that sounds like miniature Minox. Didn't someone get you a sample? Not if you don't have one. I don't. Jason explained as little as possible. When he got to the point about the moth creatures pupating on the outside of sleeping huts, there was a long silence. He flicked the comlink. Crudeck, did you get that? They're singing in here and... Copy! A voice that hadn't spoken before said. We're calling ahead about decontamination. The refugees close enough to hear Jason's comlink turned their heads. Believe me, Jason said, nobody brought a pupa. Not deliberately, the comlink voice said, but one egg stuck to one hairy wren will restart the cycle. And our dome's taller than yours. Put a flock of moths up there out of reach and you'll bring down the whole operation. Jason clutched the link, leaning against Jaina and swaying with the crawler's motion. Other than Rhonda, most of the other passengers at this end of the cavernous hold seemed to be Rin. If Jason couldn't have told that by looking, he could have figured it out by the odor. If it bothered him, it must be driving the Rin out of their minds. Several of them had raised their arms and were rotating in place, actually dancing. Jason murmured into the comlink, Rin are almost compulsively clean. There won't be white-eye eggs or anything else on them. Maybe you're convinced, the crewer said. A furred species is tricky to decontaminate. We've got a sealable refugee processing area inside Gateway Dome. Only problem is, we don't have any Unifumi stockpiled. Selcor usually ships their decontam chemicals with every boatload of refugees. High-energy irradiation would work, but it could cause skin damage and low-energy lamps won't get through fur. So they're going to have two choices. We can strip and dip everybody in med lab disinfectant, but I can't guarantee that won't make them sick. Or we can shave and irradiate. The wren next to Jason honked softly. He turned aside and muttered to three others. Isn't there something else? Jason asked, 
uncomfortably aware that he was surrounded by several hundred sleep-deprived Rin who'd just left all their belongings behind. Again. We can separate out the Vouvrians and Vors, the voice continued. Hairless folks can zip through a fast irradiation, and we'll send them on their way. Jason curled against the hatch. Why are you asking me? Where's Captain Solo? He seems to have lost his comlink. You're next in charge. Jason thumbed off the comlink, hoping Selcor's administration would come up with a better idea. The engine thrummed rhythmically under his feet. Some of the rin were now stamping out that rhythm as others sang. Jason flexed his knees, swaying against Jaina. That doesn't sound good, she muttered. The comlink chirped again. Solo? He raised it. Here. We've got word from someone named Metza. They're refusing to be dunked in medlab juice, not that I blame them. Me neither, Jason said. And don't discriminate against Rin. Whatever goes for them, goes for Vors and Vuvrians and humans. And the hut, he added, glancing down. Rhonda had curled up in a bulbous spiral. The song ended. Someone started a new one. Two verses later, Jason got another announcement via comlink. Finally found the other solo. He says fair's fair. Same treatment for everybody. Well done, Dad. Jason murmured to Jaina, I don't care if they shave me. Me neither. I've seen buzz-cut female pilots. When the shaking and thrumming died away, something clanged against the hatch. Jason tried to move back. The mob behind him pushed in the opposite direction. He braced against a bulkhead. Fortunately, the crew had moved a ramp up to the hatch, so when it opened he didn't fall headlong. Crewers called commands, directing the debarking refugees to fan out and keep moving. Rin streamed around the prone hut. The crawlers had been driven inside a mammoth metal room, larger than many docking bays, and sealed off from the rest of the dome. A chem-suited crewer waved Jason and Jaina aside, so they headed for an elevated platform, and spotted their father on his way to the same spot, trading shoves with Droma. Other gateway crewers directed the new refugees toward a fenced area, where still others scurried around, laying something out on the ground. The noise level rose steadily, Vors and humans and Vuvrians and Rin all talking at once. Through a bay door that resealed instantly, there whirred a small ground-effect vehicle marked Administration. Four figures sat inside, wearing brilliant orange chem suits and full-helmeted masks, Jason appreciated their situation. Like the crewers, anybody who joined them in quarantine would face decontamination. But why hadn't they just set up a holoprojector? Then he got a feeling about that vehicle. Incredulous, he nudged Jaina. She'd been right here. Here all along, at Gateway. Jaina nudged him back. They turned toward one another, so each one could watch their father with side vision. The second smallest of the three orange-suited figures jumped out of the vehicle. Her face was shrouded, but her determined gait was unmistakable, and Jason felt her through the force. Her smaller shadow had to be one of the Nogri. Han and Droma strode up. Han looked half ready to send Droma flying. No, they don't have repulsor combs. We're just going to have to do this. The hard way? Droma interrupted. What do you care if they take off that little patch of fur on top of your empty head? Do you have any idea how cold... The orange-suited figure reached them. Hello, Han said, hastily setting his dirt-streaked face to a slight smile. Thanks for sending the crawlers, but we've got a slight problem. One of your crewers just found something he thought was an egg. We've got to find out where those bugs came from. But my people here deserve a little respect. We'll do our best. Jason strained his ears. The voice sounded husky, but right. Equal treatment for everyone. 
Selcor is enormously grateful for refugee sponsors. Han extended a hand. Glad you understand. Han Solo. Instead of taking his hand, the administrator reached up for her mask's clasps. Hey, wait, Han exclaimed. You'll end up in decontamination. She pulled off her mask one-handed. A long coil of dark brown hair tumbled loose. That's all right, she said somberly. Leia stared at Han's weary face, his gaping hazel eyes, his slack jaws stubbled with gray. Luke and Mara must have known Han was here, and assumed she did too. How many people made that assumption? And so they just didn't tell her? Now she knew she might have only a moment to reach him, before he remembered the last time she spoke to him. Angrily. If your people have to be decontaminated, she told Droma, I'll show them Gateway and Selcor are with them, not against them. For the moment, her aide Abella could manage Gateway's day-to-day -day business. Before Han's eyes went hard and empty again, she had to reach him. She stepped closer. Besides, I had no idea you were here. I should have known, but I don't think you ever sent over a roster. We, uh, didn't. A lopsided grin appeared. I suspect Selcor's been too busy administering Gateway to notice. She glanced over her shoulder. Olmach stayed close, on watch, as C-3PO assisted the newcomers. Where would she put them all? She'd hoped to bring those poor thirty-two people inside her more permanent dome eventually, and send workers back in week-long shifts. Gateway had plenty of space, but construction equipment was booked for weeks ahead. Her new apartments filled before she built them. There were tents, carefully struck when her first charges moved into sturdier huts, and there was the decontamination issue. Later, she had four-fifths of her family in plain sight. Everyone but Anakin. This hadn't happened in months. She flung her arms around Han. His body remained stiff, but he laid an arm on her shoulders. She backed away from him. Hello, Mom. Jason opened his arms, then hesitated. Leia set down her droopy fabric helmet. Since she was committed to quarantine now, she yanked off her chem suit and then flung her arms around Jason. By the force, you're as big as your father. Then she spotted Jaina, hanging back. What are you doing here? Jaina dangled a pair of fancy goggles from one hand. Sick leave. We tried to find you. Leia's stomach took a dive. Were you injured? Temporary partial blindness. Nothing serious. Jaina lowered her voice. Get it straight with Dad, Mom. That's first. She turned and strolled back toward the Rin mob. Smiling ruefully, Jason placed both hands on Leia's shoulders. He gently turned her toward Han, who had thrust his hands back into his pockets. First, Jason murmured. Hesitantly, Leia caressed both twins through the Force. Jason glowed with the pleasure of being reunited. In Jaina there was a repressed bitterness that she'd obviously have to face. Later. Guess it's time I found something to do. Droma replaced the soft cap he'd doffed. Good to see you again, Princess Leia. He followed Jaina. Leia linked one arm through her husband's. Let me show you the whole quarantine area she said lightly. In a converted repair dock, families clung to each other, shuffling forward. She mustn't look at them. She had to settle things with Han. Her fault, his fault, didn't matter. Beneath her strength and independence, she really was happiest with someone to help carry her burdens. On the other hand, that meant she had to help carry his. Yes, she admitted. 
Selcor and Gateway have been taking care of themselves and trying to reclaim the planet. Remember, Honiger, where we couldn't do much of anything? Here, it's in reach, and the Yuzhan Vong don't want it. This could be a haven for millions. I don't think you've paid much attention to the Duros. He frowned. They're barely tolerating us, she admitted. But we haven't given much back yet. This world is the key to a new future, where all peoples can live side by side. Wait until you see what our scientists are starting to accomplish. Where's old Goldenrod? Han rubbed his rough chin. I could have used him. All they gave us was a pair of beat-up modified load lifters. I had to scam a medical droid. Leia half-smiled. Three P.O.? Just what you needed. Someone to really irritate you. Han must be utterly distracted, she thought, not to recognize C-3PO in a vermin-proof chem suit. Han's eyes narrowed. Has his soldier shown up? She pulled away, feeling blindsided. What? At least ten people played me that holonet bite of you and his gorgeousness stepping off that hapen ship together on Yald. You look pretty cozy. Leia got a good breath. You, who wants everybody to trust you, can't you trust me? The Nets have used that as a publicity stunt. I couldn't back out without losing the Hapen's support. We needed those ships. His expression softened. Yeah, we did need them. Too bad how that turned out. One crisis resolved. On to the next. How's Jason? She asked. I heard he was taking it all pretty hard. Still chewing on it, I guess. He grabbed her hand. You accused me of having a fling with my past. Well, look at these people. Does this look like a fling? No, she said. Han, I'm sorry. It's been tough lately. Really hard. Yeah. Well. He firmed his lips, swallowed, then glanced up again. You probably won't forget some things. But I was hoping you'd forgive them. Leia threw her arms around him again. This time he returned the embrace. His arms gripped her. His breath had the sweetness of, well, of a wet wookie. She held her breath while she kissed him. Then there was no more time for reconciliation. They walked toward the repair dock, which was rapidly filling with strangers of several species. Leia had ordered it furnished with sleeping pads. Han frowned. Looks good, but I hope you don't care if the Rin reshuffle their area every evening. Why? He stood loose-limbed, looking out on the mob. They have some interesting taboos. One of them is against sleeping twice in the same place. I don't care if they sleep on top of each other. I'm more concerned about feeding them. Just give them whatever you would have shipped to thirty-two. I'm more worried about water. We've got a well started, under the Adnan building. For ten minutes, they talked about supplying refugees with basic needs. Really, for someone who didn't do administration, he'd managed fabulously. She told him so. Sometimes, he drawled, I still amaze myself. But Droma thought through a lot of it. Him and the clan heads, Metza and Romani. And Jason has been trying to keep the peace. Me? I'm the hope of rescue guy. She slid her arm around his waist. They'd climbed onto the top of a controller's cubicle. Olmach followed at a discreet distance. Among the milling rin, she spotted Jaina with a group of grizzled females, once again wearing her mask. How badly was she hurt, Han? She ended up E.V. The thought of her daughter drifting in frigid vacuum in the middle of a battle made Leia's stomach churn again. We've got a decent medical facility. 
I could process her through decontamination quickly. No, Han said. Only time will fix this. No special treatment for humans, and especially not our family. These Rin have been kicked around for centuries. They're not a big group, but they're loyal to people who treat them decently. A pair of stretcher-bearers stalked past, pushing a float cart loaded down with a young-looking hut. What's he doing here? Leia demanded. Han shone that lopsided grin again. She felt she would never get enough of it. He claimed that he wanted to defect and hit the Vong where it hurts. But did you ever know a hut who could cooperate under pressure? Leia thought hard. I'll tell you if I remember any. I have an idea, Han. How many sick and injured have you got? He pursed his lips and stared out over the mob. She eyed his profile, cataloging features she'd loved half her life. Had he broken his nose again? Other than Jaina, mostly just scrapes and bruises from trying to kill the moth things. Why? We'll process the sick and injured as priority. Then we can include Jaina. Unless she'd rather stay in quarantine indefinitely than get her head shaved. She's at that age, you know. Young men are looking. He reached out and fingered the long coil of hair that hung forward over her blue uniform. Can the old guys look, too? She touched his hand. I guess it'll have to come off, Han. He shrugged. It'll grow. It'll just take a while. Will you stick around while it does? She tried not to plead, but she wanted to. He ran a hand over his unruly hair. Hey, someday I might lose mine for good. We'll call it a dry run. Then he winked, and she melted inside. She led back down into the controller's cubicle. At the loudspeaking station, she punched in a sharp tone that silenced the roar of outside conversations. Attention, please, she said. This is Gateway Administration. Welcome. We will try to settle you and meet your needs as quickly as possible. Stand by for a message from your own administrator. She pushed the comlink at him. What? he demanded. Sick and wounded, back to the debarking area, she muttered. Nerf herder. He nodded and echoed the announcement. Fifteen minutes later, Leia's health administrator, fully suited, was explaining priority decontamination to a cluster of Rin and Vors and five elderly humans. Leia stepped back. She didn't see Jaina. Han had gone out among the Rin. Frowning, she climbed back up to the lookout perch. It took longer than she anticipated to spot Jaina along the south wall. She clambered back down and made her way over. The odd odor of Rin came from everywhere. She made another mental note. Plain water baths. And something warm for all those poor Rin to slip on after the decontamination crew took their fur. Fortunately, the supply ship carrying her mining laser had gotten through. She'd put the new laser to work, deepening the well under her admin building. Fresh, reliable water would be essential, with Pit 32 potentially lost. Jaina stood leaning against the south wall. Didn't you hear the announcement? Leia asked. We're processing anyone sick or wounded first, so we can get them into our medical facility. I'll walk you through. Thanks, Jaina said. But if Coruscant's med center couldn't do anything for me, I doubt yours can. I can use you, Leia said, personally. I'm swamped out there. I have an aid. But by the time everyone here gets out of quarantine, I'll be so far behind that... Something hard tapped her shoulder. She turned her head and looked into the blank mask of a chemsuit. What is it, 3PO? Excuse me, but there is a priority transmission from Buru waiting on line six, he told her. And the report you requested from Dr. Kriar... That'll keep, she told him. Say hello to Jaina. Hello, Mistress J. Good to see you, 3PO. Jaina turned aside and said bluntly, 
You'll never catch up. Not with my help, not with a dozen assistants. That's because you take on everyone else's problems. Well, you weren't there for mine. Not even the military could find you, Mother. I thought you'd finally been caught by some unreconstructed imperial terrorist, or that the Yuzhan Vong dropped a moon on you. Jason and I tried to find you from 32. What a joke. First, we couldn't get an out-system connection. When we finally reached Selkor, we got Vicky Shesh. That was another joke. I haven't signed my reports, but if she wanted to find me, she could. Jaina's words stung, but Leia thought it would be best to let her vent. Senator Shesh had done very little toward easing supply problems. I don't care, Jaina said. I don't want special treatment. I want to help these people. What about the old ones? There's no treatment that will cure their aches and pains. Before, at least they had their ways, their traditional meds. Now they've got nothing. Are you going to process all of them through first, too? Yes, Leia told her. Immediately after the... Shaved, mother? The old people? Mistress Jaina, C-3PO butted in. You will be pleased by our relatively fine medical facility. Leia felt warmth spread up her neck toward her face. Jaina, I'm trying to help them. And you. Maybe. Jaina said through her teeth. I just don't want help anymore. You showed me I had to learn to do without you. So I did. She stalked away. Leia gave chase. You seem to have missed something, she said. I'll be decontaminating out of here the same as you, the same as anyone. Think about it. Jaina stared at the long coil of hair. You're kidding, she said quietly. Mother, if you... How long did it take to grow it that long? That's not even slightly important. You are. I suppose we won't ever find it easy to live in the same place again. We're too much alike. Jaina's grin showed teeth. Bullheaded, obstinate, perfectionist, me? How could you accuse me of heredity? Leia answered, and environment. You were doomed. At least you've got your father's luck. Jaina's smile faded. Before I forget, Mom, you need to talk to Jason. You know how well he reads people. And? Leia prompted, confused again. While we were looking for you, he got a look at your Senator Shesh. He had a real strong reaction. Negative. Leia thought back to her own dealings with Shesh on Coruscant. Publicly, the senator had staunchly supported Selkor and the Jedi, despite their PR problems. And yet there'd been unexplained shortages, communication problems, defense shortfalls. If Leia wanted to suspect Senator Vicky Shesh of duplicity, it wouldn't be hard. I'd better talk to him, she said. Chapter 14 So, Droma waggled his mustachios. She could have married royalty, and she took you instead. Han backhanded his friend with a spoonful of synthetic stew, driving Droma backwards off his stool. Jason could barely stay awake. It had been an incredibly long day. Most of the Rin were laying out their sleeping pads. Rhonda was the first one out of quarantine after the sick list, he interrupted. Han stirred his stew and gave Droma the look Jason and Jaina had always called the stare. And Leia's people locked him up already. Now what? Droma asked. The usual. Tried to get outside the dome just to look at the ships. Just looking. Han repeated, as Droma clambered back onto his stool. Droma eyed his own bowl and spoon. Jason, suspecting the Rin was calculating range and elevation, slid his stool back. Jaina and Leia had processed through, too, 
Han had convinced Jaina he would need an outside liaison with the people who processed through, and someone to keep an eye on Rhonda. At that, Leia decided she'd cover her own job better outside than in here. She'd left Olmok in quarantine to assist with security. Jason took the news philosophically. He'd hoped his parents would spend a little more time together after so long. Twenty-three Rin followed Jaina out, Han was saying. Leia found them flight suits, so at least they'll stay warm until the fuzz grows back. I thought they looked pretty good. You would, Droma bristled. You're getting nearsighted. Your mouth looks just as big as ever. Now Jason spotted the soft light in Han's eyes and a self-satisfied grin. Maybe his parents had found a few moments alone. In his opinion, they'd both made convenient use of their circumstances to keep from reuniting. There was something splendid about the universe when your mother and father loved each other. Someone ought to go back over to 32, he said, and get our belongings. The Rin smoothed his mustachios. Possessions? They're just something to lose. I'm more interested in whether there are still spaceworthy ships over there. Yeah, Han said. Figure out how to get them here while you're at it. If we leave Gateway in a hurry, it won't be by crawler. Jason clenched his fists at the sight of 32's ruins. Synthplast scraps drooped between struts that arched like the ribs of a beast picked clean by carrion crawlers. Through those ribs, from a vantage near the remains of the entry gate, Jason could see rows of blue-roofed huts through what used to be the protective dome. Gateway's driver had donned a chemsuit before bringing still-quarantined refugees on board. He shook his head. Good thing you weren't in there when it started to breach. His voice came filtered through the transparent faceplate. Actually, we were, Jason muttered. He stepped into the overalls of his own rebreather-equipped chemsuit. Over them went an orange jacket, gloves attached. He worked his fingers down into the gloves, which didn't hamper his touch when he attached his soft helmet and anchored the clasps. Selcor must have gotten the suits from a military source, he reflected. Ready? he asked his team. Droma had slid into his orange suit. Metza, older and bulkier, struggled to bring hers over her head. Six other suited figures moved toward the crawler's hatch. Scanning for life forms, the driver's assistant said. He worked a few controls. Negative in this line of sight, but be careful. Jason hooked his lightsaber on the outside of his suit. Mutant Fefza beetles were the only creatures known to have survived the collapse of Duro's ecosystems. He led down the crawler's ramp. Each pair of the others pushed a repulsor cart. Their mission was simple. Gather as many belongings as possible and get back before dark. Jason, nominally in charge, would help wherever he was needed. Then bring the Falcon over to Gateway while Droma followed in 32's battered I-7 Howl Runner. He moved out with a pair of tall, thin Vors who had volunteered for a duty that was much more dangerous for them, with their twitchy lungs. They also had their pride, but they looked almost skeletal in orange chemsuits, except for the arms, plumped unnaturally by bunching their leathery wings into the sleeves. His insulated boots crunched on dead moths, as he strode up the first lane. Evidently, Duro's atmosphere did kill them. They wouldn't spread overland to other domes. Grateful for one small blessing, he escorted the Vors to the first hut in their sector. They ducked inside while Jason stood guard, vaguely uneasy. Within minutes, the Vors emerged carrying armloads of clothing and other belongings— Jason helped bundle that load together, and then the Vors quietly pushed on to the next hut. Saving their breath, Jason guessed. They'd cleared several huts when Jason's comlink squealed. Solo! Metz's voice barked. Get over here! He sprinted back up the lane, 
searching the rin section. Finally, he spotted a tethered repulsor cart. He shifted direction and headed toward it, gripping his lightsaber with his right hand so it wouldn't bounce against his hip bone. He plunged into the shelter. Two orange-suited forms had backed against its inside wall. Closer to Jason was an insect he'd seen only in hollows and nightmares. Fefza beetles, loosed on the planet's surface during the Duro's early days of space travel, had the odd quirk of both internal and external skeletons, so the mutant strain had been able to grow to enormous size. This one was well over a meter long, with segmented antennae waving toward him, sniffing through the Duro stench. Evidently it had taken this hut as a nest, because the crumpled wings of hundreds of white eyes lay along one half-eaten cot. Under iridescent wing covers, the beetle's soft abdomen was grossly distended. It had evidently gorged on white eyes, and the wren's pitiful possessions. It was getting ready to lay eggs. Unfortunately, Metza and her partner had gotten past it before spotting it. They crouched against an interior wall, brandishing a cast-off shirt and a pair of leggings. Whenever the beetle's antennae twitched, they flapped the clothing. Jason drew and ignited his lightsaber. The beetle turned, working the air with two of its armored, pincer-footed legs. Green, blue, and purple light reflected off the iridescent grooves of its body. And its mouth parts, easily wide enough to grip a rin leg, clicked ominously. Load your pile and get out, Jason said. Kill it! Metz's voice hooted out of the nearer, bulkier chem suit. Jason didn't turn his head. Why? There are thousands of them all over the surface. Kill it! she shrieked. One beetle dead is a hundred less next season. It's going to lay eggs. Jason saw the sense in that. But the creature had no evil intent. It had found an excellent nesting spot, complete with food source, and he didn't want to kill needlessly. Just load up the cart and move on, he told Metza. I don't think she'll come after you. She? Metza demanded. So now it's a she? Do males lay eggs? Solo! The calm link in his pocket shrieked. We have trouble! He fingered it on as he raised it. On my way, he said. Then to Metza, get your things and get out. He positioned himself between Metza and the clicking beetle until she'd cleared the hut. Then he backed out after her. The beetle didn't follow. Standing well out into the lane, he closed down his lightsaber and touched the comlink again. The cry, almost avian, had sounded like a vor. Or was that just the distortion of breath masks and fluctuating reception? Where are you? Over here! On a roof! Grunting and whacking noises sounded over the link. He scrambled up a nearby shelter and balanced on top. About twenty meters away, two pudgy-armed orange figures, definitely vores, stood on another blue roof, menaced from below by five iridescent beetles. Side by side... The orange figures flung someone else's heirlooms at the creatures. The huge insects ducked, then came on again, scrabbling against the rough wall, mouth parts clicking and sliding against each other like hand-length saws. Jason leapt down, not liking to think what would happen if the beetles climbed up and hold the vor's chemsuits. This time he did have to kill. These creatures were attacking prey not defending a nest. Half stepping back into a fighting stance, he lit his lightsaber again. He'd never tried lightsaber fighting without using the Force. But how hard could it be, he asked himself, and he waded in Force-blind. These beetles, swarming toward fresh food, weren't about to back down. Jason swung the lightsaber through the nearest, slicing it between abdomen and thorax, it collapsed. Jason swung for another one's faceted eyes. Two more beetles pivoted and came for him, leaving the hut's other side safe for the vores. Back to the crawler, Jason shouted. Signal the others. We're leaving. 
The Vores scrambled down. One tried to grab their cart's handles. Two beetles lunged for his loosely suited legs, snipping with their mouthparts. The Vor shrieked and ran after his partner. Another half-dozen beetles clambered over the dead ones. Jason swung the lightsaber wildly, keeping a circle clear around himself. Without drawing on the force, his motions seemed jerky, disconnected. But he didn't stop. Another swarm reached him. On Yavin 4, he recalled, certain crushed or wounded insects gave off pheromones that called in more of their species. Whether or not this was the case here, something was drawing them toward him. Five more scuttled closer, up another lane. Then an orange-suited form pelted into view. Get back! Jason shouted. The form waved a vibroblade. I'll clear you a path! That was Droma's voice. The ring came on, slicing for the beetles' undersides, dancing out of the way of claws and mouthparts. They didn't seem nearly as interested in Droma as they were in Jason. The thought hit them both at the same instant. As Jason shouted, They're drawn to the light! Droma's voice echoed, and then finished, Saber! Now what? Jason sliced, backstepped, turned, and sliced again. The mindless creatures kept coming, weaving their antennae. The comlink in his pocket whistled. Then a voice said, Solo, everyone but you and Droma has gotten to the crawler. Run for it! Shut off that glow light, Solo! Droma shouted. You're as crazy as your father! Shut down his lightsaber? Backstep. Swing. Beetles boiled over each other, some stopping to chew on the ones he'd killed. The biggest one yet, black antennae as thick as a Twi'lek's leku, sailed in over the other's backs. Jason sidestepped and sliced it in two. But as he did, something sharp closed on his left ankle. Get to the Howl Runner! he shouted at Droma. Droma vaulted an iridescent abdomen and landed beside Jason. Breathing hard now, harder than a Jedi should for lightsaber work, Jason jabbed at the beetle who'd seized his ankle. As it fell away, he spotted a tiny tear in his orange pants leg. Throw the lightsaber! Droma crouched, brandishing his vibroblade. I'll cut us a way out. Then you can levitate it to you. You know I'm trying not to use the Force. Swing. Sidestep. Jab. Fine! Then leave it here! But throw it, or I will! Jason locked his lightsaber on, flicked his wrist, and let go. As the lightsaber flew, he had another flashback to his vision. Of a lightsaber, sailing off into the distance. Go! Droma grunted. The pack of beetles scuttled off after the glimmering lightsaber. Jason headed for the hydroponics tank jumping over a beetle with every other step. Now the ominous duro scent reached his nostrils. They'd breached his suit all right. Droma slashed the antennae off one bug that got too close. They broke free of the swarm. This way. Jason led toward a long breach in the synthplast wall, instead of the gate. I left the I-7 close to the Falcon. Right behind you, Droma called. Jason pulled out his comlink. Crawler, this is Solo. Stick around till we can get airborne. Then he turned to look back. The mass of beetles boiled, an iridescent tumble of black antennae and wing covers. Somewhere in there was his lightsaber. If he left it behind, that would be like leaving a leg or a hand. But if he used the force to call it to his hand, he'd break his own resolve again. Either way, he would be miserable. He had to decide, soon, whether to abandon the Force altogether or plunge back into its flow. This constant weighing and evaluating endangered others. He shut his eyes, willed the tiniest wisp of energy, and called the lightsaber. It rose out of the battling beetles in a low, shining arc to land solidly in his palm. He shut it down with a sigh. Droma stood staring at him. 
hurts to watch you, he said. Because you know what I'm going through, I suppose, Jason answered. If I use it, I'm miserable. If I don't, I'm sunk. The wren nodded, then stepped out over the tattered remains of the dome. Come on, kid. Move. Jason processed through decontamination the next afternoon and reported to the admin building. According to Leia's aide, Jaina was outdoors in Gateway's shiplot, helping an inspection team. Leia sat at the big cell core desk, ignoring an undertone of conversation between C-3PO and someone on the other end of a comlink. Something about spirograss, marshlands, and weather modification. Leia straightened her white head wrap. I'm glad you're here, Jason. A Corduro freighter we just offloaded is missing a third of its cargo. Think you could get anywhere with Corduro's administration? Jason gaped. I haven't got much experience with negotiating. Leia shook her head. No, but you're a solo, and that ought to impress them. I haven't got time to fly up to Buru, and your dad says you're trying to get more involved in non-Jedi activities. I can sympathize with that. Her left cheek twitched. More than you know. I guess you probably can, Jason admitted. His mom would understand that not everyone who showed Jedi talent was destined to follow that path. She'd shown him that not every life had enough time for Jedi disciplines. He'd tried to tell his dad about his vision, and how it confirmed his decision to hold back. Han had turned away, shaking his head, confused. Want to try something new? Leia asked. Jason ran a hand over his strangely smooth head. Droma just brought 32's Howlrunner over. I could take it up to Buru. See what I can do. I'd appreciate that. Be careful, Jason. Always, Mom. May the Force be with you. Anyway. You too. Ronda Besadi Diori propelled himself up Gateway's main street, relieved to put the admin building, with its rough, dry detention cell and glaring lights, behind him. He'd tried to explain to Jedi Jaina Solo that he only wanted to evaluate Gateway's ships, but she was as self-righteous as her brother. So far, he'd evaded their mother. He passed a pair of shaved-down rim, standing outside their tent wearing snug blue flight suits. Their vests and culottes hung limp over lumpy blue leggings. Even after he'd served his detention— which he had every intention of protesting after the fact, he had been temporarily excluded from the communication area, the one place where he finally could hope for decent transmission equipment. He must contact Borga. He would find a way to get off this drab, impoverished world and rejoin her. He wet his lips. He needed a pilot, of course. He still might convince the young solo female. As his people said... Where persuasion fails, bribery prevails. His kajitic had wealth on worlds the Yuzhan Vong hadn't touched. The young Jedi must have a weakness. Jewels, shimmer silk, better yet, a ship of her own. Encouraged by his thoughts, he hurried up the sandy lane to the Selkor shelter he'd been issued, a miserable blue tent in Gateway's Teyana ruins district. He could hear the continual grinding of Gateway's rock chewers underfoot. Pausing inside his door flap, he caught an odd odor. He clenched his little hands, furious at the intrusion. He snuffled, following the scent to his sleeping mat. He had used his flimsy bed covers as additional padding. Beneath them he spotted an unfamiliar lump. Reaching around with his tail, he flicked off the covers. A leathery ball not quite the size and shape of a human head, lay on the sleeping mat. It was a Yuzhan Vong villip, like the ones he'd seen on board the cluster ship. Borga had come through for him quickly. Then he trembled from head to tail tip. 
too quickly, actually. For this villip to show up in his dwelling so soon, the Yuzhan Vong must have an agent inside the Gateway Dome, masquerading as human. An agent who now knew where to find him. Undaunted, Rhonda picked up the leathery creature and sank onto his rumpled mat. His plan, to lure key Yuzhan Vong personnel here where the New Republic could trap them, still seemed ill-formed, but he had promised Borga he'd try to bargain. One Jedi for the world of Tatooine? The idea created an inner sensation he didn't quite understand, since he'd never experienced it before. A twinge of vague pain— as if this might not be an appropriate use of someone who wouldn't do this to him. Maybe this was what humans called guilt. He dismissed it. His loyalty was to Borga. Even if Jason wasn't using the Force, he wouldn't be taken easily. Rhonda stroked the villip, then set it down, wondering who would answer. While he waited, he sealed his door flaps. Gateway was too bright for his taste— Thinking of Nal Hutta and the painstaking planetary development that the Yuzhan Vong were even now destroying made his eyes feel thick and pleasantly moist. Features appeared on the villip, a prominent brow ridge, splayed nubs of nose, cheeks with deep sacks under the eyes. Randa Besadi Diori, it said. Finally, you report. Rhonda didn't recognize the face's fiercely chiseled features or the imperious baritone voice. He tipped his head respectfully toward the villip. You have an advantage of knowledge on me, my lord. I am War Master Savang La. Can you truly offer a Jedi? I can, he answered. War Master? His feelers had brought in a prize catch. Now to lure him to Duro, for the New Republic to snatch. His name is... Useless Hut, the War Master said. Your parents told me what you want in return. Know this. The Huts betrayed us. Only exemplary service will win back our trust. I know and respect your caution, War Master. I remember, though, your kinsman's fascination with Worth Skidder, on board the slave ship with which I traveled too briefly. I would be pleased to deliver this Jedi to you, to you personally, War Master. As for my request, what use to you is Tatooine? A forsaken world, barely able to sustain life. The Villip's rendition of the War Master's eyes looked like unfathomable black holes. Why? he demanded. Should I value your sense of honor enough to come personally to Duro? This, Rhonda admitted, was the gaping hole in his net. You would honor me deeply, he began, and be honored in return. You, the War Master said, are not worthy of honor. Nevertheless, I will take this Jedi. Arrange to deliver him, and I will consider your request. Fail to deliver or offer the slightest deceit, and I shall flay the hide from your body with my kufi. The villip softened, its features retracted, and Rhonda was left to wonder what he had done. The alien's agent here in Gateway could grab Jason, or stab Rhonda in his sleep. Had he just made a terrible mistake? Was there really any way he could hand Jason over? Surely the young Jedi would come to his senses, sweep out his lightsaber, and fight back. What Rhonda really needed, then, 
was an extra layer of defense. Duro was protected by one cruiser, a few snub fighters, and the orbital city's planetary shields, which also protected whatever was immediately below them on the surface. If the New Republic brought an additional battle group closer to Duro, Ronda would be defended. The bargain would have to be cancelled. He burst out of his shelter, headed back to the admin building. There he found two communication techs, a human and a small toothy tinnin, talking to a half-size hollow of a magnificent dark-haired woman. Elated by his good fortune, he muscled the furry tinnin aside. Senator Shesh, he gasped, I have discovered a traitor on Duro. The Yuzhan Vong have planted an agent here. Surely a scout for a future invasion. You must double our defenses, or all these refugees surely will die. You are in a position to send help from the military. Send it quickly. Senator Vicky Shesh turned her head slightly away. Haven't we spoken once before, sir? He bowed deeply. I am Rhonda Besadi Diori, and— You say you have unmasked a Yuzhan Vong agent inside the Gateway Dome? Not unmasked, he said boldly, but discovered irrefutable evidence of his presence. Then we thank you, Rhonda Besadi Diori. Deliver your evidence to Gateway's administrator— Ambassador Organa Solo, I have just been apprised of her presence. Her security force will investigate. I thank you for your time and attention, Senator. Here again are the people with whom you were conversing. Rhonda swaggered out of the building. He would do just as the Senator suggested. Give Leia Organa Solo the villip and let her deal with it. His prompt action— realizing he'd made a mistake, had just saved him, and maybe Gateway itself, from a grim fate. How clever he was. Senator Vicky Shesh of Kuat shut down the projector and reached for her maggot-textured villip. This would not wait. Business, like diplomacy, required making concessions— and she had no qualms about reporting one young hut's treachery. She stroked the repulsive alien object, detaching her attention from her right hand by eyeing the curtained wall across from her private office's comm unit. Her servants swept those curtains three times daily for listening devices. Sometimes they neglected to straighten the folds when they finished. She needed to speak with them. Again— Vicky Shesh had no doubt that the Yuzhan Vong would soon wrest this galaxy away from the New Republic, just as the New Republic had won it from the Empire. Rapid change created opportunities. There would be a thousand worlds to govern, and Kuat might be treated better if a Kuati held a high position under the Yuzhan Vong governors. Certainly she would fare better— the War Master reacted predictably to her report. But he has not identified anyone as this operative? Not according to his report, sir. The Villip's alien face pulled its scalloped lips to one side in a sneer. Our experience with Hats has shown us nothing but treachery it said. We will deal with Rhonda and his clan. You were correct in reporting him. Vicky bowed her head silently. For an instant she considered mentioning the news about Centerpoint. No. As soon as the Yuzhan Vong knew Centerpoint was malfunctioning again, they might strike Coruscant. She had too much to accomplish— before that day arrived. <laughs>